This is Audible. Davalos. Book 4 in the Galaxy Gladiators Alien Abduction Romance Series. Written by Alana Khan. Narrated by Sloane Richards. Chapter 1. Tani. Present day, somewhere in space on the vessel Leaf on the Wind, formerly known as the Battle Scarred Warrior. I officially call this tribunal to order, Captain Zar intones solemnly. A male's life hangs in the balance. Every male and female aboard are crammed onto the bridge of this ship. There are twelve females, all abducted from Earth, in the last few months and thrown together with twelve alien males from different species. The males, most of whom were gladiator slaves, overthrew their masters and stole this vessel. Now they're all on the run from the ruthless previous owners, the Marzen cartel. Of course, that doesn't include Davalos and me. Five days ago, we were rescued from our captivity in a dungeon on planet Emerus and brought to safety aboard this ship. This tribunal is being conducted to convict Davalos of the crime of abusing and torturing me. He asked me, then forbade me, then begged me not to speak today. Fuck him. I'll talk if I want to. Since none of us males know the first thing about legal proceedings, we will follow Earth protocol. Zar was a slave as far back as he can remember. He's humanoid but looks feline, complete with fur, a tail, and facial features resembling a lion. He was voted captain after the rebellion and is presiding over this tribunal. Maddie will be acting as, let me consult my notes, counsel for the defense. Savannah will be prosecuting. I don't need to remind you to treat these proceedings with respect. You will all be voting after the evidence has been presented. Proceed. A former Marine on Earth, Savannah's a pretty brunette with blunt-cut shoulder-length hair. She has no formal legal training. I guess she just watched a lot of legal shows on TV. It doesn't matter. By the firm set of her jaw and the angry look in her eyes, she's not going to cut Davalos any slack. She steps to the front of the bridge, which has floor-to-ceiling windows for about 80% of the bullet-shaped room. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm here to present evidence today to convict Davalos of crimes so serious I am asking for the death penalty. I will only be calling two witnesses. I will not be calling the victim, Tawny, as we've deemed her too fragile to give testimony. Anger flares as I ball my fists at my sides. I want to object, but I catch Davalos's quelling, almost imperceptible frown. I'll bide my time. Wait and see. I clamp my mouth shut, but I know everyone in the room can see me glower. Fragile my ass. I call Tyree to the stand. Savannah motions to the roomy, first mate swivel chair near the front of the room. He should be comfortable there. I'm told he's the first mate. He's a tall, muscular male, wearing a loincloth. He's handsome and very humanoid, with tan skin and elongated elf-like ears. He and his human mate, Grace, were the people who rescued Debbie and me. Well, they rescued me. They didn't want to leave a fellow human in that awful dungeon. They only brought Davy along because I refused to leave Planet Emerus without him. First, I would like to enter as fact that Tyree has the capability to see into people's minds. He exhibited this psychic ability when he helped coordinate our rebellion and crawled into our former captain's mind to get him to disable our pain, kill callers. Does anyone dispute this fact? Looking around the room, Savannah waits for an objection, but there is none. With his clairvoyance entered into evidence, Tyree, can you tell us what you know about Davalos' crimes? Savannah steps away so that everyone can focus on Tyree. I have no idea what he saw in the Emperor's wicked mind, but first of all, I know it isn't going to be good for Debbie, and second, I imagine it's going to embarrass the shit out of me. I snuck into the Emperor of Emerus's mind to see what they were up against, when I thought he meant to do grace in me harm. Many things I saw there were shocking. I will say I am very glad that man is dead. He pauses and looks at his mate, Grace. She's blushing. 
I'm not sure everyone on board knows that Grace killed the Emperor with a paring knife. She stabbed him until her arm was too tired to keep plunging the knife into his chest. I thank God every day she killed that motherfucker and that I was lucky enough to watch the whole thing. Tyree, can you share what you observe that is pertinent to why we're here? Savannah prompts in her serious, prosecutorial tone. I saw that man. He dramatically points at Devi, as if he's seen a thousand episodes of Law and Order. Beat Tawny repeatedly. I saw him hit and abuse her all over her body. Even her sexual areas. My face heats. And even though I'm looking straight ahead at Devi, who's sitting in a chair toward the front windows a few feet from Tyree, I know every eye in the room is on me. I saw him slap and punch as well as use whips. I saw many episodes over lunar cycles, if not anims. It occurred in the Emperor's bedroom, as well as in the dungeon in the cell that devil, he points at Davalos again, shared with that poor female. He indicates me as if there is any doubt who the poor female in this room is. He was relentless. I saw the look on his face. Heard him call her unspeakable names. He enjoyed what he was doing. He swallows hard too upset to continue as he rubs his fist against his bronzed chest. Thank you. Savannah seems to take pity on him. That will be all. He rises and returns to one of the small jump seats, ringing the rear of the room, five seats down from me. His mate, Grace, sits gently on his lap and lovingly slips her arm around the back of his neck. I try to connect with Devi's gaze, but his eyes are unfocused jaw muscle leaping in his otherwise emotionless face. I know the human women all hate him for what they think he did to me. The fact that the markings on his face are like something out of a scary movie doesn't help. His skin is black and red, with fearsome black and white tribal markings. Just observing him, you'd think he was watching a boring movie, not on trial for his life. I sneak a peek at some of the others in the room. If looks could kill, Devi would be dead already. I'm not feeling optimistic. My heart is clenching. I don't want them to punish Devi for what he did. They all think I have Stockholm Syndrome. They're wrong. I now call Dr. Drake's son, Omran, to the stand, Savannah says. The blue-skinned doctor in his dark blue jumpsuit sits stiffly in the designated chair. Dr. Drake, I understand you did a thorough examination on Tawny Britton. What were your findings? Miss Tani exhibited bruises and lacerations in every stage of healing. These findings are consistent with repeated, unrelenting abuse that went on regularly. He pauses and swallows as he wipes his palms on his thighs. I find myself mimicking that gesture to cope with my own anxiety. I know what he's going to disclose next. I'm embarrassed and angry that all this personal information about me has to be disclosed to every being on this ship. How will I ever be able to look any of them in the eye? All they ever think about when they see me is what he's going to say next. There was ample evidence of sadistic and repeated aggression against her intimate areas, both external and internal. He glances at me, maybe a silent apology that he had to share that private information in such a public forum. Sorry, doctor. Apology not accepted. Ever hear of HIPAA? I wish I had psychic powers. I'd use them to set this entire ship on fire. Fuck them all. I'm not sure they care about me or my feelings. They just want to convict Davalos. One final question, Doctor, Savannah says as if it's an afterthought. Uh-oh, this can't be good. Did you ask Miss Britton how she received these injuries? Yes. And her response, Savannah prods. She said she received almost all of them at Davalos's hand. Thank you, Dr. Drake. I have no further questions. You may step down. Savannah waits until all eyes are on her, then continues. My closing remarks will be brief. I have presented evidence that the defendant was observed inflicting these wounds on Miss Britton. That the abuse was ongoing and unremitting. That it damaged her seriously. And that by her own admission... It was administered by the defendant. I rest my case. Davalos. I told my defense attorney, Maddie, I did not want this dracking trial. 
I knew it would bring deep shame to Tawny. I'm certain no one else can read her like I can. After three anims in a cell together, I know every nuance of emotion her sweet face is capable of. Her large brown eyes are sad and downcast. It's obvious she's embarrassed. As well she should be. All these people shouldn't be privy to these intimate details of her abuse. It's not proper. And she's angry, too. Her jaw is tight. I didn't want this trial because I didn't want any more shame to fall upon her. I asked Maddie to tell the captain I didn't want a tribunal. I admitted every act in far more detail than was shared in this room today. I should be put to death. Throw me out of the garbage jettison and let me die in the cold silence of space. The captain refused. Maddie walks to the front of the room. We met twice before today. She said it was to prepare my defense. Other than telling her what I did, I told her nothing that would help my case. I wouldn't allow her to question Tawny. She's been through enough. There's nothing Maddie can say to the jury to help my case. I've given her no evidence to help her defend me. I deserve no defense. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Captain Czar, um, I have no evidence to present. She shrugs her shoulders and turns to Czar and adds in a low tone, He told me nothing that would help his case. He said nothing? Czar asks. She shakes her head. Nothing in his own defense. She approaches him and whispers. Perhaps she's only now telling him I admitted everything and asked to be put to death. He told you that? Yes. Maddie, I think you need to ask him to say that now, during the trial. Czar states firmly. On earth, people can't be forced to testify against themselves. Maddie bites her lip, her shoulders hunched. Perhaps she feels bad that she hasn't properly done her job. I'll save her some misery. I stand and address the males and females who are going to determine my fate. Most, including Tawny, are in small seats against the back wall of the bridge. Every mark and every bruise you see on Tawny's beautiful brown skin was administered by me. She did not deserve even one of those. As the doctor testified, I performed those actions repeatedly and over time. I agree, I should be put to death. There is no emotion in my voice because I am emotionless. Tyree called me a devil. He's correct. Tani's fidgeting in her seat and spearing me with a look that could kill me where I stand. I know she's mad. I won't say anything in my defense. She wants to speak on my behalf, but what can she say? The females from this vessel came to my cell, the one she insists on sharing with me. They told her about Stockholm Syndrome. They said she has it because she doesn't want to leave my side. They're right. She'll be better off with me dead. It will allow her to move on with her life and forget what happened to her in that dungeon for three miserable anims. Tani. Everyone on the jury is murmuring to each other. This trial is now officially a farce. Really? What verdict could they possibly return? There's no evidence to point to anything other than a conviction. Can we vote? A tall, muscular, Neanderthal-looking male asks. He looks mad enough to strangle Debbie with his bare hands and big enough to accomplish it. I've been locked in a cell in the bowels of this ship since we were brought on board five days ago. To everyone's credit, they offered me a nice cabin near all the other Earthwomen, but I refused. I didn't want to be separated from Davalos. I only know a few of these people. Of course, now they know more about me than anyone has a right to know. You should have time to discuss this among yourselves, Maddie protests weakly. I think we all know the verdict already, one of the women answers contemptuously. I rise from my chair and raise my voice over all their chatter. I'd like to speak. Devi stands up and yells, No! It's the first time he's shown any emotion to the jury. Czar rises, commanding silence with his presence and demeanor. Tani, we wanted to protect you from this. The females say you have some sickness that's made you care about your abuser. 
Debbie's staring lasers through me. I know he doesn't want me to talk. Well, fuck it. I don't care if there's not one person in this room who wants to hear what I have to say. I need to say it. All these males are huge and intimidating. I don't give a crap. Everyone has decided I'm sick and not entitled to a voice. Screw it. I walk forward and stand on a chair facing the jury, Debbie at my back. I raise my hands for quiet and forge ahead. I don't care whether you all think I deserve to be heard or not. I'm going to say my piece no matter what you want. I turn my head, look over my shoulder, and snap. You too, Debbie. Despite the fact that the defendant wants to be forced out the garbage chute, there actually is another side to the story. Davalos was a slave, just as I was. He was a slave before I got there. He tells me he served not only this emperor, but his sire and grandsire. He was forced to do their bidding, just as anyone in this room who was a slave was forced to do the bidding of their master. The emperor was a madman. Let's all agree to that. What Devi's master had him do was horrific. My injuries tell the tale of just how horrific. I take a deep breath to quiet my nerves. Everyone in the room is paying attention now, and their stares make me so anxious, I cross my arms in front of my chest as if to protect myself. What you don't know, and what Tyree's psychic images didn't tell you, was how much it distressed Devi to do what he did. What Tyree couldn't know was that Devi became a master at sleight of hand. He learned to make each blow, each crack of the whip, sound and look worse than it was. Did it still hurt? Yes. Did it still damage my body and my soul? Absolutely. But Devi tried his hardest to lessen the pain. Did you see pleasure in Devi's face as he hit me, Tyree? I'm certain you did because Devi became an actor to convince the emperor he was beating the shit out of me and enjoying it. Did you hear Devi call me a bitch and a whore and tell me I deserved it, Tyree? Of course you did. Because it kept the emperor fired up and distracted from the fact that some of the blows didn't even touch my flesh. Did you see Debbie and me practice in the dungeon, under covers late at night? He taught me how to keep my hands to one side and clap when he pretended to smack me. It made such a convincing sound. A blow didn't even have to land on me. Did you see all of that, Tyree? Or just what you wanted to see? Why didn't Debbie defy the Emperor? You met the Emperor, Tyree. He would have killed Devi in a heartbeat, and the new taskmaster would have hurt me a hundred times worse. Do you have any idea how many times I heard Devi's muted prayers at night, begging his god to kill him in his sleep? But he stayed around, to protect me. Did you notice that when we huddled together under the one thin blanket in the cell we were forced to share, every single night, he put his lips to my ear and apologized for what he'd been forced to do during the day. He stole salve at his own peril and administered it to me when my wounds became infected. He told me stories to take my mind off the terror of every day and every minute of my life. And he told me, I turned my head and looked straight at him accusingly, that he would take care of me if we ever escaped that dungeon. Tears spill from my eyes as I pierce him with my gaze. You promised, Debbie. You promised to take care of me after our escape. I want to hold you to that. I look at Czar and then every member of the jury in turn. Debbie has suffered enough. Every blow he administered to me hurt him as well. He deserves a chance at a life. And I deserve to share it with him. I stop and grab a deep breath. I take stock of the jury, and I'm not sure they're convinced. The next thing I'm about to say will piss Debbie off to the point he might never want to speak to me again if he is released. 
but I believe it will save his life. I have to say it. Dr. Drake, I look at him directly. Can you testify as to what you observed when you examined Davalos? No, Debbie shouts from behind me. No, I forbid it. Just kill me. I don't need to be humiliated as well. The doctor stands, looking at Zar for direction. Answer the question, Zar instructs. Devi groans. I glance behind me and see him slump forward, his hands covering his face. The doctor's face is tight, his lips in a thin line as he reports. He carries the marks of repeated and persistent beatings, whippings, and cuts. I hear Devi sigh in relief behind me but I've got to be relentless if I'm going to save his life. I believe you're leaving out a significant detail, Dr. Drake. I wait, knowing the doctor will eventually fill the silence with the information the jury needs to hear. His penis has been fully amputated from his body. The doctor's lips thin into a line. Then he dips his head and takes his seat. There were a lot of shocked gasps and now it's silent in our little courthouse. Almost everyone in here has worn a pain kill collar, I say. Can I ask everyone here to stand? I wait until every male and female in the room is standing, except for Devi. Is there anyone in this room who has not done something they regret? Something they're sorry for? Something that went against everything they thought they stood for when they were threatened with pain or death? Please take a seat if you've never been forced to do something you didn't want to do. No one, not one being in this room sits. Your Honor, I rest my case. Chapter 2 Davalos My penis was severed from my body after the recent emperor killed his sire and took the throne. That was about 20 annums ago, if my calculations are correct. I assume it was to prevent me from being sexual with the females I was ordered to abuse at his command. I wasn't offered an explanation. I don't quite understand why it brings me deep shame after so long. So many of my emotions died decades ago. Why this one lingered, I have no idea. My head is still in my hands. I can't bring myself to look into the eyes of people who know my shameful secret. I'm not certain which I want to avoid more, the pity of the males or the disgust of the females. I finally raise my head in curiosity. It's been silent for over a minima, after Tani's impassioned speech. I'll forgive her for going against my wishes. I know she wanted to save my life. I simply don't know how anyone could see the ravages my abuse took on her dusky skin or the remnants of pain in her luminous brown eyes and ever forgive me. I never will. Zar stands tall next to his chair. If anything, he looks more serious at this moment than at the beginning of this tribunal. I have killed innocent males, Zar starts without preamble. I have dismembered opponents in the arena. I have touched people in ways that were not pleasant for either of us. I... His eyes tear. His teeth clench in an attempt to control his pain. But it's written clearly on his face as his jaw quivers. I will admit to all of you. He sputters to a stop, closes his eyes, and shakes his head. Every friend I care for in this world... Is in this room. If you hate me after what I say, then so be it. I will tell all of you that I killed my best friend, like a brother, at the order of the male who controlled my pain, kill collar. His shoulders slump. He heaves a breath. Anyone with eyes can see the speech eviscerated him. I will not allow a vote on this male's fate. If you vote to put him to death, you must vote to send me to the same fate. What Tani said was correct. There isn't a person in this room who hasn't done something they regret in order to keep breathing. 
I cannot condone putting Davalos to death. There's silence for a long minima. Then the males stand slowly, one by one. They thump their chests and bow their heads to honor Tsar. That took courage for him to admit such a thing to all his friends. Then I can't believe my eyes when I see them each make a quarter turn in my direction and give me the same honorific gladiatorial salute. My throat closes in some tender emotion I haven't felt in decades. I gather the courage to look at Tawny. She avoids my eyes for a moment. I know she didn't wish to cause me shame. She just wanted to save my life. Does she not understand that I don't want this life? I think I'm over a hundred annums old. I've suffered enough. What have I got to look forward to? Certainly no love, no wife, no family. That is abundantly obvious. I've tortured and beaten women for decades at the order of one emperor or the next. What exactly does that prepare me to do in the future? With no one to love, no meaningful work, what life is there for me? Am I to stay on this ship where everyone will still harbor hatred and fear for me no matter what Zar just said? If not here, then where? I could still slip out the garbage jettison, but into Tani is better, stronger, until her Stockholm thing is over. My absence would devastate her. The ship shudders to a stop. Axios, the golden pilot, rushes to his seat at the ham. Tari hurries to his first mate's chair. The others belt themselves into their jump seats at the back of the room. It's been decades since I've been in a space vessel, but it's clear we're no longer moving. The Earth female on comms says, We're being held, Captain. I'm not certain what I'm seeing as I look out the expanse of windows. I don't understand the technology. But to my untrained eye, I would say we are caught in some type of web. A glistening force field. Who is it? Zar's voice is serious, clipped. He says he's Captain Thantos of the ship Tranquility, Callie says. And Captain, they've somehow disabled our laser cannons. Drac! Put him on the screen. Half the windows in the room remain transparent. The other half becomes vid screens with Thantos' face on one half of the panel, Zars on the other. I hear several gasps from the back of the room. It's been decades since I've seen a face like mine, a face from planet Primus. As a child, I heard many off-worlders say they had trouble telling us apart. We all have red or orange skin over a part of our bodies and are black as the night sky on the rest. It's the distinctive black and white markings, especially on our faces, that give us our individual appearance. You're in prohibitive space, Leaf on the Wind. We've got you in our net. You'll have to pay a toll. Just trying to keep you honest. Thantos gives a sly smile and kicks his black-booted feet onto the desk in front of him. You aren't authorized to take a toll from us. You're pirates, Zar accuses as he stands, every muscle in his body tense. And you, Leaf on the Wind, he pronounces the name of the ship derisively, are fugitives. We've been investigating your name and call letters. My comms chief did some digging. You've changed your name three times in the last few months. That's not the behavior of a vessel traveling within the law. We've got you in our snare. You can sit in our web until you die of old age. You can call the authorities. Although I'll bet they'll be much more interested in apprehending you than in our little vessel. Or you can pay our... He tosses his head from shoulder to shoulder, puckering his lips as he appears to calculate the number. 100,000 credit toll. His lips turn upward in an affable smile as he awaits Zar's reply. I assure you we're traveling on the auspices of Federation protection. Release us from your trap, and I won't have my comms chief contact the authorities. I've got to hand it to Zar. 
He's got balls of steel. It would take an expert to detect any stress in his deep, steady voice. Let's see. Thantos consults his computer screen as he grabs a little blue ball and tosses it back and forth from hand to hand. Your ship was originally Warbird 1. Oh, sorry to hear that it was reported stolen by the Marzen cartel a few months ago. Then it looks like Sweet Deliverance. Ah, a great name for a vessel carrying over 20 runaway slaves. Then Battle-Scarred Warrior. Who came up with that? It's my personal favorite. And now your call letters identify as Leaf on the Wind, but... He tells his pilot to turn around, then cranes his head to look out his bridge window. The name Battle-Scarred Warrior is still painted on your bow. He purses his lips and shakes his head in a little scold. Very sloppy. So let's cut the drack and get down to business. The sugary smugness is out of his voice, and it's now edged with steel. Who do you think we'd get the biggest reward from, the Federation or the Marzen cartel? I'm betting the bloodthirsty cartel folks have more disposable income than the feds. Wouldn't you agree? He pauses and turns his head to his left, listening to a crew member. My first mate says there are a hundred thousand credit bounty on every one of your heads. If you wait much longer, we'll have to increase our ask. It might be worth our while to turn you over to the cartel and collect the bounty. I just hate to waste time in this Draco's sector of the galaxy. He goes back to whistling and tossing his ball, like he doesn't have a care in the world. Give us five minimas, Czar orders, but his voice doesn't sound as strong as it did a few moments ago. Kelly cuts the comm link and Czar sags in his chair. We're so fucking busted, Callie says. We left Emerus so fast, we didn't have time to paint a new name on the hull, and we've been on the run since then. She puffs air through her pursed lips. Do we even have a hundred thousand credits? And will they let us go if we give it to them? That's about the entirety of our bank, Zar admits. Grace earned three times that for her performances, but we use most of it to get repairs on Emerus. If we give them what they're asking, we'll barely be able to limp to a safe zone planet to refuel. We'll have no reserves to get a new name and call letters that aren't so easy to trace. We have the ruby, Tyree interjects in a rush. The huge ruby the emperor gave to Grace. I assume it's worth a lot of credits. Maybe that ship will take it in trade. Elephant in the room, Savannah announces as she points her thumb at me. He's one of them. Think we could use him to barter? Are you shitting me? Tani jumps up and pins Savannah with a Dracu stare. He just averted a death sentence, and you want to sell him to those pirates to save your skin. That's totally fucked. Let's all cool down. Zar puts his hands out in a calming motion. We're not selling anyone to those scavengers, but Davalos's presence might help us haggle our release. He turns to me and adds, The timing is terrible, but I have to ask. Do you think you could help us negotiate? I've been gone from my planet for eight decades. What could I possibly do to help? I have to agree with Tawny. It's mighty bold to ask me for help ten minimas after they were ready to put me to death. Zara's breath escapes in a huff. I have no idea. All we can do is try. On Zar's command, Callie reopens the comm to the pirates. Thantos was facing away, but immediately turns to us, cocks his head, and innocently asks, Sending it in credits? Gold, perhaps. You know a great deal about us, sir. Zar puts sarcastic emphasis on that last word. You must know we don't have that amount of credits lying around. Well... Thanto simpers. I have it on good authority that... He closes his eyes and snaps his fingers repeatedly, as if he's trying to conjure up a word. Grace earned the sum of 300,000 credits playing her angelic music on planet Emerus less than five days ago. 
Did you squander all that money in a Klimto game? The male has balls. We don't have gold, Zar announces calmly. But we rescued one of your own from a dungeon on Emerus. Might that earn us a reduction in the toll? Didn't he just say he wasn't going to use me to barter with? It angers me slightly, and then I realize it doesn't matter. Perhaps this will give me a good excuse to leave Tani on this ship and let her regain some semblance of her life with the other Earth females. You rescued a Primian from planet Emerus. You expect me to believe you. Shame on you, Captain, for trying to fool an honest wayfarer like myself. He touches both hands to his chest in a mock-offended pose. I stand and step next to Zar until my face is on the comm screen. It's eerie seeing my face next to Thantos's. The image is both ten fiertos tall. We look a lot alike. The haughty expression evaporates from Thantos' face as he inspects me up and down. Name? He asks. Voice clipped. Davalos Maris Thenius Third. I'm a master at going deep inside myself. It would take an excavation crew to find any emotion as I say that name for the first time in eight decades. Thantos appears deep in thought for a moment. Then, age? I have no idea. I was in prison for a long time. Only my lips move. Not another muscle in my body so much as twitches. Give me your best guess, Davalos Maris Thenius III, Thantos snaps. I had yet to reach my twentieth annum when I was kidnapped. I believe it's been close to 80 anums on Primus since then. Thentos turns toward his comm officer, his back to us, and the link is severed. What the fuck? Callie asks, her shoulders sagging in apparent relief that we're no longer in communication with their ship. About five minimas later, Thentos's face fills the screen. It's your lucky day, Leap on the Wind. Davalos Maris Theonis II put out a reward on his son 88 anums ago. He squeezes his little blue ball, then tosses it in the air and catches it. You don't look bad for 108. Is that a smirk on his face? So, Captain, we'll take 50,000 credits, fully verified, of course, and the mail from Primus. Then you can be on your way. He waves his hand dismissively. I'm not in the habit of bartering off my passengers or crew. Zar's voice is firm. Your male doesn't wish to return to his home planet? To the bosom of his loving family? He lifts a sardonic eyebrow in question. I consider this thought, keeping my face impassive. I am absolutely certain I don't want to remain on this vessel. No matter what happened as a result of the tribunal, not one person on this ship will be able to stand the sight of me. Nor do I want to go back to Primus. I haven't stepped foot there for almost 90 annums. Their lives have all moved on with every turn around the suns. And me? I look like I'm from Primus, but I'm not fully alive. I'm a stone. Or worse, I'm a devil as my shipmates call me. I can't go back to my home planet. But this will allow me to leave Tawny in good hands. She's got to understand. She'll be able to move on with her life, develop friendships with the Earth females, maybe find a mate who's worthy of her, one who can fulfill her, maybe get her right with child. I'm dead inside. Why does my stomach clench in agony at that thought? I want to go with these dracking pirates. I'm certain they'll have a garbage jettison. It's up to you, Davalos, Zar addresses me. If you don't want to leave this ship, we will find a way to... I want to go. I have no belongings, nothing to pack. Give me five minimas to say goodbye to Tawny, and I'll be off. I raise my voice for all to hear. I wish you well. I understand... I understand why you needed to conduct the tribunal. I march over to Tawny, gently grab her hand, 
and lead her into the hallway. Tawny. I'm packed too, I say with a calm smile, then look up into Debbie's face. He used to look like a devil to me also, but now I find him handsome. My stepfather made me go to church every Sunday for the better part of my life. Not that I enjoyed a moment of it, but the words, Whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge, are singing in my ears. All those years in the dungeon, all that pain, the suffering, will be behind us. We'll start a new life together. Certainly he'll agree. I'm leaving. You're staying. His face looks fearsome when he frowns. No! We're a team, Devi. I'm coming with you. He puts his palms on my cheeks and looks at me with a passion, a sincerity I've never seen expressed on his features before. His warm, whiskey-brown eyes bore into mine. You know I care about you, Tawny. How could I not? You're a strong, courageous, wonderful female. And that's why you're not coming with me. You deserve more. You deserve a male who isn't dead like me. You deserve a male who can touch you like a woman wants to be touched. You deserve a male who can provide you with a family. I can do none of those things. My heart is breaking. My chest squeezes. I've never seen him look sad before, but his shoulders are stooped. He's avoiding my gaze. This, more than anything, convinces me that he cares for me, too. I don't need that, Debbie. After what the Emperor did to me, do you think I want anything shoved inside me again? I don't care what you lack. I care what you have. You protected me on Emerus as best you could. You kept me alive. I don't want to live without you. The females are right, Tawny. You have that syndrome. You bonded to your abuser. It will fade with time. If you stay here with them. We have five minutes. If we don't hurry, that asshole from the other ship just might change his mind about taking Debbie back to his home planet. I don't want to stay here. I want to go with him, wherever that is. I have no time to argue. I saved your life today, Davalos, Maris, Phineas the Third. In my culture, that means you are indebted to me for the rest of your life. They're still in my voice. I straighten to my full height, my back ramrod stiff. I feel like an army general. I will brook no argument. I demand it, Demi. I demand you take me with you. My index finger stabs at his chest. This is true. He cocks his head and stares at me unwaveringly, as if he's trying to discern the truth from a lie. I heard it once on a TV show, and it should be true. Therefore it is. I'm fully believing my little lie so that he'll believe it too. Yes, you owe me your life. I'm not asking for your life. I just want to follow you onto that pirate ship. You'll regret this, Tawny. You'll regret this to your dying day. He steps toward me and turns, so we're both facing the same direction. He places his forearm next to mine, his black with white tribal markings, mine burnished mahogany. We're not the same, Tawny. We don't look alike. We're from different worlds. Your heart still beats, and mine is dead. You're making the biggest mistake of your life. Davalos? Zar sticks his head through the doorway, then approaches followed by five burly gladiators. You certain you want to do this? We could find another way. I'm certain, but she's insisting on coming with me. Help me convince her otherwise. Tawny, they're taking you somewhere you know nothing about. We don't know if he can keep you safe. Zar looks at Dev skeptically, eyebrows raised. Stay here. We can protect you. You're running under a false name, and that little pirate ship figured it out in five minutes flat. I don't think staying with you is so safe either. 
I will never say this again. I cross my arms in front of my chest and almost scream. I do not have Stockholm Syndrome. I know what I want. I'm going with Davy. Zara's sharp-toothed mouth snaps closed, and he accompanies us to the exit doors. The Tranquility's gangway has connected to us, and we're aboard their ship before I can doubt my decision. Chapter 3 Davalos As soon as the ship's doors slide closed between us and the leaf on the wind, Thantos reaches out and pulls me to him in a solid hug. He tries to touch his forehead to mine, a gesture of kinship on my planet. But I manage to wrest myself away from him. I lean back in distrust. He pulls away, his hands grasping my upper arms. This male, who seemed to enjoy toying with us for the last two auras, looks filled with emotion, his eyes bright with tears. My name is Thentos Abair Maris. We're cousins, Davalos. I grew up hearing about you my entire childhood. Every spring in the week during the Mantine holidays. When I was young, I prayed fervently for your safe return. I sadly admit, we all gave up many anums ago. You wouldn't remember me. I was born after you were stolen. He leans forward again and presses his forehead to mine. It's a sign of love and connection on Primus, reserved for the closest lovers and kinsmen. I allow it this time. What do I care? It means nothing to my dead heart. I didn't contact your family, Davalos. That will be your choice. Your sire crossed over two decades ago. Your mother has the failing sickness. The last I saw her, she didn't remember me. I doubt she would remember you, although you never know. He glances at Tani as if he hadn't noticed her until now. This female, is this your mate, Davalos? I am honored to meet you. He bows low, then moves to grasp her shoulders, to press his forehead to hers. His movement must have been too swift. She retreats and hides behind my back. Sorry, you're just so big, she says from behind me. I feel her body shiver. I apologize. I think I've been too brash for both of you. He looks me up and down, perhaps taking in the dirty rag of a loincloth around my hips, the lean muscle under my skin that screams I haven't been well fed in decades. I'm certain he must see the remnants of a thousand lash marks on my skin. When Tani edges out from behind me, he has to see the bruising apparent on her lovely brown skin and the healing lash marks on the exposed flesh of her lower arms. I watch his face as awareness dawns. My cousin, do you need to see a medic? Seneca has been trained as a healer. Were you abused on the leaf on the wind? Tani and I shake our heads. We saw the doctor aboard that ship. Everything has been done that can be done. He cocks an eyebrow in inquiry. I should have phrased that differently. I'm certain he must be questioning what I meant by that. I wonder how he would react if he knew I wear a rag in my loincloth to hide the fact the fabric covers no cock. Would he show me the trash chute in disgust? You were rescued from Emerus only five days ago, cousin. I hope the leaf treated you well. He shrugs, then smiles. Not the schmarmy smile that we saw on the screens of the bridge when he was taunting us, but a genuine smile, full of honest affection. You're here now. We'll feed you and give you time to heal. You both look like you could use rest and caretaking. I can only imagine you were not treated well in your captivity. That's over. The time you spend on the tranquility can be considered your rebirth. You don't know me, cousin, but I felt a kinship with you my whole life. Indulge me. Let me care for you and... Tawny. 
We've been held in the same cell for three annums, I tell him. Do you prefer one room or two? I say, two. At the same moment, Tani firmly says, one. Dantos looks between us, awaiting further instruction. Devi, please don't leave me alone. Not on this ship, with all these new people. She glances down the hallway at the three males standing there, weapons at the ready in case Tani and I aren't what we appeared. One room, I acquiesce. Dentos escorts us to a small cabin about twelve Fierto Square. It's clean and sparsely furnished. I wish I could offer you better accommodations, Dantos offers. I haven't slept in a room with a door in almost a century. This is a boon. Thank you. I'm sure you'd like food, clothes. Shall I bring them by? Would you like to join us in our small kitchen for a meal? I glance at Tawny. Her eyes are still wide in fear. She's tense. I doubt she'll want to mingle with a bunch of large alien males. You could bring us food. Nutrition bars are fine. Don't go to any trouble. I think we'll bathe and sleep. Tomorrow you can shower us with your hospitality. Feed us and impress us with your ship. As you wish. I'll bring food. Out your door and to the left, when you wake up in the morning, you'll find the bridge and kitchen. He clasps my shoulder, then leaves. The room is still quiet, without my boisterous cousin. Tani, who'd been almost hiding behind me, steps to my front and hugs me hard, her face nestling against my chest. I thought they were going to put you to death, Dev. That tribunal was awful. I want to scold her for speaking up for me. I begged her not to. I've lived long enough, had enough pain for ten lifetimes. My people live another eighty to one hundred annums on average. I don't think I can stomach that. You'll regret following me onto this vessel, Tawny. I shake my head. This was the biggest mistake of your life. The people on the leaf would have taken care of you. I have nothing to give you. I'm not arguing with you, Dev. I'm taking a shower and going to bed. She turns on her heel and strides to the tiny, adjoining bathroom. This room has two small beds and two closet dresser combinations. The beds have been pushed together. I separate them. There's no reason for us to lie side by side anymore. For the first time since she met me, Tani will be safe where she sleeps. I take a calm breath, pleased that at least I provided that for her. Tani I know water is a commodity on any space vessel, but I allow myself a few extra minutes under the warm spray. Better than Disneyland. As I'm toweling off, I'm thankful the humidity has fogged the mirror. I haven't had a moment to really look at myself in three years. They let me leave my cell on the leaf to take a shower, but it was rushed. And frankly, I wasn't ready. I guess now's as good a time as any. I wipe the condensation off the mirror, take a deep breath, and lean in to see my face. I immediately move back, out of range of my reflection. Dear God, it looks like a heavy-handed makeup artist was tasked with aging me twenty years. The tears sliding down my cheeks have a will of their own. I have no business crying. It is what it is. It's just that, wow, I didn't expect it to be that bad. I edge to the mirror again and tolerate it better this time. I'd only been twenty-two when I was abducted. I guess three years of daily torture, living in an underground cell, and wondering if you'll live to see the next day will do that to you. Now that I'm really looking, I take it back. I really haven't aged twenty years. Well, my eyes have. My young woman eyes are gone. They do look twenty years older. That's only fair. They've certainly seen twenty years worth of pain. I can see why everyone hated Devi. My dark skin doesn't show discoloration as obviously as if I were white. But even now, almost a week after my rescue, 
My face is a patchwork of bruises in various stages of healing. It's silly, but I feel bad for death. He has to look at me and know he did this. It must kill him a little every time he sees this. Oh well, my bruises will fade. The scars are simply scars. A road map of my life, which has been pretty fucked up until now. Today changes everything. I pull on the oversized t-shirt and panties they gave me on the leaf and enter the bedroom. Dev stalks into the bathroom and starts his shower. Silly male. Did he really think I wouldn't notice he pulled the beds apart from one to two, each on its own side of the small room? And did he really think I wouldn't put them right back the way they were? It's the work of a moment to connect them into one again and climb in. Davalos Drac! I'm not surprised she pushed the beds back together. After three anims in captivity, you wouldn't think she would be so willful. But Tawny has a mind of her own. Having no desire to argue, I crawl in and lie on the far edge. She cuddles up against me, her front to my back. I've never slept nude with her before, but my loincloth was filthy, and I didn't want to wear it into this delightfully clean bed. We shared a cell for three anims. She knows there's nothing under my loincloth. Why do I still wish to hide myself from her? Debbie? She whispers as she hitches her leg over my hip. Please don't be mad at me for coming with you. You're the only person in the universe I trust. I want to push her away. Tell her she doesn't really know me. But that would be a lie. She knows me better than anyone has ever known me. She knows my weaknesses as well as my strengths, which is a short list. I was giving it some thought in the shower, wondering why I was so desperate to stay with you, she tells me. We're connected, you and I. We spent a thousand days living through something no one else in the universe could understand. When I'm not with you, my life turns into a dream. A horrific, surreal dream that feels meaningless. When I'm with you, my life is real. What I've lived through, however grim, is my reality. And maybe it has meaning. No one could understand what happened behind those bars but you. I turned to face her and immediately realized the error of that decision. Her knee rests on my hip. Her core inches from where my cock would be if I had one. I hiss involuntarily. She pulls her leg off of me, eyes wide. Is she fearful of me? Of my anger? Of course she is. Her head may know I never heard her of my own volition, but her body remembers every lash of my whip. A very clear thought arrows into my brain. I need to apologize to her. I know it might sound hollow, I know she has that syndrome, but I need to say it. I hope she can hear, really hear, even a small part of it. Tawny. I know she immediately grasps my serious tone. Her gaze connects with mine. We both know there wasn't one thing I did to you in that dungeon that was of my own free will. Not one. Well, except every night when I apologize for what I've been forced to do. I understand you know this on some level, but I have to say it now, out loud, when we're both calm and safe. I am deeply sorry for every hurt or pain or abuse I inflicted on you. Dev, I know. Her beautiful brown eyes are swimming in tears as she looks at me with her exquisitely expressive gaze. I know you do. You said these things at the tribunal, but I have to say them. Tani, I have to tell you I felt every lash of the whip, every slap of flesh on flesh, every hurtful word and phrase, every single abuse I heaped on you in that dungeon. I felt on my skin, and in my heart, and all the way down to the depths of my soul. 
I forgive you, Debbie. I understand. Please. My voice is rough with emotion. Please don't forgive me. I have no right to ask for that. No matter what you told that jury, my actions were unforgivable. I feel a tight fist around my heart. Not only should this beautiful female never forgive my actions, but I know I'll never be able to forgive myself, nor should I. Of course you didn't ask, Dev. But I do forgive you. I forgave you every night as we laid on the floor of our cell when you whispered your apology. There's nothing else I can say without arguing, which is the last thing I want to do. If forgiving me makes her feel better, then so be it. I'll leave it hanging in the air between us. What I won't do is accept it. I won't allow my heart to feel the soothing balm her words could provide. It would just be that syndrome talking. I deserve no forgiveness, especially not from her. Let's get some sleep, Tawny. Tomorrow we'll talk to Thantos and see if he can take you back to Earth. We've never talked about your family. I didn't bring up the topic. Didn't want you to get sad as you thought of everything you've lost. But I'm certain you have people who love you there. Let's get you home. Earth wasn't a great place for me, Dev. There's nothing there for me. Perhaps you didn't understand what I told you a moment ago. You're my home, Davalos. She turns her back on me and scoots away. I wake before Tani in the morning and pull on my dirty loincloth. I'll find Thantos and borrow some clothes. Maybe grab Tani a snack. I turn left out of our room and follow my nose and ears to the kitchen. Three males are congregating there, making sumra, a traditional noodle porridge dish popular on many planets. Smelling it, nostalgia squeezes my heart. Pictures flash in my head of when I was a tot, watching my mom cook it while I sat on our kitchen table, enjoying the smell, awaiting the taste. I've tried for decades not to think of home, my family. I'd assumed my parents died long ago. Now I'm a free male on a swift ship. I guess I could go home. I shake my head, knowing there's nothing there for me. The males in the room nod to me, welcoming me. Want some sumra, sir? The youngest asks. It smells good. I'll come back later with the female to have some. Thanks. Did I almost say my female? I need to control my thoughts. She is not my female. I need to figure out how to get her out of my room. I have to sever our relationship. She's far too dependent on me. When I ask, the males point me toward Thantos' room, five doors down. He immediately opens his door to my knock. He's nude. Come in, cuz. His cabin is slightly larger than my own and in complete disarray. There are what look like fine paintings hanging everywhere. Fancy wooden tables of the highest quality are shoved up against every wall. Ornate figurines and sculptures covered almost every flat surface. Spoils of war, he indicates with a wave of his hand. Well, not war exactly. We're pirates. We stole all this drag. He walks to the closet, grabs black pants, and climbs into them. What you see in this room alone is probably worth 40, maybe 50,000 credits. You should take a look in our hold. He looks happy and proud. The pirate life agrees with you, Thantos. I know it's too early for you to decide what you want to do with your life but I'd be honored if you stayed on here with us. I could teach you every aspect of life on board this ship. Piloting, navigating, stealing, he winks. You've been out of commission for a long time. I understand you'll need time to figure things out. I will give you that. I want to give you time. He sits on the bed as he pulls on socks and boots. Let me give you some clean clothes. Next planet we touch down on, you can buy what you want. Develop your own style. 
I imagine trends have changed since you were in a store. He smiles again. The muscles in my face tighten. Is it in jealousy? Yes. I'm jealous of his easy manner. With him, everything is a joke, a laugh. It's like he's never struggled a day in his life. I can't even imagine what that would be like. I tear my thoughts from this maudlin line of thought. My cousin's been nothing but kind. I shouldn't be angry that he's had an easy life. Here, underwear, clothes. Take off that filthy rag. I personally want to jettison that mother dracker into deep space. He must see every muscle in my body stiffen. Unless you want the privilege, cuz, he amends, raising his hands in mock surrender. My jaw tightens as if my teeth are bonded together. I look down at the clean clothes, folded neatly in my open hands. If I were a normal male, I would tear off my loincloth and slip into these new pants without a second thought. Males in our culture are comfortable in our nudity. If I hurry to his restroom, it would be odd. If I spend one extra modicum in this dirty loincloth, it would be odd. I am literally paralyzed, as if my feet are nailed to the floor. He has to see the confusion on my face. Probably my fear, too. Drac, Davalos. I know I've done something wrong. Just tell me what I've done. I mean the best for you. I want to get to know you. I want to be friends. I've offended you in some way. The male means no harm, that's clear. He prayed for my safe return for decades. He loves me like a kinsman should. His usually happy face is serious. His brows knit downward. We're going to be on this ship together for a while. I realize there's no need, and probably no way, to keep my secret. I set the clothes on the bed and hold his gaze with mine. I face him, unwrap the loincloth, and let it drop. I watch the expression on his face transform incrementally, seeing each emotion change in turn with every passing modicum. Surprise, then shock, deep repulsion, and after long moments, a sadness so profound that he can't control the tears that sprout from his eyes. Cousin, is all he can say, still unable to tear his eyes from the ruined place where my manhood should be. He stands and grabs me, hugging me harder than I've ever been hugged. He's sobbing. The hug serves the purpose to camouflage his sorrow, as well as offer me some comfort. I remind myself I'm a stone, a heartless, dead stone that has no feelings, no emotions whatsoever. It's not working. As if for the first time, I allow myself to recognize my own loss. I'm out of that dracking dungeon. I don't have to fear for my life every moment of every day. Maybe it's the love contained in this hug. Maybe it's the safety and distance from Emerus. But some of the hard shell around my heart breaks open. I note the exact instant this happens. This moment will go down in my history as the most agonizing point in my life. I had thought my worst moment was when my cock was placed on the hard, cold stone and the blade came down upon it. But I was wrong. This minima, right now, as I'm experiencing the fullness of the loss for the first time, yes, this, this is the most excruciating moment of my life. I try to use the skills I developed during decades in the dungeon. I attempt to turn my thoughts to other things. Thinking of what makes me angry usually does the trick but it doesn't make a dent in my anguish. I try to crawl back into my protective heart of stone. No luck. That wall has been cracked. I have to stand here and feel the agony roll over me in waves of sadness, drenching me in their severity. My knees are about to buckle, but I'm held up by Thantos' fierce hug. I don't know how long we stand here, him holding me 
sending me the love and concern of a blooded kinsman. The waves of pain and loss dissipate. My muscles bear my full weight. The worst of the emotional storm has passed. I step away, girding myself for the look I'm going to see on my cousin's face. He's concealed his feelings. His expression is placid, like a store mannequin. I'd prefer his cocky smirk. Is there nothing that can be done, Davalos? Nothing. The doctor on board the leaf says not. Will you, will you at least consult our medic? I try to suppress the shame that bubbles up from deep inside. It is what it is. I am what I am. Why keep it a secret? What could he do that a physician could not? I ask as I pull on the black, multi-pocketed pants and a stretchy black shirt that hugs my chest. He's been a medic longer than you've been alive. Perhaps he knows something. Feed me and the female. Then I'll speak with him if it makes you happy. Yes, it would make me happy to exhaust all avenues to help you. He steps toward the door, then turns to me. So that, his eyes glance in the direction of my pants zipper, is the cause of the tension between you and your female. She is not my female. She has a sickness. Her planet identified a mental syndrome where a person bonds to their abuser. Thantos' eyes widen in surprise. I was forced to harm her. Now she doesn't want to be separated from me. I'm trying to convince her to return to her home planet. A syndrome, huh? I hear on planet Abachi, they call love a sickness, a hormonal imbalance. They develop medication for it. Perhaps she needs some of that. She certainly acts like she's in love with you, cuz. His gentle teasing is full of concern. She's confused. She's been through a lot. We'll get her back to her earth. She'll forget this. Forget me. I barely hear his cynical words as he turns to leave. Certainly, she'll forget you as quickly as you'll forget her. Chapter 4 Tawny Devi and Thantos knock on my door just as I'm pulling my t-shirt over my head. They bring me to the kitchen where we're served heaping bowls of what Devi calls sumra. It's noodles in a faintly sweet, milky concoction. Kind of tasty. Not exactly what my mother used to make, but close. He praises Destin, a young crew member who seems thrilled that Dev likes his cooking. Thank you, sir. Call me Davalos. Or Dev. Yes, sir, the young male says, then winces at his mistake. We all laugh. I catch the look on Devi's face. He's laughing, too. I've never seen his lips turn upward in a smile. Never even seen his face calm or placid. I breathe a little easier, believing maybe for the first time that he can recover from almost 90 years of torment. I don't, for a moment, however, believe the same about myself. My cousin tells me you wish to go back to your home planet, Tawny. I'll have you speak with our navigator. You can tell him the coordinates and we can take you home. Perhaps we might make one or two detours to plunder a ship or two along the way. He smiles and winks at me. Davalos doesn't speak for me, Thantos. Thanks, but I have no desire to return to Earth. As I explained to him, there's absolutely nothing for me there. I'll be clear. I turn to Debbie as I keep speaking. No family, no friends, no job, no pets. No desire to go there. Thantos laughs out loud and spears Devi with a hard look. This syndrome, cuz. It causes the female to scold the male in public. Perhaps I misunderstood. He good-naturedly shakes his head. She doesn't seem all that confused to me. I don't have the syndrome, I chime in. It's a bullshit explanation for the fact that I like hanging out with Devi. Thantos laughs again and slaps the table with one hand. Maybe it's this syndrome that makes Tawny sound like she knows exactly what she wants. What say you, cuz? Dev scowls at both of us. 
The lightness of a moment ago is lost. My chest tightens. Will he never believe my feelings for him are real? Davalos. I didn't invite Tawny to Med Bay with us. She asked to go back to our room rather than explore the ship on her own. I wonder if she's been enclosed in a small cell for so long she's uncomfortable with open spaces. Or maybe it's all the large, colorful alien males wandering around. Thantos escorts me to Med Bay and introduces me to Seneca, an older male beginning to show the signs of age. He amiably welcomes us. Grasping my wrist and greeting the way non-kinsmen do to honored guests on Primus. My cousin has a serious health concern. Thantos gets down to business, closing the door to the tiny, sterile, metal-walled exam room. He looks at me, letting me know it's up to me to proceed from here. I remove my pants and sit on the exam table. The cool metal is a shock to my balls. After showing myself to my cousin, it appears I've discovered the best way to do this is the wordless reveal. Seneca displays his anums as a medic by the stoic expression he presents. Not a muscle in his face even twitches. He just pulls up a rolling seat and scoots close between my legs. He dons sterile gloves and touches around the opening I piss out of. How often do you get infections? His tone is all business. It was hard to tell the passage of time in the dungeon. About once an anum. I may be able to have the medbot do a surgical revision to reduce the likelihood of infection. I could do additional research into a prosthetic that will give you the look of an actual penis. The last article I saw in a journal showed some very realistic pictures. He rolls a few fiertos back, pulls off his gloves, and tosses them into the receptacle. The prosthetic will never have feeling. You'll never be able to get an erection. I don't predict the science will advance that far in your lifetime. He looks at me and continues. Your testicles are healthy. It would be an easy procedure to harvest your sperm to accomplish impregnation. Tell your female it would be a quick, painless procedure to do that. Well, painless for her. A slightly painful procedure for you. I quickly tell him, she's not my female. She doesn't want my sperm. Before I take a moment to consider the full impact of what he told me, that there is no hope for me to be a complete male. It's not news to me. I never dared to hope for that. I scoot off the table and climb into my pants. Thanks, Seneca, Thanto says, getting ready to hurry me back to my room. Perhaps he assumes I want solitude to mull over this information. Thantos, the medic says. I respect you a great deal. You're a good captain, an excellent leader, and you've made me a rich male. But you can be sardonic at times. I have something I want Davalos to hear. I'd appreciate it if you would treat it seriously. I half expect Thantos to lighten the mood, make a joke, deny his tendency to tease, but he pulls up a chair, sits down, and looks expectantly at the medic. I sit on the edge of the exam table, my arms crossed against my chest. I was a young male. It was my first assignment. I was newly enlisted, just learning comms, not allowed to do much. I didn't take medic training until decades later. We were in the Aris sector which had never been fully explored. We were severely low on rations, especially food and water. We stumbled upon an uncharted humanoid-supporting planet and took the risk of exploring for food sources. The medic seems so serious. I assume he has something important to say. I also assume it's about me. Otherwise, why are we having this discussion? I have no idea why he's drawing out the story, perhaps as a symptom of his age. Some of the males who grew up in rural areas were sent on a mission to find and kill local game. City dwellers like myself and a few others were allowed to explore for recreation. Our first animal mechanic, a cook's helper, and I separated from our friends and stumbled into a wooded area that butted up against the side of a mountain. 
A double waterfall flowed off the top in two streams. It splashed into a calm blue pool at its base and then merged into a meandering river. The planet was lovely. I always referred to it in my mind as paradise. We shucked our clothes and lazed in those azure waters for several hours, then returned to the vessel. He pegs me with a serious gaze. The reason I tell you this is that two weeks later, when that young cook handed me my portion of food one evening, I noticed the two fingers on his left hand that had been fully amputated in a cooking accident had grown completely back. He was happy to show me his hand. Even the nails had regenerated in perfect condition. There was no scarring, no mark of any kind that would indicate that the fingers had ever been harmed. He told me the only thing he could imagine to explain the regrowth was the waters we swam in on that planet. I always wanted to return, but I've never again been near that sector. I marked the coordinates in my journal. Such was my desire to return one day. He tears his gaze from mine and spears Thantos with a serious look. Perhaps today is the day to plot our return to paradise. It's complete drack. Perhaps the medic is older than he looks and has the beginnings of the failing sickness. I wait for my sarcastic cousin to laugh and tell the doc not to joke about serious things. I scoot off the table, knowing there will be no further discussion after Thantos makes his cutting remark. My cousin's face is serious as he asks, You saw this with your own eyes, Seneca. It's been many annums. Could you have misremembered? The medic looks at me, then back at Thantos. I wouldn't joke about such a serious thing, Captain. I remember it as if it was yesterday. Thento stands from his chair. I'll tell Marcus to plot a straight course to paradise. No fun and games between here and there. He turns to leave. Do I have a say in this? I ask. Both males give me a questioning glance. This injury is two decades old. I am not young. My cock is not a finger. Even if I believe the story, and I'm not certain about that, the odds that this miracle would work for me are ridiculously low. I don't want to get my hopes up. I learned long ago that hope is a very dangerous thing. My cousin approaches me and claps me on the back. I'm the captain, he says with fierce determination. We're going to paradise. Sorry, cuz. You're officially alone for the ride. He flashes me his brilliant smile. I have a very painful hangnail on my right index finger. I want to bathe it in the waters of that splendid blue pool Seneca spoke of. Perhaps you'll join me for a swim. He pushes through the door and proceeds down the hall without me. Chapter 5 Davalos I burst from sound sleep to a full-on panic in one modicum. My brain immediately processes a blood-chilling wail, then launches into ever-higher anxiety when I realize the noise is coming from Tawny's throat. She's thrashing in the covers next to me, no longer screaming, just saying no over and over. She's still sleeping. I call her name, softly at first, then louder. I don't want to touch her, instinctively knowing it would be anything but reassuring. Her eyes finally pop open and she looks around the room, panicked and panting. Devi. She launches at me, curling herself against my chest, her fingers grasping my shoulders so hard, her nails bite into my flesh. Oh my God, Devi. She nestles her head against my neck sucking my scent in through her nose. I understand what she's doing. She's grounding herself back to reality. My hands are at her back, roaming from her waist to her shoulders, reassuring her. It's okay, Tani. We're on the tranquility. We're safe. No one is going to hurt you. I pet her soft brown curls, repeating, it's okay, over and over. Her breaths are no longer coming in quick gasps. 
Her respiration has slowed. Her nails aren't digging into my skin. Her back and arms relax. Why is the dream worse than the reality? The emperor was doing his thing to me, but the dream was more terrifying than when it really happened. We're on our sides facing each other. Her head is on my shoulder. Her legs slung over my hips, her heel pressing my legs toward her, like she would crawl inside my skin with me if she could. I take it as a good sign, I say as I stroke her springy hair. I think it means we have enough distance from the terror that we are allowing ourselves to process what happened to us. We're letting our guard down. We? My dreams are more intense since we left that dungeon, too. So the fact that I'm drenched in sweat and my throat is raw from screaming is a good thing. Funny. I never pegged you as a glass-half-full kind of male. I have no idea what she means, but her tone is lighter and her breathing is regular. That's good. In the dim light seeping under the restroom door, I have a great view of Tani's exquisite face. Big brown eyes, short nose, luscious lips. She was definitely the most beautiful of all the Earth females on the leaf on the wind. I used to watch her sleep on planet Emerus, memorizing every curve and plane on her face. I don't understand why I'm thinking of kissing her. If I were a normal male, it would be perfect timing. We're cuddled in a soft, clean bed. She's looking up at me with those alluring, trusting eyes. We're connected in a thousand intimate ways. But I'm not a normal male, and I abused her for three long annums. And she has that syndrome where she doesn't hate me like she should. And right now, this minima, she's looking at my mouth like she wants me to kiss her, which is clear testimony to the fact that her mind isn't right. She closes her eyes and leans closer to me, ints by ints. Those full lips finally bridge the gap and connect with mine. So soft, so soft at first, her lips tentatively brush mine. Snaking her hand behind my head, she pulls me closer as we deepen the kiss. At this moment, I am two distinct people. I am a male who's enamored of a fascinating woman with lush curves and a face I never tire looking at. I've imagined this kiss for Annams. I long to give her satisfaction. How amazing it would be to pleasure a body to which I've administered so much pain. But the other part of me knows she deserves so much better than me. She should be moving forward, first finding herself, then finding a male who can give her everything she deserves. Tani, we shouldn't, I tell her as I pull back. Just tonight, Dev, just this once, make me feel good. Let me think of something other than the Emperor when I look at my body. I want to think of us, of this. Please. She pulls her shirt up and presses the hard tips of her breasts against my chest as she kisses me again. This time her kisses are firm, demanding, desperate. Her tongue is fighting its way between my lips. Although the thought shouldn't is repeating in my brain. Her gentle, please, makes my mind up for me. I promised myself long ago that I would deny her nothing. Tani I'm dripping with desire, my heart's drumming in hunger. Devi's presence is more than reassuring, it's erotic. When we were alone in our cell, when the emperor wasn't watching, Dev was always supremely kind to me. When his hand skimmed the surface of my skin under the blanket in the dark to make certain I had no broken bones, his touch was as gentle as a butterfly's wing. But those tender platonic touches awakened an awareness in me, a budding hunger. I've wanted Deb for so long. I've lain next to him for a thousand nights, dreaming of forbidden touch, his touch. At first it was barely a thought. Later it became more insistent. But there was no opportunity. Since I rescue, the thoughts become urgent. 
Why can't we have this? Why is this forbidden? Lesbians can have great sex without a penis. Why can't we? After my time with the emperor, I'm convinced penises are highly overrated. Dev's my best friend, and I want him to be more. He's kissing me back, not saying no. His hands are roaming lower now, below my waist, to the top of my ass. I want to talk. I want to tell him all my thoughts and feelings. I want to tell him how long I've waited for this and how my core is drenched at the thought of his touch. But I fear my words will break the spell, so I focus on touch. Our tongues are slickly colliding, at times in the warm air, at times in his mouth or my own. He tastes so good, sweet and spicy, and like nothing I've ever sampled before. Maybe I'll write a poem tomorrow. No words tonight. He's so strong. My hands roam his broad, heavily muscled back. I order my fingers not to trace the thick scars that hide under his skin. I focus instead on the fill of the warm, red skin, stretched over ropey muscles. I touch the bare surface of his head, so soft and smooth, and then I'm drowning in the feeling of his mouth and my own. My breasts brush his hairless chest. My nipples are needy. I grab his hand and place it there. He pauses for a moment. Please, Dev. I need this. It's as if my words unlock the invisible chains that bound him. His hands roam wildly, hefting the weight of my breasts in his hands, then grasping my nipples between thumbs and forefingers. Yes, is all I say. He's frenzied now. His breathing is labored, his movements faster. My leg is slung over his, and I press my core against his thigh. He has to feel my wetness slide against him. Doesn't he know I'm burning for him? His fingers stay on my breasts, rolling the tips, pinching just hard enough to draw a gasp of pleasure from me. I bite his full lips, graze the thick cords of his neck with my teeth, and then press his head to my chest. I want his teeth to do that with my nipples. I feel the warmth of his breath there as he pauses. You're magnificent, Tawny. These are so large and lovely. A perfect shade of brown. He sucks one bud into his mouth and licks it with the hard tip of his tongue, then applies suction. That transports me into a haze. I can't think straight. I can only feel. He turns me onto my back, rolling with me and placing one knee between mine. I slide down and grind against him, surprising myself as I hear my labored breathing. My hands find the taut globes of his ass, pressing him against me even harder. The emperor's evil face pops into my mind, unbidden, leering at me, his lips ready to say some unspeakable thing. I freeze for the slightest moment, then locate my inner drill sergeant. I order myself in the most severe voice to be in this moment. My lids fly open, and I look at Dev, my Dev. Three years and a million lifetimes ago, I would have found the Emperor handsome and Dev terrifying. I've come a long way from there. I keep my eyes trained on Dev, the kindest male I've ever known. His presence calms me. My time on planet Emerus fades far into the background, and I'm here in our safe little cabin. I'm fully here, and my paralysis is gone. I grab Dev's handsome face with both hands and kiss him with all the emotion and affection and desperation I can cram into this kiss. His gaze is searing into mine, like I'm his lifeline. Make me feel good, Dev. I silently beg him to erase the memory of anyone else's hands on my skin. I want to feel clean when this is over. He bends his head over me and kisses from my collarbone to my nipple. He teases one bud with his teeth while he plucks the other with his strong fingers. An electric pulse zings from the point of contact to my clit, which is already buzzing with need. He leans up, licking and giving close-lipped kisses down my ribcage, 
to the hair above my sex. His fingers smooth up from my knees to my thighs, which are now so sensitive I can hardly bear the slightest pressure. And then his knuckles graze up, so lightly, I can scarcely feel them slide along my outer lips. Oh, my God! I want to force his fingers right where they belong. I'm desperate. But I simply grab the meaty tops of his shoulders and settle back into the soft bed, deciding to enjoy the slow pace of his exploration. He places his thumbs on either side of my clit and spreads me open, pulling enough to put pressure on the hood. I don't know what is more arousing, the tension of his fingers, or the fact that he's opened me up to him and is gazing at my most intimate parts. Beautiful Tawny, he says, his mouth so close I can feel his warm breath surge against my bud. He moves his thumbs to gently frame both sides of my clit. It's just enough pressure to keep me totally focused on his touch, but not enough to relieve my arousal in any way. Is he waiting for my agreement? I glance down to see him spear me with his deep brown gaze. In his position, he looks as if he's worshipping at my altar, like a supplicant. But he's waiting for me. Please, Dev. I know what I want. I want you. That was all I needed to say. He places his mouth over the entire area of my clit and sucks, awakening every cell in that cluster of nerves. My pelvis begins to thrust toward him of its own volition. Liquid arousal drips from my core. His thumbs still bracket the edges of my clit, providing friction that works in counterpoint to his tongue, which is licking the tip of my bud. He alternates suction with licking, with the pressure of his thumbs from the side, and I don't think I can tolerate a minute more of this without dying of desire. I'm either going to come or lose my mind. My hands are on the back of his head, pressing him down even harder. His tongue delivers more force, and my orgasm begins as my thighs quiver and a low moan escapes my throat. I reach blindly for his hand, motioning his fingers toward my core. He keeps both thumbs near my clit and moves two fingers into my slippery channel. My opening spasms around him as he thrusts in a delicious rhythm that mimics the one my hips are already dancing to. My orgasm rolls through me, lighting every nerve in my body on fire. My moan takes on a word, and that word is death. I think I'm piercing the flesh on his shoulders with my nails, but I can't control the spasming that is careening through every inch of my body. I fall back onto the bed, muscles still quivering, spent. I pull him up to share my pillow. I want to say so much, but all I admit to is, that was amazing. What is more amazing than the sensation still racing through my body and aftershocks is the look in Davalos's eyes. If I took a picture of him, it would be in the dictionary next to the word adoration. It's funny. After sharing such intimacy, I know both of us are holding back so many words. He strokes my cheek with one knuckle, then traces the outline of my lips, which are curved into a lazy smile. I notice he's still panting like a racehorse, and reality comes crashing down on me. Devi, my Devi, just gave me the best moment of my life, and he's lying there, unfulfilled. I should do something about it, but I don't have a clue what to do. The thought arrows into my head that I just used him as surely as the emperor used me. Obviously, I hadn't given a thought to anything other than my needs, my wants, my own pleasure. And damn it if he hadn't been all too eager to comply, to make me happy. I want to ask him, see if there's something I can do. But it's been an unspoken pact between us that we never mention the obvious. Which isn't right. It detracts from the intimacy we share in other ways. But if I bring up his lack of equipment, things will never be the same between us. My chest aches tightly in sadness at this thought. Davalos. That was incredible. 
Giving ecstasy to the woman I care about shouldn't feel like an honor, but it does. All those nights lying next to her, I never dreamed I would taste her cream on my tongue, her writhing under my touch, moaning my name in passion. That was possibly, no definitely, the best moment of my life. I should feel bad about this, about the syndrome, about taking advantage of her. Maybe I will tomorrow. But right now, the look on her face doesn't look like regret. It looks like happiness and satisfaction. I'm the one who should be filled with regret. I seriously underestimated the agony that would be coursing through my body after our tryst. I knew I'd be in pain. Having no penis but retaining my balls poses an interesting physical conundrum. I have the equipment and ability to exhibit desire and longing, but not to experience release. I kiss the top of her head, damp with sweat from our bed play, then walk into the restroom and turn on the shower. I'll be here a while. I hope she'll be asleep when I return. I avoid the mirror, although it only reflects me from the nipples up. I avoid anything it might show anything that might reveal how I've spent the last nine decades of my miserable life. I turn the shower on and stand under the hard spray, hoping the frigid water will erase the longing that is coursing through my veins, and hoping the pounding will erase my self-loathing for taking advantage of Tawny and that syndrome. I'm turning off the water and reaching for a towel when Tawny slips into the restroom. She doesn't look happy and sated anymore. She looks worried. Dev, you okay? You've been in here a long time. I'm fine, Sprout. Sprout? Not sure that translated properly. What did you mean? A sprout is a youngling. I'm 108. You're what, 30? 25. Like I said, a sprout. I finish drying behind the metal shower door. Sling the towel around my hips and enter the small toilet sink area. She's seen me nude a thousand times, but I still have no desire for her to see my deformity. Nor do I want to see the heartache on her face as she looks at it. If you don't like that pet name, I'll find another. I've been called lots of names, Dev. Sprout is a nice one. Let's get some sleep. Tomorrow my cousin is going to show us every inch of his ship as well as his entire inventory of ill-gotten gains. We'll need our strength. Chapter 6 Tawny I found a spice at the back of the cabinet that tastes like a mixture of nutmeg and cinnamon. It ups the Sumer's game to the point I offer to add a little to everyone's breakfast. After Dev tastes it and pronounces it good, the others give it a try. Then Toast enters the small kitchen, pulls out a chair, straddles it backward, and plops down next to us. We're at the rectangular table that takes up the middle of the room, leaving the cold box, stove, and cabinets along one wall. A bump out on the other end holds an upholstered love seat, chair, and scarred table that looks like it was carved from a tree. For a group of pirates with a lot of wealth, this room is a hodgepodge of the crappiest furniture in the galaxy but it's cozy and homey, and obviously the heart of the ship. I wanted to show you two around. Yeah, I admit. I want to show off a bit. He dazzles us with one of his easy smiles. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone as comfortable in his own skin as Thantos. He acted like a total prick when he was holding the Leaf on the Wind hostage, but he's been nothing but nice since we boarded his ship. I know I told you I wanted to give you lots of time, but if I get a vote, I want you to stay on the tranquility with me. I want to show you all the jobs we have for you. Unless you don't want to do anything at all. Which is fine. I've spent enough time doing nothing, cousin. I want to be useful. I have no idea what I have an aptitude for. I watch Deb's face as it shutters closed. I can only imagine he's thinking about what he did for work the last 90 years. I know he's not proud of abusing the Emperor's enemies in a dungeon, or of what he did to me. And you, Tawny, any ideas? I was young when I was taken. I enjoyed art and painting, although I wasn't very good. I look around, shrugging my shoulders. 
I doubt there's anything like that on board for me. Thantos jumps to his feet, gently grabs my upper arm and pulls me up. Come with me. He drags me out the door and calls over his shoulder to death. Don't make me wait, cuz. We descend a set of metal grill-like steps and race through hallways lined with furniture, mirrors, statues, and art. Thantos presses the palm print pad near the door at the end of the hall. The entrance slides open with a whoosh, and my head jerks back in surprise as I see floor-to-ceiling art and artifacts in the disorganized room. Art, Tawny! He indicates a quadrant of the room with a wave of his arm. We have lots of art. We could arrange for you to learn art restoration. There are courses you could take to discover how to discern forged from authentic. You could quantify, categorize, and inventory what we have. You could get proficient on comms and organize the placement of these masterpieces in auctions across the galaxy. He smiles broadly at me, far more excited about this than I am. He must see the lack of enthusiasm on my features. As it dawns on him, his own excitement vanishes from his face. Or not. His jaws snap shut, and he picks his way towards the door. No! I practically stumble after him. I... I was overwhelmed with all the choices. One particular painting calls to me, and I squat on the floor to get a better look where it's leaned against a musical instrument of some kind. It's not realistic, nor is it abstract in the earth definition. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. But the colors, the swirling greens and blues, the splashes of gold, speak to me. I'm drawn to it and have trouble pulling my gaze away. I can't imagine many things more challenging and fun than handling all of this fine art, discovering its value and finding a buyer for it. For the first time in years, excitement, enthusiasm, and optimism rush through my veins. I could have something to do other than count stones in the wall of my dungeon all day. I could be of use, have a purpose. Thank you. I know enthusiasm hums in my voice. I can see myself doing this, being of help. My face sweeps up into my first genuine smile in years. No rush, Tawny. We'll start when you're ready. I just want you to be happy. I want you and Dev to be happy. Davalos I'm a selfish male. I see Tawny's delight engaging with all of these stolen goods, her excitement at having productive work to do. All I want to do is touch her, as if her happiness could transfer to me. She's so alive, so spirited, and I'm dead. Two days ago, I longed to be physically dead to match my soul. I planned it. Now I want to be alive to be near her. It's so selfish. I just want to steal her joy. She could have such a full life without me. I'm holding her back. I see how she looks at me. Her need for me is measurable. Look at what happened last night. She doesn't have to say it out loud. I know she cares for me, and that's a hindrance. Whether it's that syndrome or some magical fairy tale spell, it doesn't matter. She's far too attached and dependent on me, and no matter how hard I try to convince her otherwise, it doesn't change. A plan develops in my mind. It creeps in unbidden, but arrives almost fully complete. Seneca, the medic, described the pool of water very well. A pool of azure blue at the base of a tall, rocky waterfall. It would be the work of a moment to climb to the top of the falls, stumble, and fall to my death down below. It would be much less difficult for her to tolerate than if I threw myself into the garbage jettison. That would be maudlin and sad and leave her with guilt. This would be a tragic accident. She would be able to mourn and then move on. Thantos and I will go to the planet and sit in the pool to cure his hangnail. I'll get restless, pick my way to the top of the falls, and accidentally plunge to my death. Heartbreaking, but unavoidable. He'll go back on board and hold the grieving female against his muscular chest for comfort. I know neither of them is aware of it, but I saw the energy spark between them. 
they have a connection. Before long, my cousin's comforting hugs will become more intimate. They would be good for each other. Tani already has a job aboard his ship. He's a caring male. He'll take care of her. I nod to myself, satisfied with my plan. It has a happy ending for everyone. Well, except me. For me, there are no happy endings. Tani Thantos dragged Dev off to show him every nook and cranny of the ship. I stayed behind to poke around. I don't know what's more fascinating, the art, the knickknacks, or the sheer enormity and variety of all the booty down in this cavernous cargo hold. This extensive assortment is mind-boggling. I breathe in and notice the air is rich with the smell of antiquity from around the galaxy. I can't keep my fingers from touching a porcelain figurine here, a wooden frame there. I could enjoy playing with these artistic toys for a long time. After an hour or so, I decide I'll have to come back because right now I need to talk to the medic. Dev said he was sincere, concerned, and helpful. I didn't really trust the blue doctor on the leaf. He was furious at Dev and treated me like I would break if he touched me too hard. I have a compelling need to know something. It sounds like Seneca is a better choice. Do you have a moment? My body lingers outside the door. Only my head has crossed the threshold of Medbay. I don't want to intrude. You're Devalos's female, he says warmly. Then gives me a kindly smile as he gestures me in. The room is tiny and filled with medical equipment of all kinds. There are two medbot arms standing like silent sentinels in their holsters against the wall. Another wall is almost floor to ceiling drawers, and there's a metal exam table in the middle. I see an even tinier private exam room connected to this one. Can I help you, Tani? I realize I haven't entered the room yet, so I slip through the doorway, then stand rooted where I am. I have a few questions. I sound so tentative. This is going to be hard. I'd be happy to help. Have a seat. I'm relieved to see him gesture toward a small chair near the head of the exam table and not the table itself. I sit there. He leans his hip against the metal table. I, I think you know the gist of what happened to me for the last three years. I take a deep breath, and after he nods compassionately, I launch. I never got pregnant despite, you know. I wonder if the emperor was sterile or just run out of gas. Crap. I don't have to say the rest. I stare directly at him, tighten my fists, and continue with determination. I wonder if all the awful things he did damaged me so badly that I'll never get pregnant. Deep breath. Done. I understand how hard this must be for you. First, I'll do a med scan, see if that gives us the information we need. I'll do an internal exam as a last resort. I haven't had a female under my care in many decades, Tani. But I'll be gentle and respectful. If at any time you want to stop, just know we can finish this another day. Perhaps you would like to come back with Davalos. I'm a free agent, Doc. This is between you and me, okay? Absolutely. He pats the table and I hop up and lie down, fully clothed. He uses his fancy med scan, which looks a hell of a lot like a computer pad from Earth. He purses his lips and shakes his head. Nothing definitive. I'm afraid I'll have to take a look. He steps out of the room after handing me a thin blanket and returns when I call softly. I put my feet in the stirrups and focus on a speck of dried blood on the ceiling. I calm myself by deciding it's probably decades old. By the time I'm done with this little tangent, He's already inserted a flexible tube, the circumference of a coffee stir stick into my vagina. This will send pictures and information back to the med pad, and he removes the probe and helps me sit up. We'll have our information as soon as I... He looks at the pad, frowns, 
Then his fingers fly over its surface, his brow furrowing deeper with every passing second. Sorry, Tawny, I... There's a lot of internal damage. There are many things that could be repaired. But when you add them all together, there's too much damage. I couldn't repair enough for you to carry a child to term. He looks away, not wanting to intrude on the thoughts flying through my mind. I'm not sure what my face expresses. To be honest, I'm not even sure what I'm feeling. He reaches out and grasps my hand in a fatherly way. Sorry. I shrug and wipe the corners of my eyes before any tears spill out. I'd be a crappy mom. No loss, really. I hadn't thought I really wanted a child, but the tightness in my chest tells another story. You don't need to keep up a brave front for me. His piercing look is so compassionate. This must be doubly difficult after finding out Davalos can sire children. What a blow, knowing your two species are compatible to produce offspring. What? Track. His mouth quirks down and to the side in consternation. Davalos didn't tell you, did he? No, n no. Deb did not mention he got any important news from you. His eyes flare wide for a moment, then resume their normal shape. Is he hiding something else? I don't even wait for him to step out of the room before I pull on my panties and leggings. I'm not sure which is the most upsetting news, that I can't have kids or that Dev can. Now that he knows he can father a child, would he even want to be with a woman who couldn't conceive? It's too crazy and confusing. I should have never even bothered to find out. Thanks, Seneca. I'm sorry to have to deliver such bad news. The truth is the truth. You can't change it. I sound strong and nonchalant as I casually shrug my shoulders. Inside, I'm cracking apart. I slip out and hurry through the corridors to my room hoping the whole way that Deb is still exploring the ship with Thantos. It's my lucky day. My cabin's empty. I kick my flip-flops off and lie down. My thoughts are flying around so fast I can't even think straight. Slowly, I calm myself enough to keep a train of thought. A week ago, I knew with certainty I'd die in a dungeon on planet Emerus. I had no hope of being rescued or ever having a semblance of a normal relationship with the male I care about. I'm in such a better place than I dreamed possible. I have Dev. We're safe. And we even have a place to live. A new place to call home. I look around me at our little room. At first glance, it could pass for a college dorm back on Earth. Just a few things are different, like the bright lighting and metallic walls. I feel the vibration and distant thrum of the engines. If I walk to the bridge, I'll see a vast array of stars scattered across the galaxy. I'm not on Earth anymore. Any semblance of a normal life was lost three years ago when I was abducted by aliens. I've known for a long time there would be no picket fence or 2.2 children in my future. Breathing in a deep, calming sigh, I nod my head and sit up. I'm full of determination. I'm going to choose to look at the glass as half full. I'm alive. I'm safe. I'll have meaning for work if I want it. And I have Dev. My Dev. That's all I need. I couldn't bear to hang out in my room all day with nothing to do. I had three years of that, and I don't want one more day of it. I wander to the kitchen, the core of the ship. Young Destin is there. Destin's not a Promian. He's humanoid with expressive feline eyes. Since everyone calls him Young Destin, I wonder exactly what that means. I'm helping him make a stew-like dish to go over the ubiquitous noodles we seem to eat for every meal on the ship. He has me chopping what passes for a vegetable on board the Tranquility. So everybody calls you Young Destin. How old are you? I ask as I use a knife to push the green stick-like veggies I just cut into the pot. Thirty annums. He grabs four orange oblong waxy vegetables from the cold box and tosses them to me one at a time. Cut these drennels into pieces this big. He indicates his thumbnail. 
How old are you? Twenty-five. These things may look a bit like bell peppers, but they're tough as nails. I rummage in a drawer for a bigger, sharper knife. Great, he crows. I'm not the youngest on the ship anymore. I'll be happy to inform everyone of that fact. He does a little happy dance as he pulls spices from the cabinet. Dev and Thantos choose this moment to join us. Sitting down on the overstuffed couch in the little attached alcove. It definitely looks like the most comfortable piece of furniture on the ship, even though it's battered and smudged with dirt. I glance over at Dev and look him up and down. He's so handsome. His body is big and muscular. He has those broad shoulders that narrow in a V to his waist. I've only seen him nude or in a loincloth for the past three years, but wearing black cargo-type pants and a tight black t-shirt accentuates his sexuality. My face flushes, and heat blooms in my loins as I think about last night. That was amazing. I drag my eyes back to my work. I'll never tire of looking at his tribal-type markings. They usually look so fierce, but today his face is calmer. The markings appear less threatening. It must feel wonderful for him to be safe and with people who care about him after so many years as a slave. While struggling with the stubborn vegetable, I accidentally cut a deep slice into my left index finger. Shit! I drip blood all over the floor as I hurry to the sink to run it underwater. Deb is up and at my side in a heartbeat, looking at my finger with concern. He pulls it out from under the stream of water, just long enough to see it's still bleeding heavily. He lifts me up and appears about to run to Medbay. Deb, stop! I consider accusing him of being a drama queen, but I say nothing. How good it must feel for him to finally, after all he's watched me go through, be able to get me the help I need. He has me pressed against his chest like I'm the most cherished commodity on this ship. I like the feeling of being taken care of. I could get used to this. It's just a cut. I don't verbalize the obvious, which is that one week ago, this wouldn't have warranted a second thought. Let's get this fixed, Sprout. His brow is furrowed with concern. Seneca saunters in for dinner, sees my hand dripping blood, and checks me out. Looks like it will be fine if you just keep pressure on it, the doc announces then snatches a piece of drennel and pops it in his mouth. Did you do that on purpose? Thantos teases. He purses his lips and shoots me a questioning look with his eyebrow cocked. He looks mischievous, like he did when he had us in his web and was tormenting us on the bridge of the leaf on the wind. I assure you I can be clumsy without trying. Besides, why would I do that on purpose? I thought you were just trying to maneuver a free trip to paradise. A trip to paradise, Dantos. On Earth, that would sound vaguely dirty. A trip to planet paradise, he amends, with Davalos and me. Were you jealous that we were getting a dip in the planet's healing waters and you weren't invited? He cocks his head, still teasing, into his face sobers incrementally, probably mirroring my own increasingly clenched jaw and flared nostrils. Trip to paradise? Healing waters? I'm staring directly at Davalos now. I got the vibe from the medic earlier that I had been kept out of a secret. Now I know that's true. Shit. Thantos' voice is quiet and serious. I've dragged something up, cuz. Seneca stands, grabs Thantos' arm, and they're halfway out of the room when he says, Thantos and I have urgent matters to attend to down the hall. He tosses a glance at Destin. That, if I read it right, told the young male to save himself and figure out a reason to leave the room, too. Yeah, me, too, Destin mumbles and leaves at a jog. Dev sets me down, but keeps his hands on my shoulders. Sorry, I should have told you. Yeah, I guess. So, what's the secret? My jaw is tight. I'm holding back tears. I thought Dev and I were a team. The idea that he kept a huge secret from me makes my chest ache. He explains about the alleged healing properties of the water on this mysterious planet and the possible cure for his amputation. 
I'm trying to figure out how to tell him that although I like the medic, I think Seneca and this whole idea are utter bullshit. He interrupts my thoughts by saying, I think it's complete drack. Okay, so we're both agreed on that. Why didn't you tell me, though? Grabbing my good hand in both of his, he leans his face near mine. He takes a deep breath. I think if I had told you, it would somehow make it real. Give the idea legitimacy. I didn't want either of us to get our hopes up. Because you have that syndrome, I wanted to help you discover you can do better. So much better than me. I didn't want you to think there was even the slightest chance anything good could come from us. My anger flares. I can feel my cheeks heat. How many times do I need to tell you I'm not confused about this? I've had a front row seat to observe your character for three years. I know who you are. You're a good male, with or without a dick. And I know who I am too. I went to Emerus, an angry young woman. Emerus annihilated my spirit and crushed the anger out of me. It left a sad, pathetic shell. But I still know what I want. I don't have Stockholm Syndrome. Oh, and by the way, last night exceeded expectations. I give him a tight smile, still waiting for an apology from him for leaving me out of the loop. The tension in his face vanishes and is replaced by an almost imperceptible smile, then a frown. I don't deserve a female as good as you, Tawny. I shouldn't have kept a secret from you. He looks me straight in the eyes and says sincerely, I'm sorry. Do you want to go to paradise with Thantos and me? We'll do scans to make certain the planet is safe before we leave the ship. My anger evaporates, though I'm still hurt that he kept such a big secret from me. I can't really claim the moral high road here. After all, I haven't exactly shared the shitty news I got from the doctor today. Yes. I'd like to bathe in the magical pool with you, I tease, not divulging I have something I want to heal on Paradise myself. Chapter 7 Davalos A quarter hour later, Thantos knocks on the doorway of the dining area and waits for our response before he enters. The tension is no longer palpable between Tawny and I. It's safe, he calls and everyone piles in for dinner. One minima later, everyone's laughing heartily as they reminisce about a recent heist they pulled on Eon, too. Then Tos reaches over and grabs Tani's wrist. You okay? He asks, as he looks directly into her eyes, clearly inquiring about more than her cut. A pang stabs my heart as I realize I was right about the chemistry between them. Part of me rejoices as I realize I was correct in my fantasy that they'll become a couple after my demise. The other part dies a little when I think of the happiness they'll share when I'm dead and gone. He grabs us both a plate of food, and the table talk turns to good-natured ribbing about the extra seasoning in the food. The obor tastes especially good tonight, Marcus the pilot declares with a grin. Griff, the mechanic, takes an exaggerated bite of his food, then smacks his lips. Yes, I just can't tell what that special taste is. Young Destin adds, I don't know. It does taste richer. He smiles. More flavorful. Perhaps we should add a little Earth Girl blood to every dish. Thantos winks at Tawny. Think you could spare some? On my planet, nothing comes for free. She's joining in the fun. There would be a slight charge for that. How about we keep allowing you to ride inside of the ship instead of outside it? Sextus, the fierce ex-military muscle on the crew, asks in a tone so gruff, I'm not certain he's joking. Then Toes claps Sextus on the back and laughs, making certain we all take it as a joke even if it wasn't meant to be. We'll be on paradise in three days. Thantos' voice is suddenly serious. Seneca says the wild game on the planet is mouth-watering. Davalos, Tani, and I will be going on a little excursion of our own. 
Sextus, I'd like you to kill as much game as Destin says will fit in our freezers. Doc, are you going to join us down on the planet? Davalos asks. Yes, a quick dip in the pool. Then I'll go exploring. Marcus, I'm going to ask you to sit this one out. Stay on the ship, monitor comms, and make sure everything is going smoothly. Griff? Thentos looks at the mechanic. Destin and I will go down to the planet for maybe an aura, Griff replies. We want to be able to say we've traveled to paradise. They both laugh. All right. Thentos digs into his bowl of noodles. I'll be taking suggestions in my inbox as to where we'll be off to after our little vacation. As I take my shower, I can't help but think about what happened last night in bed. I know I should have asked to bunk with one of the other males on the ship tonight. Every day that passes, every additional intimacy we share will just confuse her more. Not to mention making my heart crack further apart. Tani already took her shower and is lying in bed under the covers. She's facing away, her body motionless. It looks like she's asleep. Good. Hopefully there will be no temptation, no replay of last night. I crawl in on the far side and face away from her. My thoughts turn to the curve of her breasts, the dusky color of her folds, the aroma of her arousal. I haven't had this sensation in decades, but I can feel my cock. I had heard of phantom limb pain back on my home planet, where people still sense their appendages after they were severed. During my captivity, I had no access to the intergalactic database, no physician to ask, so I assumed what I had was phantom cock pain. I haven't experienced this in animals. I guess today's my lucky day. Lying in bed with Tawny, hearing her quiet breathing, knowing she's inches away and her breasts could be in my palms in a modicum, yes, that's a great time for my penis to resurrect itself. My testicles are doing their job, pulsing with arousal, sending desire through my bloodstream to every cell in my body. My mind is very clever, very talented at torturing me tonight. Tawny's breathing changes. I'm immediately attuned to the fact she's awake. She scoots closer, presses herself against me, and throws her arm around me. The hard points of her breasts brush against my back, and I feel the soft tickle of her nether hair against my ass. Dev? The word is barely whispered. It's almost a sigh. She nips the skin on my shoulder blades, then kisses her way to the nape of my neck. Scraping the skin there, she has my full attention. She licks, then blows. My phantom cock actually bobs in approval. Am I dreaming? This is insane. Her tight nipples drag along my skin as she moves up and leans over me. Her tongue is trailed up my neck, along my scalp, and is now lodged behind my ear. Every iota of my consciousness is aware of the location of her slick, hard tongue. Why am I allowing this? This vessel doesn't carry enough water to shower long enough to cool my lust. With no way to relieve my arousal, I'll be a ball of pain after this. Dangerous. This is dangerous. Tawny. My voice is a low, breathy growl. It doesn't sound like it belongs to me. She acts as if she didn't hear me. She licks the taut skin behind my ear, then grabs my earlobe with her teeth. She nips, then nibbles as she sucks the tiny ball of flesh into her mouth. My hips pump the empty air in front of me. Her hips press against my ass, mock humping me from behind. She nips the cartilage along the outside of my ear, from lobe to where it's attached at the top. I haven't experienced this level of excitement of lust since before my captivity. This is more intense than what I felt last night with my mouth between her legs. She blows humidly into my ear, then sucks in. My breath escapes in a shocked huff. How can her simple act stimulate me so intensely? You like that, Dev? She does it again, 
And instead of getting used to it and losing its effect, it grows more arousing, more powerful. What's better, this? She pulls away enough that just the tight peaks of her breasts slide along my back as if she's tracing a picture or writing words with their peaks. Gods, is all I can reply. My voice so low, it's almost a growl. Or this. She presses her furred mons against the flesh of my ass, mimicking the thrusts of intercourse. Or this, Dev. This. Her mouth is near my ear again, and her warm breath puffs slowly in and sucks out in a quick gasp. A soft grunt escapes my mouth involuntarily in answer. Yes, Dev. This. She bites and sucks and nibbles and does her breathing trick, which causes bumps to rise on my skin. Her nipples press against my back as she reaches around and grasps one of mine between her fingers. My senses are on overload. I never knew my nipples were this sensitive. My phenom penis kicks at my hips, which are bucking involuntarily. Her other hand slips under my arm. Now she's clinging against my back both hands twisting and flicking my nipples as she uses some type of witchcraft to assault my ear. I haven't experienced this feeling in 20 anims, but all the muscles in my body tense as if they're gathering the energy for an orgasm. No, this couldn't be happening. Did you say more? She breathes into my ear. She throws her leg across my hip. I can picture her core exposed and needy. I can smell her arousal, which amps me up another notch. No. The word escapes from the back of my throat, guttural and breathy. Yes, more. She twists my nipples harder in unison as she spears my ear wetly with her tongue. Drack! It's a barking shout as I orgasm. I've never experienced pleasure like this before. Instead of a short, hot, quick burst of pleasure, this rolls up from my toes to my balls to the top of my head. Every muscle in my body is straining. I feel this orgasm in the cords of my neck, the rigidity of my jaw, my curled toes, my hands gripping the sheets. My face is a tight rictus that might look like pain, but is the expression of pure bliss. My hips are pistoning against nothing. I feel liquid spurt from my phantom penis. Surely this is a hallucination, but the wetness soiling the sheets is real. Tawny, I grunt as my muscles are still contracting, the release still clenching every muscle in my body. My eyes widen as I wonder if this pulsing, squeezing wave of pleasure will go on forever. But it slows, then diminishes then stops. I flip over and engulf Tani in the tightest hug possible. I kiss every surface of her face, forehead, eyebrows, cheeks, lips, and chin. My right hand pats behind my ass, searching for evidence that it really happened. My fingers encounter a large wet spot in the tangled folds of the sheets. That was not a hallucination. How was that possible? I ask. I don't care. Make me come, Dev, she demands with a huge smile on her face as she rolls onto her back and opens her legs in invitation. I slip a finger along the edge of her folds and find she's dripping wet, drenched. She scoots up, lays her head on the pillow and opens her knees even wider for me. For a moment, I wish that phantom penis was real. I would slip into her wet core in one thrust and pound hard and fast until she came. I'll just have to be more creative. I hold her gaze as I slip one finger into her warm channel. Ah, yes, she smiles. A second finger joins the first. Then I press the heel of my hand against her bundle of nerves. I'm so wet for you, Dev. So ready. Her face is flushed. Her eyes half closed in lust. I latch on to one nipple, sucking and scraping, as I press her clit in circles with my hand and thrust with my fingers. Dev! She sounds sexy and surprised.
as her orgasm comes barreling through her. Her thighs quiver. Then her inner muscles clamp onto my fingers in rhythmic release. Fuck, she sighs, happily sated. Scooting up, I join her on her pillow. I fall asleep almost immediately, while I'm wondering if I'll ever tire of looking at her beautiful face. Tawny I wake up to the incredible sight of Dev's back as he rummages on the top shelf of the closet. His back skin is red, which is mostly what I see. It meets the black of his front in a fairly straight line, interrupted by white travel-type markings. If I was a better artist, I would paint him. Muscles tight, haunches straining, arms reaching. He's a sight to behold. What you doing? His hands are full of a set of sheets he found. Made a mess. Lifting the sheets for me to see, he's grinning from ear to ear. Being pleased about coming all over the sheets would be a strange phenomenon on Earth. But considering it was the first time he orgasmed in 20 years, yeah, I get why he's happy. He motions with his thumb for me to vacate the bed, then strips it while I watch. Both of us are stark naked. I've never seen his mood so light. I guess the guy had blue balls for two decades. Blue balls. Hmm. What's black and white and red all over? I wonder if the front half is black, the back red, and lean in just as he bends over to smooth the top sheet. I'm not exactly sure, but I think they're red with white markings. Interesting. Two days to paradise, Dev. What are we doing today? His easy attitude disappears as he seems to realize he's waltzing around without clothing. He keeps his back to me as he retrieves his pants and shimmies into them. I get it. Shame. I'm well acquainted with it myself. Thento says he'll teach me a few basics of navigating today. He says I should be cross-trained on every job on the ship. He has a faraway look on his face. He's about to shrug into his shirt when I shout, Halt! He looks startled and freezes. Let a girl admire your muscles, big guy. Can you wait to put that on until we're ready to leave our room? My eyebrows waggle of their own volition. He smiles. Not a little smile or a half smile or a Mona Lisa smile. No, this is a smile big enough to show some pearly white teeth. He walks toward me, almost dancing, shaking his shoulders, showing off his black pecs the white markings jumping as he flexes his muscles. He's still too thin from all those years in captivity, but I've never seen him so at home in his body, so loose, so alive. Handsome? I pet the bed, wanting him to join me. I'm nude, lying on my hip, knees bent. I feel like Mata Hari or Marilyn Monroe, a seductress. No, he shakes his head then grabs his shirt and drags it over his head. It's like a swift wind brought in an arctic cold front over the savanna. The open emotions on his face shudder closed. Playtime is officially over. A frisson of fear spears through me. There was something about the tone of voice when he said no, or maybe the look he gave me out of the corner of his eye. For just one second, I was back in the dungeon. I give my head a little shake, push that out of my mind, and announce, I guess it's time for Sumra. He nods curtly. Davalos. I've got to get my drack together. Just because we had an amazing time in bed last night doesn't mean anything has changed. I still abused her. She still has that syndrome where she thinks she's attached to me. Last night was phenomenal. I won't deny that. But how long can I satisfy her without a real cock? It was wonderful to come. For a moment, I felt like a real male. All I have to do is look straight down and see the ruined, discolored place where my manhood should be. And it's like being awakened in a pool of ice water. Reality is a bitter pill. How long can I tolerate this level of self-loathing? Two days until we reach paradise is more than enough torture. I'm ready to end things there. Chapter 8 Davalos 
Almost everyone on board is crammed into the small bridge, looking out the floor to ceiling windows. From up here, the planet looks lush, with tranquil azure waters surrounding land covered with verdant green plants. As Thantos waits for Sextus to arrive, I avoid Tawny's eyes and pretend to be fascinated by the planet below. It's been an awkward two days. The more I reflected on what happened that last night in bed, how pathetic my behavior was, the more embarrassed I became. What female could possibly be attracted to a male like me? Thentos was smart enough not to ask questions about my request to sleep in his cabin. Smart enough also to avoid using his wit and sarcasm to even mention it. I took my meals in our room and avoided Tawny. Until now. Thentos kept me informed of her swift progress as she learned how to find prices on the intergalactic database and how she was researching how to discern genuine from forgeries. He said she seemed happy with these new tasks. I avoided the unspoken questions that lingered in the air between us. With each passing day, I thought I could detect more warmth, more affection in his voice when he spoke of her. Good. My plan is coming together. I'm not certain why it squeezes my heart with such a tight grip. I shake my head and keep my eyes averted from her probing brown ones. I can feel her questing gaze from the other side of the room. She's been eating with these males every morning and night. They must have formed friendships. They have an easy camaraderie as they banter back and forth, joking and teasing. This is good. In about three or four auras, I'll have a tragic accident. She'll be free from the burden of worrying about me and attempting to make me feel good. They'll all move forward without me, as they should. Sextus rushes in, a laser rifle slung over one shoulder, two extra energy canisters and a pistol hanging from his belt. He hands the pistol to everyone in the landing party, bending close to Tawny to ensure she knows how to use it. Everyone has a pistol and wrist calm. Whether you're alone or with others, check in at least once in Aura. Back aboard the ship by 1600. Thentos is serious and direct. One of his strengths is captain. He can have fun with the best of them, but when it comes to safety or money, he's all business. Doc, are you coming with Tawny, Dev and I? Show us where we're going. Seneca nods as he shoves his gun into one of his numerous pockets. I glance at Tawny from the corner of my eye. Sextus has equipped her with a holster and is fastening it around her tiny waist. I breathe deeply, clench my fists, and control my rising impulse to rush over and beat him to a pulp. I question my sanity at having left Tawny alone on a ship full of six lusty males while I hid in Thantos' room. What does it matter? I'll be gone forever by 1600. We're on the ground in Minimus. Sextus and Griff take off on the hunt before Tawny, Thentos, Doc, and I get our bearings. Young Destin strikes off on his own. Seneca's coordinates from Anums ago were accurate, and the tranquility touched down within a mill of the waterfall. As we tramp through thick underbrush, I notice the perfect temperature and lack of humidity. Everything seems so calm on this planet. Tani tries to walk next to me. Luckily, we're making our own trail, and for a while, there is no way to walk two abreast. She lags behind, causing me to slow down. I don't care how much I wish to avoid her. I can't allow her to bring up the rear. It would put her in too vulnerable a position. We're now 25 fiertos behind the others, the path barely wide enough for the two of us. You haven't talked to me in two days, Dev. How rude is it not to answer someone's knock at your door? You can't avoid me forever. Well, yes, I can. But I don't say it. I don't want to go to my grave with her feeling guilty, like she didn't do enough. You're right, Tawny. I suppose there were a lot of things I needed to come to terms with. It was rude of me. Unforgivable, really. I just needed some time to myself. Perhaps I was worried about the outcome of our jaunt today. Whatever the cause, I'm sincerely sorry. 
I spear her with a somber gaze, apologizing for so much more than she could fathom at this moment. She grabs my hand and looks up at me with a sweet gaze. We're a team, Dev. In the future, don't avoid me. Come to me. Tell me what's wrong, if you can. I can give you space if you need it. We've been through a lot. I may need some space at some point, too. I've passed the last two days with a bunch of males who spent too much time in the company of other males, in outer space with no females. I haven't heard that much cussing, farting, or tall tales in all my life. I missed you, my friend. I have a moment of insanity where I question my decision, wondering if I should back out of my plan and stay with Tawny. No. Bad idea. I'm like a heavy weight holding her back. I need to go forward with my scheme. Her hand feels small and warm in mine. She's grasping me tightly, as if I'm the most important thing to her, and she doesn't want to lose me. If only things were different. I would spend my life with her. I'd love her and care for her. I'd protect her and provide for her. But things aren't different. And the way she's looking at me, right this minima, like I'm the bravest, smartest, best-looking male in the galaxy, is only because of the terror she experienced at my hands. Only because of that syndrome. I hear Doc and Thantos murmuring to each other up ahead. They've stopped and are staring. When we catch up with them, I can see why. The falls are beautiful. Breathtaking. It's two falls, really. The mountain is wide and perhaps 120 fiertos tall. There's a jagged peak at the top and the water comes rushing off in gushes on either side of the apex. In the middle, there are perhaps 10 fiertos with no water. You can clearly see the green, craggy rock of the wall behind it. The rest of the mountain is obscured by the veil of the turquoise-hued water flowing in two torrents to the pool at the bottom. Directly under the falls, the water is churning and forming whitecaps. However, only a few fiertos away, the pool is calm and still. It flows gently off into a slow-moving, meandering river. The doc's face has a look of wonder. I imagine he's remembering every moment of his sojourn here decades ago. He remembered it well. It really is paradise. If I wasn't contemplating suicide, this scene would calm me. The beauty could almost heal one's soul. But I lost my soul a long time ago. And I'm of no use to anyone now. It's time to leave this plane of existence and let everyone move on without me. It's the work of a moment to mentally pick my way toward the top of the mountain. I'll tell everyone I'll be fine, not to worry. I'm just having fun. I'll climb to that spot there, about halfway. It's about 50 ferretos straight up. It will look believable for my foot to slip on the slimy, moss-covered rock. I'll fall. And if the sharp rocks don't kill me, the churning water down below certainly will. Poor Davalos. What a shame. Let's say some words over his dead carcass and move on. Thantos and the doc have already shucked their clothes and are swimming from our side of the pool directly across toward the waterfall. They find a place that's calm, but near the spray of the falls. They're treading water. Their bursts of laughter carry across the pool as loudly as if they were five fiertos away. The air is warm enough to enjoy a dip in the lake. Too bad I have to ruin their day. Tani slips out of her leggings and holster, but keeps on her long top and panties. She looks like she was born to the water as she dives in and catches up to the two males in a few strokes. I put my gun on the ground, pull off my shirt, shuck my pants, and dive in as quickly as possible to hide my deformity. From whom, I don't know. Gods! I haven't swum in anums. Heaven. It's the perfect temperature. It's as if I'm being caressed, held, and yes, healed. I hold no illusions that this water will heal my flesh. 
but I do feel comforted and safe here. I glance over at Tani and see an expression of awe on her face. I wonder if she feels it too. I swim to her side in a few powerful strokes. Even though we're close to the two males, the roar of the falls obliterates our words to anyone farther than three fiertos away. Tani I hate to sound like a gullible dolt, Dev, but do you feel it? Like we're in some church. It's ridiculous, but it's as if I'm being held in the hand of, I don't know, God. I suddenly realize how ridiculous I sound and silently curse the medic. I think he set us up for this. My logical mind knows there's nothing magical happening here. We're just in a beautiful place with warm, peaceful water and calm azure skies. Ambient temp is maybe a perfect 85 degrees. The steady sound of the falls could lull you to sleep. It's definitely a step up from a dungeon. I haven't felt this level of calm since, perhaps ever. I have the feeling that everything will be okay. That all is right with the world. That nothing bad is going to happen. I feel warm and safe and am filled with a deep knowing that everything between Deb and I will work out, even though I'm getting an odd detached vibe from him today. Deb and I float in the water for long minutes, holding hands, enjoying the peace. I don't know who notices it first, but within two seconds of the disturbance, all four of us are scrambling toward each other, voices raised in shouts of panic. It started as a rumble like the planet was moving strangely, like a shift. The water in the huge pool is no longer placid, but is splashing outside its boundaries in five-foot waves. Dev puts a strong arm around me and begins scissor-kicking to the closest shore. It's like going from the Comus Lake to being dumped into the ocean during a Category 5 hurricane. My senses are swamped in confusion. Fear races up my spine. I have no idea what's happening. I just know I need to paddle to shore. I thought I was a strong swimmer, but thank God for Dev. I couldn't have made it under my own power. I swallowed a gallon of water on the way and found my mind wandering about amoebas, bacteria, and dirt. What I should have been worrying about was breathing or drowning. I have a chance to look over at Thantos and the dock. They're struggling, but kept up with us. A minute later, we're all splayed out on the muddy shore, desperately gasping for breath. Perhaps we all realize at the same time that the intense roar of the falls has now morphed into silence. Utter silence. The term calm before the storm passes through my mind right before I hear the screaming. Screaming is a funny description when it's from far away. No matter how soft the noise is, Somehow a little part in the back of your brain knows it's urgent. I have no idea who's making the noise, but I'm so terrified my lips and hands are trembling. Come, Dev shouts as he grabs my hand and pulls me toward the far side of the shore where our clothes are. We're hurrying, but it's less like running and more like slogging. The sloshing and the waves drench the first 20 feet of the shore, and it's a muddy bog. We're hustling to grab our weapons, which we all dropped with our clothes when we arrived here and caught our first glimpse of paradise. I'm the last to arrive. I have mud starting to cake all the way up past my knees, but I'm not paying attention to my state of undress. I won't feel comfortable until I have my gun in my hand. Now armed, we naturally put our backs together and look out in all directions, wanting to provide a semblance of protection for ourselves and each other. See anything? Dev asks with urgency. No. Can anyone tell where the yelling is coming from? Maybe I'm crazy, but I thought I heard it from behind the waterfall, I say, as every muscle in my body tightens. Some of the tension is from fear, some because the temperature has dropped maybe 20 degrees in the last 10 minutes, and I'm wearing a soggy t-shirt and panties. We all fall quiet, straining to hear the noise, trying to discern which direction it's coming from. I think she's right, the doc says, motioning his chin toward the place where the falls used to be. Holy fuck! 
I say as I point to where the slow-flowing, meandering river had been when we arrived. I see a wall of water, maybe twenty feet tall, barreling at us from a quarter mile away. Dev pulls my arm as we run toward the mountain, away from the swift-moving onslaught of water that is rushing toward us. The mud is sucking me down with every step. My muscles are already quivering from overuse and frigid air. The back of my mind registers the temp has dropped maybe five more degrees. Move! Dev yells. Looks like there are caves behind the falls. I hope they're deep, and I hope we can get there before we're smashed to bits against the rocks. I focus on lifting my feet as swiftly as possible and getting to the tenuous safety waiting in the caves. I try not to wonder what cataclysmic event is happening to this planet, that a river has reversed course and a waterfall quit flowing. In order to access the caves, we have to get back into the pool, which is now much shallower than when we began. Dev picks me up, holds me against his chest, and jumps in feet first. Our heads dip underwater, and then we pop back up. Let me go, Dev. We'll never get there with him carrying me. I'm a strong swimmer and focus on hand over hand over hand as I head behind where the curtain of falls used to be. I refuse to feel my terror, or I'll be paralyzed with fear. Just make my way to safety. That's my only goal. We reach the edge of the pool that butts up against the gaping maw of the cave. Dev, who has already pulled himself onto the rocky shore, reaches down and hauls me up then grabs my wrist and pulls me deeper into the cave system. I don't see either Thantos or the dock. It's every man for himself at this point. That wall of water is waiting for no one. Obviously, Dev has no idea where he's going. He's functioning on impulse, simply heading farther and farther from daylight. I'm hoping the water runs out of speed and capacity before we run out of the cave. Dev, look up! I'm panting so hard I'm surprised he heard me. We're in a cavernous room with a high ceiling, maybe 80 feet high. I don't even have time to question my eyes when I see ancient steps hand-hewn into the wall. They rise all the way up toward the ceiling and end at what looks like an arched passageway that leads further into the wall of rock. Steps, I point. The problem is the steps start about nine feet off the ground. The sound of the onslaught of water is thunderous. It's clear we don't have much time. Dev pulls me to the steps, grabs me by the waist, and helps me high enough to grab the bottom step. Hurry, Tawny! He yells. I see the water breach the yawning mouth of the cave. I use every ounce of upper body strength I possess and pull myself up so I'm crouched on the uneven surface of the first stone step. Finding an ancient crevice with one hand, I hold on for dear life and reach my other hand for his. He shakes his head, eyes wide in fright. Run! It's an order. I don't move. I just hold my hand for him. For a second, it seems he's not going to join me. Then he grabs my wrist as I clasp his. Between his phenomenal leap and my stabilizing his huge body, his fingers grasp the edge of the bottom step. Run, he orders, and I take off, knowing he can claw his way up, get his feet on the bottom step and follow. I'm at the top of the stairs, halfway through the tall archway and into the adjoining passageway. I turn to watch and see Dev hurtling up the steps, maybe ten feet above the crest of the water. Hurry, I urge, more fearful for him than myself. I see something bobbing near the surface of the churning white water. It's one of the males. Dev! I don't know how he heard me, but somehow his head looks in the direction I'm pointing. He sees it too. He steps back down, and with perfect timing, he grabs hold and drags it up. It's the dock, not moving. Dev carries him up the steps to the archway where I'm standing. The water's still twenty feet below us, but it's raging onward. It's hit the back of the cavern, and there's nowhere for it to go. It will be rising and following us down the corridor in moments. Dev sets the dock down, then hurries back down a few steps, obviously looking for Thantos. I turn my attention to Seneca, rolling him on his side and giving back blows 
like I saw in a movie once. He spurts out water, but is still unconscious. More back blows, more retching, more back blows, and he sputters back to awareness. Dev's carrying Thantos up the steps at a run. I don't know how he found the mail and don't have time to ask. We are all hurrying down the hallway in whatever direction it leads. The water is swiftly approaching, and so is the darkness. No light can penetrate the murky depths of the water behind us, and the cave in front of us is pitch black. We're running blind. I assume all three males are behind me. I just keep putting one foot ahead of the other, not acknowledging this is a life and death struggle against an onslaught of water. My muscles are so fatigued, they're quivering. My teeth are chattering from the freezing cold. Terror races along my veins, but still I run forward, stumbling in the dark. My quads and calves are screaming in pain, and I realize this corridor heads uphill. I notice a sliver of light up ahead. The farther I go, the more light illuminates my vision. I don't hear the roar of the water anymore, so I take one second to look behind me. All three males are running on their own power. I don't see a wall of water behind them. That's all I need to know. Light is definitely coming from somewhere up ahead, and I'm bearing in that direction. We wind up in a cavern maybe 30 feet in circumference. The ceiling is domed, and it has two long, jagged cracks in the top. That's where the light is filtering through. This is the end of the line. If the water creeps up this high, there's no way out. We certainly can't squeeze through the cracks, which are maybe two inches across at their widest. Then I see a hole in the wall about six feet above me. There is no doubt in my mind it's not a natural phenomenon. It looks like a seven-foot-tall arched doorway, and there definitely seems to be light streaming in from that direction. I look around at our motley crew. Deb is on his knees on the dusty stone floor. His hands are on his thighs, his back bowed, and his chest is heaving with exertion as he gasps for breath. Thantos is lying on his back, panting, eyes open. The dock is leaning against a wall, also breathing heavily. They're all nude and wet. My black t-shirt is hanging to mid-thigh, ripped at the shoulder. I'm gasping and notice it's so cold I can see my breath. I listen, ignoring the panting to see if I can hear the water coming. I hear nothing. But that doesn't mean fingers of water aren't surging along the route we just took, seeking higher ground just like we did. Then I hear screaming. I wonder if it's a hallucination or a trick the water's playing on me. But I notice the male's heads all swivel toward the archway in the wall, which is where I thought the noise was coming from. The sound mobilizes all of us. The males get to their feet. I clench my teeth and straighten my spine, attempting to get ready for the next episode in this grueling ordeal. Guys, even though I whispered, the acoustics are perfect here, and my voice sounds almost loud. None of us even have a weapon. And now I hear it. The unmistakable sound of the water approaching. It's not as loud as when the water was 20 feet high, but it's definitely water, and there's no doubt it's moving fast. Chapter 9 Davalos I stride over and brace one leg behind me, bending the other knee to effectively make a step. Thentos, use my leg to climb through that archway. He scrambles up the sheer wall. What do you see? It's a long corridor, definitely not a natural formation. Help Tawny up. I motion for her. She steps on my bent leg, and he lifts her to safety. Doc? I pat my thigh and motion for him. He joins the others above me. I look up to see both the males lying on their stomachs, arms outstretched to assist me. With their help, I scramble up the wall and under the arch, just in time to see water raging into the cavern below. Hurry, I shout. We all run up the corridor at top speed. I'm happy to note this hallway is at a steep incline. Every step higher gets us farther from the water's reach. Everyone has stopped fifty fiertos ahead. 
At first, I assume we've reached the end of the line. No more excavated rooms. No place left to run. But they're at the opening of another arched doorway. The males go through, but Tawny stands paralyzed. She's looking back at me, the whites of her eyes showing all around her irises. She's shaking her head no as her breath puffs out in clouds. When I get close to her, she grabs me tightly and shelters under my arm. I understand perfectly. In front of her is a long row of cells opening onto our walkway, just like our little home away from home on Emerus. The walls are dusty beige rock instead of dark gray stone, but a cell block is a cell block. I'm certain we both thought our days in captivity were over. It's okay, Sprout. I kiss her brown curls, which are crusted with ice. Pulling her in front of me, I place my hands on her shoulders, then bend to put my face in front of hers. Look at me, Tawny. She struggles to open her lids, then must find reassurance in my gaze because her tension loosens. I swear to you, I would do everything in my power to keep you safe. Everything. She nods and her shoulders relax a bit more. The sound of other voices filters into my consciousness, and I realize I need to pay attention to our surroundings to keep Tawny safe. Moving down the corridor, I see Thantos and the doctor talking to someone inside one of the cells. Tawny keeps her hand around my waist, not wanting to move from my side. We arrive at the last cell on the hallway, maybe twice as big as the one we were imprisoned in on Emerus. There are three females cowering there. They look like Tawny's species. I remember that their race thinks my race looks like devils. I'm certain they won't believe we mean no harm. They must be scared to death. Tawny, try to calm them. We'll look for the keys. Tawny. The males head back to rummage through the cells we just passed, and I step to the bars. My muscles are screaming from all the exertion. I'm freezing. Even my t-shirt is frozen stiff. I almost drown about ten times in the last ten minutes, and the panic of being deep inside the cell block clenches my stomach like a tight fist. I push all that into the recesses of my mind as I focus on these women. Can you understand me? I wonder if they've been implanted with the subdural translators most people in the galaxy wear. Yes, they say, nodding their heads. Speak English? They nod again, relief blooming on their faces. Two of them cast their eyes down the hall, perhaps in the unspoken question of who are these scary as hell red and black devils. We come in peace. I can't believe I just said that. The guys are searching for keys. I take a look at the lock. The cell door is not only secured with what looks like an ancient metal lock and key system, but there's a thick chain wrapped around the door and bars, secured with a more modern mechanism. Do you know where the keys are kept? Two of the girls point to a door positioned directly behind my back. My heart starts beating like a jackhammer as I realize we have no guns and there might be a garrison of well-armed soldiers on the other side of the tall, thick metal door. Where are the guards? I whisper, terror tightening every muscle in my body. I don't think they stayed on this planet. One of the girls, a gorgeous redhead, points to a stack of provisions in the corner. It looks like there are enough nutrition bars and water to last three women a month. They provide food and water and then leave? We've only been here ten days, a fortish blonde says. We haven't seen them since they dropped us off. We have translators, she points behind her left ear. From what we piece together... They were going to find the highest bidders and come back and get us. I'm Carrie. I'm Tawny. The males and I will do everything in our power to rescue you. I don't know what happened to the planet, but the river out there is flowing backward, which means water will be filling the cell block in minutes. I hope they find the key, the redhead says, her voice tense. As an afterthought, she adds, I'm Bryn. Tell them to hurry.
the short brunette practically orders. Her name is Lexa, Carrie says. Guys, I call down the hall. They join me, Dev putting his arm protectively around my waist. The women don't think there are guards on the planet. I point to the stack of supplies. They dropped the women here with food and water, then left to find buyers. We think they may keep the keys through there. I point to the doorway. They barge through the doorway. Every cell in my body is on red alert, waiting to hear the sounds of a scuffle or laser fire. But all I hear is their muffled voices as they rummage for a key, perhaps also searching for a way out. When I glance back into the cell, I notice a small pile of clothing near the food. Are there pants in there? Please, dear Lord. I hope there's something I can wear. It couldn't be above freezing. My teeth are chattering. Carrie rummages through the pile and tosses me a tunic and some pants made of soft leather that match what all the females in the cell are wearing. I tug them on, pull the drawstring at the waist, and hope they'll keep me a bit warmer. How'd you find us? Lexa asks. We were on the planet for a little R&R. &R. There was a lovely pool at the base of a huge double waterfall. I've watched enough end-of-the-world movies to wonder if somehow the planet's poles reversed. The waterfall quit flowing. That's when we initially heard you screaming for help. A minute after, the river started running backward and a mountain of water rushed at us. We found a system of caves behind the falls and kept racing to higher ground until we found you. I assume we're at the top of the mountain. We came in through that door. Carrie points to the one directly behind me, then passes a few nutrition bars to me. Thanks. I unwrap a bar and eat it in three huge bites. It's amazing how terror and almost dying can spark my appetite, I say before I'm done chewing the first bar, even as I'm unwrapping the second one. You're human? What are you doing with those guys? Lexa asks, her tone judgmental. They saved my life, I tell her, still chewing. They're busy saving yours. I spear with a quelling look. Don't judge a book. The males barge back through the door. I think we found the key to the door, the doc says, holding up a rusty metal key. Sure enough, it opens the old mechanism on the door fairly easily, considering there's a lot of rust on both the key and the lock. The door is still firmly connected to the adjoining bars by about five wraps of a sturdy metal chain and space-age lock. After a few moments of inspecting that lock, the males shake their heads. Carrie shoves nutrition bars at the males when the discussion stops. Okay, let's brainstorm, I say. Let's all try our comms. Dev holds up an empty wrist. Who knows which near-death experience caused that? Thantos, the doc, and I only attempt to hail the ship a few times before we realize it's a fool's errand. Seems like even high-tech waterproofing can't protect from a flood of biblical proportions. The ship knows our exact coordinates, I say. They knew we were hiking to the waterfall. Shouldn't they come looking for us as soon as they see what's going on down here? As soon as we get our hands on a laser, we should be able to slice through these bars like butter. You're right, Danto says. We can't get them out without lasers. He shakes his head frowning. We can't count on rescue. If they come for us, they'll be looking at the bottom of this mountain. Not 100 fiertos up in a hidden dungeon. Dev hurriedly retraces his steps back down the hallway from which we entered. The water is still rising in the room right outside of here. It will be spilling down this corridor in minimas. We're almost out of time, Danto says as he scratches his jaw. The women said it wasn't a long walk from the entrance to these cells. I tell him in a rush. They came in through that door. I point to the door behind me where they found the key. I'll find the way out and run to the meeting place, Thanto says decisively. After I connect with the ship, we'll come back to get you all. Thantos leaves at a run, the door clanging shut behind him. From what Dev said, the women in that cell don't have an hour. Maybe not even 30 minutes. I was so busy talking to Dev on the way from the drop-off point. 
I didn't pay much attention to how much terrain we covered to get to the waterfall, but I think it was over half an hour. I'm doing the math in my head, calculating how long it will take Thantos to find the ship if everything goes perfectly. I don't think we'll get rescued before the water reaches that cell. I explore beyond the door Thantos just exited through. As I look one more time for the key, I search down every hallway, making certain I know the path to freedom when it's time to make a run for it. I find a thick metal door that leads outside. It opens to what used to be an idyllic scene. We're on the mountaintop, looking down over rolling hills and valleys. It's so cold out here, much of the formerly green foliage is already turned limp and brown. I sniff in quickly through my nose to get a sense of the temperature. I read a book once that said if it was below zero, the hair on your nostrils will freeze. I take a deep breath in through my nose, then squeeze my nostrils together with my fingers. I actually hear a crunch. That's a big yep. Definitely below zero. When I'm back outside their cell, I ask Carrie, any clothes big enough for either of the guys? She sorts through the pile and finds two large leather tunics. A moment later, I pull Dev, the tunic stretched taut, across his broad shoulders down the corridor. We look down at the cavern, which is still filling with dark, swirling water. Everything's so cold. Any chance the water will freeze solid before it hits the cell block? He shakes his head. Moving water takes longer to freeze, Tawny. We can't count on that. Then we're running out of time, Dev. If Thantos doesn't come back with a laser, we can't stay here to drown. He looks sad. His eyes involuntarily glance at the ceiling as he appears deep in thought. Then he shakes his head. You're right. I can't risk you. You'll have to leave when the water hits this ledge. Davalos. I find three metal bars that completely rusted away from their moorings in one of the other cells. Seneca and I use ours to dig at the stone at the base of the bars in the female's cage. The vertical bars are firmly lodged in a mixture that looks like stone that was liquefied and then solidified around each bar. But this prison was built long ago. By the look of it, hundreds of years. It's crumbly in places. If Seneca and I put our strength into it, we can chip away where the bars meet the mixture. Perhaps we can pry the bars out from where they're fastened. Tani is using her bars of fulcrum, repeatedly attempting to dislodge the horizontal bar located about a fierto off the floor. A few minimas into the task, Tani succeeds in popping off the bottom bar that the vertical bars attach to. I immediately feel more give in the bar I'm working on, so I redouble my efforts. Tani runs down the hall to check on the rising water in the cavern. She returns and gives me a quick shake of her head, her lips tight. What's going on? the short brunette asks. How bad is it? Tani came back with an extra metal bar she found on the floor and throws it into the cell. The determined-looking blonde grabs it and attacks the crumbling rock on the other side of the bar I'm working on. She's jamming it into the floor with so much force, she grunts with every heave. I don't think we have more than five minutes, Tani tells them, as she tries to reach around Seneca and me to help. When she realizes she can't get leverage, she tosses her bar inside the cell, and the short brunette vigorously embraces her task. Rock the bar back and forth, I command with all of us working together. I feel more play in the metal, the rocky hold giving way. My bar seems to have more wiggle room than Seneca's. Seneca, give up on yours. Help me with mine. I take a moment to appraise each of the females, wondering if their hips will fit through the hole we're making if we dislodge only one vertical bar. Dev! Tani's voice is panicked. I follow her gaze and see fingers of water crawling up the hallway in our direction. Although the water at the points of the little rivulets turns frosty and almost freezes for a modicum, the moving water behind it liquefies it immediately, and it keeps marching toward us. Drack! I do mental calculations in my head. I think we can keep working until the water gets here. 
We can wade out if we need to, but you need to go, Tani. There's no reason for you to stay. Run to the meeting place. Wait for the ship to pick you up. Her answer is to reach between Seneca and me, grab the bar we're frantically working on, and heave it back and forth with all her might. Tawny, go! That's an order! The thought of her drowning makes my chest ache. She doesn't stop what she's doing, not even for an instant. If anything, she's now working harder to dislodge the bar from its moorings. The water laps at my bare feet. I hear one of the females curse and another start praying to her god. Ladies, we need to get in sync, Tawny barks. Forward, back, forward, back, Tawny chants. The females all take up the chant, keeping a good cadence as the four women push the bar back and forth in unison. Between their efforts and ours, the bar moves a scintilla further. The freezing water is up to our ankles. We don't have much time. Tawny, please go! I can't, Dev. We're close. I know we can get them out. We keep working. The water keeps rising. I haven't been able to feel my fingers on the cold bar for long minimas. The fingers and lips of the females with pale skin are turning blue. I can only work by feel now. The dirty water has completely obscured my view of the floor. And then the bar slips loose, just like that. Females, slide through the opening. Hurry! The water is to our knees. The hole is about one fierto wide and two fiertos tall. The females have to crawl down under the water and shimmy through. They'll all be drenched completely, then have to run back to the pickup site in the frigid air. Better than drowning. Two of the women are through the hole and outside the cell when the redhead panics. I can't swim! Her voice is high and thin. She's shaking. Someone convince her to crawl through that hole. A minimum of pain now or death for eternity. I put the sound of fierce command into my voice. We have no time for this. Now, female, I order her, hating to use the voice I used on Tawny many times in the dungeon. I need to put her worries in the back of her mind and simply have her follow my orders. She hesitantly comes forward, dives under the murky water and pops up inses from me. As soon as we're all on the same side of the bars, I yell, Run! Tani explored here earlier. We'll all follow her as she leads us down several hallways to safety. We get outside and the cold steals my breath away. It's blowing snow. We're all soaking wet and poorly dressed. The valley looks completely different than when we arrived only a few auras ago. It's a harsh winter landscape instead of a tropical paradise. Tani's in the lead. I bring up the rear, making certain we leave no stragglers. The female's hair is white, caked with ice particles. None of us have shoes. It's snowing heavier even in the few minimals we've been outside. I see bloody footprints in the snow ahead of me. We're all walking on broken stalks of foliage and bushes, also sharp rocks. None of us can feel our feet. It will be a miracle if all six of us make it to the ship alive. And then I see it. The tranquility has made it through the trees and is hovering above the now frozen pool of water. It's clearly visible even in this driving snowstorm. Maneuvering closer, she sets her ramp down less than 100 fiertos away. Thantos, Sextus, and Griff hurry to meet us. They each grab a female and help them onto the ship. After another trip, we've all been helped aboard. A few minimas later, everyone on the vessel but Marcus, the pilot, is crammed into the kitchen. All those who are rescued are covered in blankets. Tea is brewing on the stove, and the engines are thrumming. As we enter hyperspace, I say with conviction, I never want to visit paradise again. Chapter 10 Tawny Thantos, Young Destin, and Sextus, the hunter, all got back aboard the Tranquility before the temperature plummeted the last 20 or 30 degrees. They weren't as severely affected as the six of us escapees. We're all huddled on chairs in the dining room, naked under thick blankets, 
clutching mugs of steaming herbal tea. We all suffered serious hypothermia, Seneca tells us. We're going to prepare a room for the three of you females. You'll all be bunking together. You'll have a lock on your door. Lex upheld. It will lock from the inside, he reassures. I'd like us all to stay together for another aura. I want to make sure everyone's blood pressure and vitals have returned to normal. I'm Lexa, the short brunette informs everyone. Will you be taking us back to Earth? We consider you women our responsibility, Thantos answers gently. We will do whatever it takes to return you to Earth, to keep you safe. Tonight, though, my primary worry as captain is to make sure you're healthy. There's time enough tomorrow to figure everything out. An ingratiating grin slashes across his face. Is he already flirting with these traumatized women? Shame. The cataclysm on paradise. Does anyone have an idea what just happened? I ask as I replay the experience in my head. I don't know anything for sure, but I have a hypothesis. The doc says as he refills all our mugs with steaming tea. Everything looks so ancient. I wonder if there was a civilization there that lived through a similar catastrophe eons ago. Maybe the survivors rebuilt and made those rooms and stairs high enough to escape the raging waters if the floods came again. At some point, the indigenous people died out completely. I think the cells might have been placed there by space travelers like the slavers who imprisoned you three females. That's just my wild guess, though. Everyone discusses his theory. Others throw out guesses of their own. I crawl onto Devi's lap, my legs across his, my hip nestled against his waist, my head on his blanketed chest. I don't really need a scientific explanation of what I just endured on Paradise. All I know is Devi and I almost lost each other a hundred times today. It's so reassuring to hear the steady beat of his heart. I must have fallen asleep because I wake up as I'm being carried to our room. I had wanted a chance to get to know the other women, but I was too tired. Debbie shuts the door behind us and sets me down. Seneca said it won't harm us to take a shower now that our internal temperatures are back to normal. Want a quick shower or just drift back to sleep? Definitely a shower. I want to wash every iota of paradise off my body. Back in a minute, I say as I wander in and turn on the water. I can't believe after all the water I've swum in, been buffeted around by, and drunk that I'd want a shower. But God knows what kind of filth and bacteria I've bathed in today. The doc said he gave us shots to protect against disease or parasites, he calls to me, then looks shocked as I emerge from the shower and grab a towel. His head snaps back in surprise. I thought you were joking about the minima. I can be quick, I call over my shoulder as I crawl into bed. I'm asleep before he comes out of the bathroom. Davalos I'm lying next to Tawny, arm bent at the elbow, head in hand. I've been memorizing and cataloging her exquisite face for long minimus. I could fall asleep immediately if I just put my head on the pillow. But I want to take this moment to drink everything in. I notice a small scratch on her face, a thick lip, some deeper gouges on her shoulder. She's still the most beautiful thing I've ever laid eyes on. I want to kiss the spots that mark the places she took the pain, but I don't want to risk waking her. It feels like anums ago that I planned to jump off a cliff to kill myself in a misguided attempt to protect her. The fact that we're both here, alive, in a safe, warm bed, is a miracle. My mind replays the entire ordeal, stopping at every point I could have lost her. My throat constricts at the thought. I'm the luckiest male alive to be by her side. I think of all the times I told her to leave me behind, to run to safety without me. At each point, she refused, not wanting to separate from me. I don't care if people far smarter than myself identified that syndrome. Tani doesn't have it. She risked her life for me, several times. This couldn't be the result of some rare disorder. She truly cares about me. 
It was clear by the look on those three females' faces in the kitchen that they think people from Primus look ugly and fearsome. They all saw the ruined place where my manhood should be. But Tawny, my Tawny, didn't give a drack. She climbed onto my lap and showed me affection in front of them. Being around her people didn't stop her. My breath catches in my chest as I ask myself the big question. What would she have to do to prove her concern for me? What else could she possibly do? The answer? Nothing. There's nothing else she needs to do. Drack that syndrome. Drack anyone who wants to tell us we're not right for each other, including ourselves. I care for her, and she obviously cares for me. I lean down and kiss every scratch, every bruise. I'll tell her in the morning how fond I am of her. I'll show her. I'll do everything I can to make her life better than she ever dreamed. Tawny I'm awakened by Dev soft as a whisper kisses all over my face. My eyes flutter open, and I see those caramel brown eyes staring at me. With, I'm afraid to put a word to what I see. You have scratches, Sprout. Back on Primus, my mother used to kiss me and tell me it would heal me. If I could heal you with my kisses, I would, my beautiful earth female. There's the most poignant look on his face as his gaze bores into me. This male adores me, that's clear. My loins clench in desire. I turn into him and slide my arm around his neck. I've never considered myself beautiful or pretty or even nice looking. I think my stepfather saw to that. He never abused me, although I considered his disdain and derision abusive at the time. After three years in the emperor's clutches, I know the true meaning of abuse now, but my stepfather's words did their intended job. I didn't have the greatest self-esteem the day I was kidnapped to Emerus, and I certainly don't have much positive self-regard now, but I'd like to believe Devi's sweet words. I press the top of my head under his chin and whisper, Tell me more. He lifts my chin up with the pressure of one finger, so I'm looking into his eyes. You want me to tell you how beautiful you are. You were dashing through the caverns today. I was behind you. We were running for our lives. That wall of water could have swallowed us up and bashed us against the rocks in mere modicums. Do you know what thought slammed into my brain instead of worrying about my life? How lovely your ass and legs looked as you ran. Insane, huh? I used to lie next to you in the dungeon. I watched you when you were asleep, like I was doing just now, thinking what might happen between us if we were free, and if things were different. We are free, Dev. No one owns us. We can do whatever we want, go wherever we want. We have no one to answer to. I cup his cheek with my hand, and we hold each other's gaze for long moments. We know very well that planet was no paradise, Tawny. That place was hell. I hold no illusions that my cock will sprout back onto my body. No magic is going to happen. These last few nights proved what a sensual female you are. I'll never be able to fulfill you like a complete male. I put a finger over his lips. Shh. Don't say it. You're everything I need. That's what the other night proved. Did I not shout loud enough when you played my body like a musical instrument? Shall we compose a symphony tonight? He blasts me with a devilish grin, and I laugh at that thought. Those severe markings on his face don't scare me anymore. They are so endearing. I lean over and kiss him. Soft kisses, just lip to lip. Then I slip my tongue into his warm mouth. My hands reach behind the sleek skin of his head pressing him closer to me. Our tongues collide wildly, and he moans from deep in the back of his throat. Slinging my leg over his muscular hips, I pull myself closer, my dripping core rubbing against his abdomen. He's not moaning anymore. It's a growl, masculine and possessive. He rolls on top of me and pulls my hands above my head, forcing them into the mattress with one hand. Leave your hands right there, Tawny. Don't move them. 
I'm going to make you come so hard, you'll wake our neighbors with your screams of ecstasy. Can you do that? Keep your hands right there? Can I let you pleasure me till I explode? Yes, Dev. I think I can do that. I smile at him for a short moment before he moves into action, like a supple feline pouncing on prey. His head bends to my breast. His warm breath fans one nipple while his hand plucks the other. An electric jolt sparks to the pit of my stomach. I suck air in through my teeth, then... So good. His tongue flips the tip. Just that action makes my hips swivel under him, reaching for pressure against his stomach. He repositions his body, sliding a knee between my legs so I can rub myself against him. When I do that, I realize I'm so wet, I'm painting him with my juices. Then my attention turns to his fingers and tongue. I look down to see the smooth skin of the top of his head bobbing up and down as he licks my nipple. The sight is arousing. His red skin is erotic. I'm dying to touch him, to feel his flesh beneath my fingers, to make him feel good like I did the other night. But my hands stay obediently above my head where he placed them, as if reading my mind. Good girl, he tells me. I'm going to learn every inch of you. He pauses for effect, inside and out. My clit flutters in response. I'm going to learn when to go slow. He licks first one nipple and then the other. He does this with excruciating languor, with the flat of his tongue as if he's a cat lapping milk. He trails the tip of his tongue from one nipple, down the mound, through the valley and up the other breast, then gives that one equal attention. Every move is slow, leisurely, deliberate, and delicious. I'm going to learn when to go fast. He nips the tip of my nipple with the flat of his teeth in quick bursts. I hear his teeth clap together in rapid succession. Dear Lord, a bolt of sexual lightning races from my nipple to my clit. I press harder against his knee. I'm going to learn when to tease. He touches the tip of each brown peak gently with the pad of his finger, slow, back and forth. I'm burning from these tender touches. And when to give you what you need. He captures a nipple in each hand, then squeezes, then plucks. Dev! Hot sparks of liquid desire fly through my body. My stomach clenches in need. So does my core. Placing his lips close to my ear, he breathes with almost no sound. What do you need, Tawny? Tell me what you need. I need you. I writhe against him, desperate for friction. More. Tell me more. His tongue snakes into the shallow cavern of my ear, sparking shivers through every cell of my body. Need you to make me come. My head is spinning. I don't know if I'm powerless with my hands above my head, or powerful as I'm telling him what I want. I don't know anything other than we're here in this bed together, and I want his touch. I want his skin to cover as much of my body as it can. I want his fingers to touch me everywhere, inside and out. I realize I need to tell him that, and I do. He places his palms on my breasts, then slides slowly down my body. His tongue trails lingeringly from between my breasts to dip in my navel, to the top of my mound. He nips me there, playfully. Then the fun and games are over, and he nips harder while he presses my clip with the bone of his chin. My hips lift off the bed in shocked reaction. This? He does it again, only this time with a back-and-forth motion that earns him my gasping intake of breath and a hip thrust. He slides down an inch, placing his mouth over my clit. He sucks in. I moan. Simple cause and effect, only so much more. He lashes me with his tongue. Gentle flicks turn into hard presses with the flat surface. He trails his tongue to my dripping core, then presses in all the way until his lips touch my skin. I express one moaning gasp of appreciation before he leaves and places his tongue against my nub again. Dev! I'm loving this, but I feel empty. I want him back inside me. My arms are still obediently over my head, so I'll either have to lie here in desperation or use my words to tell him what I want. Fuck me, Dev.
Fill me up. And he does. A finger slips inside my slick channel and thrusts once, twice, three times, hard, until his knuckles press against me there. Then he pulls out and slides in two fingers, repeating his actions of a moment ago. I don't even realize the noise I'm making until I hear the otherworldly sound through my ears. It's the keening moan of desperate urgency. No words, just sound. He presses a third finger inside. This is it, the fullness I need, that stretching burn that tells a female she's being thoroughly taken by her male. Dev. His name is spoken on the outbreath like a prayer. He reaches up inside me and finds a spot that flips a switch from fully on to turbocharged. My jaw clamps shut. My lids slam closed. I turn my attention fully inside so I can bask in this feeling. My thighs start to quiver as every muscle in my body tightens in preparation for release. Touch me, Dev commands, allowing my arms to leave their obedient post above my head. I grip his shoulders, nails digging into his flesh without my awareness. His thrusts are deliberate, drawing my attention, slowing down the sexual excitement building in every cell of my body. Then he moves faster, even than before. This is the trigger for my orgasm to come hurtling through me as I quiver in delicious spasms. My core clasps around his fingers. The powerful clenching rolls in waves from toes to head and back to my core. My deep guttural moans reverberate off the walls of our small room. I'm in heaven. I'm in Dev's arms. I've dreamed of this moment, this connection. I finally have it. Mmm, come up. I pull him even with me on the pillows. Tell me again how beautiful I am, I command. I'm shameless. The orgasm decimated the barrier between us somehow. I can fully speak my mind. He pulls away, just far enough to hold my gaze in his. You're beautiful, Sprout. Body and soul. He flips me over and pulls me close enough so he can spoon me. He's never done this before. I always thought it was because it accentuated what was missing. It embarrassed him. Something must have broken through his barrier, too, because he's showing himself to me in a different light. I wiggle my tush against him as I pull his hand to my face and kiss the flat of his palm. My scent is all over him. It's intimate. I like it. And you, Dev? Now that we know you can find release, I want to give that to you. Like the other night, I explore every inch of his body. They say blind people's sense of smell and hearing become enhanced. I wonder if that's what happened to Dev. His appreciation of everything I do, everywhere I touch, seems amped up. My kisses command his full attention. My warm breath and tongue on his ear make him moan. Touching his nipples elicits quick, shallow pants. When first my hand and then my tongue explore his balls, he comes with a long, rolling explosion of release. Sweet Tawny, he tells me with a closed-lipped smile, as we lay together after both still panting with exertion. Miracle. What a miracle we survived, Emerus. That I finally believe you don't have that syndrome. I can let all your warm, caring feelings roll over me and begin to feel the broken places. And I can show you the emotions I've been keeping hidden. He pulls me closer and pets my hair. I love this feeling. I think I love him. But it's too soon. I'll take this one step at a time. He's right. It is a miracle. His emotions finally caught up with mine. Chapter 11 Tawny I wake up realizing all I had to eat was two bars since we left for paradise yesterday morning. I'm going to have to make up a different name for that freaking planet. We made up the name Paradise. It wasn't on the star charts. I think from here on out, I'm going to call it hell. I pull on a pair of huge work overalls I found in the dresser. With four women on board, our need for clothes will fast approach DEFCON 4, unless there's a storage bin of fancy panties somewhere in Thantos' hold. I wander to the kitchen and find Destin cooking Sumra for the three women. Good morning, I greet everyone. Destin offers me some tea, and I join the women at the table. 
We hardly introduced ourselves yesterday. I'm Tani, from Boston, by way of shithole planet Emerus. Carrie, the fortyish blonde with shoulder-length hair, smiles and nods. From L.A., by way of a different shithole planet. Lexa, from Philly, recently abducted. Went straight to the planet you rescued us from. She's short with brown hair that trails to where a bra strap would be if she had one. We all look at the redhead, waiting. Oh, um, Bryn. She smiles but doesn't give eye contact. It's hard not to stare at her. She's beautiful. Not just attractive or pretty, but movie star beautiful. She's the prettiest woman I've ever been in the same room with. Her lips are delicate pink and perfectly bow-shaped. Her striking green eyes complement her flaming red hair. She would turn heads anywhere, on any planet. Bryn's not much of a talker, Lexa announces. She's from Michigan and says she was 12 when she was abducted. What I don't get is that she says she doesn't even know how long ago that was. She does a skeptical mini eye roll. So how old are you now, Bryn? Lexa persists. I don't know. Bryn's smile faded long ago, and her discomfort is palpable. She's repeatedly wetting her lips and swallowing. We've all been through a lot. I interrupt the Inquisition. Bryn, you can tell us later, if you want. I reflect on how much I had to endure over the last three years. If Bryn was abducted at age 12, she's probably been in captivity for at least a decade. Surely you at least know how long you've been away from Earth. Lexa is relentless. From what they said yesterday, they were in that cell for less than two weeks. Lexa went there straight from Earth. Perhaps she has no idea what terror might right this minute be replaying behind Bryn's eyes. Speaking of eyes, Bryn's are full of tears. I'll pull my seat closer and gently grab her hand. We can talk about this later. I spear Lexa with a shut-the-fuck-up look. What matters is you're safe now. Bryn gives me a tiny moment of eye contact, relief obvious on her face. Destin interrupts with a steaming bowl of Sumra and the intergalactic version of a spork for each of us. Do you need anything else? If not, I have work to do in the food hold. He wipes his palms nervously on his pants. I wonder if he's been in space a long time without much female companionship. Thanks so much, Destin. That was kind of you. We eat our breakfast as quietly as is possible when four people are slurping noodles into their faces with a spork. The silence is awkward. Carrie looks at Bran with concern. We've all been through a lot. I'm here to talk if you want. Me too, I add. It's just, yeah... I've been through a lot. I, I just don't know why he sold me. All right, Bryn's talking. That's a good sign. I think she'll do better if we just listen. I give Lexa a quelling look, hoping she doesn't start cross-examining her again. Sounds of slurping. Bryn has tears rolling down her face. Maybe we do need to ask her questions. Who? I prod gently. Things were really bad for a long time, like really, really bad. The floodgates have opened, and now her words are spilling out. I was hurt in a lot of ways. And then a male named Amrus bought me. It was hard at first. He was perfectionistic and demanding. He taught me exactly how to do everything he wanted. When I finally learned how to please him perfectly, the pain stopped. She strokes her neck then places her hand into her lap. I thought I was safe. I worked very hard to please my master, and then he tired of me. He called for my service less often and finally sent me to auction. What did I do wrong? Her hands clench at her sides as she rolls her eyes to mine in anguish. I just don't understand what I did to displease him. Am I reading too much into this? Or is she describing her life as a sex slave? Are you talking about pleasing him sexually? Leave it to Lexa to come right out and ask. Well, please him sexually, yes. Please him in every way. He taught me how to walk in a graceful manner, how to prepare his favorite foods, how to dress. 
He expected me to tolerate various positions. How not to make noise when he hurt me. How to satisfy his friends. He was very firm. She looks at us for the first time and must see the look of disgust and shock written on our faces. Firm, but fair, she amends in his defense. Always fair. He never punished me unless I deserved it. Her face relaxes, as if she just explained everything satisfactorily. I clamp my teeth together, partly because this is triggering me, partly because I'm dying to ask her questions, and I know that won't be helpful. What did you do to deserve it? Lexa asks. I'm beginning to really dislike her. She has no boundaries. Oh, when he was first training me, it was big things I hadn't learned properly, like the positions he wanted me to sit in or to transition from sitting to standing in a polished way. Later, I was much more skilled, so the punishments were less frequent. Usually they were... Her porcelain skin pinkens. When I made a noise when it was forbidden or when I wasn't eager to do a particular... Her gaze falls to her lap and it's clear to me she's having a flashback. I gently grasp her hand, hoping to bring her back to the present. Those days are over, sweetie. You'll never see him again. On the outside, I'm calm and supportive. Inside, though, my inner drill sergeant is commanding me not to play the movie inside my head of similar things the emperor did to me. Big fat tears are quietly rolling down her cheeks. I know. Her voice is dripping with anguish. I don't understand why he tired of me. I'll never see him again. Oh, crap. I thought Stockholm Syndrome was bullshit. It's real. I'm looking at it. She really did bond with her abuser. Carrie and I exchanged compassionate glances, shaking our heads a little. I have no idea how to deal with this. I was a few days away from getting my doctorate in psychology, and I think you have Stockholm Syndrome, Lexa announces. You both do. She looks at me. What are you talking about? I've said all of two words to this bitch. WTF? I heard two of the guys talking last night after you left. They said you were in prison for three years with that male you were cuddling with. Yes. What don't you understand about both imprisoned? Are you saying he never hurt you? Shit. How does she know? I want to shut down this line of questioning, but I don't know what to say. Are you saying that deformed devil never hurt you? She's relentless. I want to reach across the table and squeeze her throat until she turns blue. Instead, I'm watching a rolling loop of horrible flashbacks. Debbie hitting me, calling me names, using a whip. Shit. I thought I pushed all of that into the recesses of my mind. I know good and well that he never did that of his own free will. But there is another part of me that associates him with all that pain. How do I compartmentalize all that? My breath huffs out of me all at once as my shoulders slump. I close my eyes. But that doesn't stop the tears from spilling out from under my lids. Hot, anguished tears. I have to accept that although part of my mind understands he did all of that under the threat of death, there is another part of my mind that can't separate the act from the actor. There's a little girl inside me who fears that big red and black male. I didn't want to admit it, but sometimes when he moves his hands in a certain way, or uses a specific tone of voice, or I catch him out of the corner of my eye in a particular light, sometimes I want to flinch. I push it down and move on with what I'm doing. But for a moment, my system is paralyzed in fear. It really doesn't matter what my rational mind thinks. What matters is that at times like that, my emotional mind is back in that dungeon with all the pain Devi inflicted. My Devi. Fuck. That bitch is right. I have Stockholm Syndrome. I'm frozen in my chair. I frankly don't give a shit about Bryn right now. My jaw is tight and my face is hot as I focus on me. I love death. I figured that out this morning. 
but it must be that fucking syndrome I keep insisting I don't have. Fuck you, Lexa, I say softly, with as much dignity as I can muster. I rise from my chair, back straight, quivering chin held high in false bravado, and exit the room. I can't even blame this on Lexa. Right now, this minute, I have to admit the truth to myself. Where to? Where to go? It's a small ship, and I can't go back to my room. Don't want to run into Dev. The cargo hold. It's quiet in there, except for the steady, reassuring drone of the engines. I like the smell of antiquity that permeates the room. There was a chaise lounge in the corner. I could move the figurines it was littered with and lie down and go to sleep. I can't think. I don't want to think right now. Davalos. I haven't slept that long since I was back on Primus. My muscles feel relaxed. So does my mind. It's like everything is slowed down and I have perfect clarity for the first time in ages. I've been trying to repress my feelings for Tawny for Anums. First, because we were captives in a dungeon, and any expression of concern for each other would have resulted in immediate punishment or death for both of us. Then, as soon as we were in the relative safety of the leaf on the wind, I realized she could never truly care for me. If she did, it would be the result of that syndrome. But I don't believe that anymore. I know she cares for me. What happened in this bed last night proves that. The look in her eyes proves that. I enter the shower on a cloud of excitement and hope. The first I've experienced in a long time. I've quit denying my feelings for her. I'm going to stop pushing her away. If there was anything positive to come out of yesterday, it proved that life is short. Today, I'm going to find the perfect time to tell her how deeply I care for her. The moment I enter the kitchen to grab some food, I know something is terribly wrong. The three females are there. None will give me eye contact. I have that feeling you get when you walk into a room where everyone is talking about you. The shortest one gives me an angry stare, then doesn't take her eyes from me, like a feral Bryn hound from back on Primus. Anyone know where Tawny is? I really don't give a drack about what's going on in here. I just want to find Tawny. They all shrug, one staring, eyes slit, the others avoiding my gaze altogether. Thanks. I stalk out of the room. Something's wrong. I need to find her. When she's not on the bridge, I head for the cargo area. It's the only other place I can think she might be. Tawny. I can't sleep. The chaise is uncomfortable. The smell of antiquity I thought I liked is actually musty and makes my nose itch. Besides, I'm torn up inside. My stomach is clenching, and it has nothing to do with breakfast. I've been steadfast in my defense of Dev. It was my impassioned speech that saved his life on board the leaf on the wind. I've tried to convince everyone, including the handsome male himself, that I care for him because of his character and not out of some sick mutation of emotions. But I think Lexa, that bitch, was right. Maybe her words just helped me acknowledge the truth. I can't look at him without remembering the abuse administered by his hands. It's in my brain, on some deep level. Those beautiful hands. Those hands that delivered such ecstasy to me last night. The palm that I kissed with the deepest, warmest feeling of love about ten hours ago. Yeah, those hands. They should never touch me again. Anguished tears are rolling down my face right now. But I know for certain I need to end this misguided fascination flowing between us. The three women are all rooming together. They told me at breakfast the cabin's got two bunk beds. I'll be the fourth. It couldn't take too long for us to return to Earth. It won't matter if we're all squashed in there together. The way Lexa was acting... There might be more room in there soon, after I kill the bitch. I stand up and re-roll my humongous black pant legs. I smooth my palms on my thighs as I try to decide how to inform Davalos. That's what I'm going to call him from now on. 
No nicknames. No terms of endearment. Just cordial conversation with a former lover who's now no more than an acquaintance. Great timing. When I hear the door open, I know as sure as I'm breathing that it's Davalos looking for me. Chapter 12 Davalos The room is so cluttered and disorganized, you think it would take minimus to find her, but my eyes are immediately drawn to her. She's standing in a corner near the reclining couch. Her eyes skitter from mine to look down at the floor. Whatever is going on is bad. All my previous excitement sinks heavily to my stomach. Tawny, what's wrong? Do those females say something to you? Hurt your feelings? I know before she answers, this isn't the case. If someone had been mean to her, she'd be running into my arms right now, not avoiding my gaze. She bites her bottom lip, still backed against the wall. Come, sit. I approach the couch and pat it. My stomach is in a tight ball. She looks up at me, her eyes brimming with tears, and shakes her head. She's not going to sit. I don't know what happened. I don't know why she's going to do this, but I definitely know what she's going to do. Dev. Davalos. She looks up at me, biting her top lip now. There's a long pause. I'll give her time. I can almost hear the compartments in my head. The newly opened ones labeled hope, happiness, optimism, and love. Shuddering close with stark finality. You were right. The others were right. I do have Stockholm Syndrome. I have to give her credit. She keeps her gaze on me, even though by the looks of it, this is as hard for her to say as it is for me to hear. I thought... I really thought that we could be good together. I wasn't toying with you wasn't playing games, but I realized that every time you move fast or use a certain tone of voice or touch me in a certain way, I'm going to be transported back to the things you did to me on Emerus. There's always going to be a part of me that cringes when you touch me, even though the rest of me loves you. Oh my God. Is she really telling me she loves me at the same moment, she's informing me she doesn't want to be with me anymore. I've known for decades the universe was not fair, but this is downright cruel. I think it's best that I move into the room with the other women. Give me five minutes to gather my two pieces of clothing and I'll be on my way. We're going to speak to Thantos about returning us to Earth. I'll stay out of your sight as much as possible until we get there. She reaches out to pat my arm, but I snatch it away. I don't wish to hurt her, but her touch right now would be too much to bear. My jaw is tightly clenched. I can't let her see that I'm cracking apart inside. Until yesterday, I thought of myself as stone. I need to turn to stone again. I couldn't stay in that room, Tawny. My voice sounds distant to my own ears. It's yours. I'll see if Thantos will let me stay with him. I understand. Why did I say that? I don't understand at all. She reaches out to touch me again, but pulls her arm back as if it was burned. She opens her mouth to say something, but snaps it closed. Conversation over. What else is there to say? I deluded myself to think this could ever work. She's beautiful. I look like an ugly devil to her. Her body is perfect. Mine is ruined. She has a life to return to. I have none. I'll be cleared out of your room in one minima. I'll eat in my quarters. Don't worry about running into me. Talk to the other females. Make friends with them. You deserve nothing but happiness. I leave and shut the door behind me faster than I thought possible. Tani. I collapse onto the couch and hang my head in my hands as soon as I hear the metal door close behind Davalos. I'm shaking, especially my hands. I've had a hard life, but I believe that was the most difficult thing I've ever done. Crap! I know my feelings for him are an illusion, but they sure feel real right now. I know what I need to do. 
I need to switch gears and go straight into action mode. Stay busy. It's a great coping mechanism. I was denied that during my years on Emrys. Not much to do in a dungeon. But I can keep my mind and fingers busy right here in this room. I'm going to find Thantos and see if we can go back to Earth as quickly as possible. Then I'm going to work my ass off cataloging some of the crap in this hold. Davalos. Luckily, I find Thentos in his cabin. I didn't relish having this conversation in front of all the males on the bridge. So now you don't think she has this syndrome, but she's decided she does. Do I understand this correctly? He asks. Yes, I guess you could put it that way. Of course you can stay in here with me, cuz. No problem. Can't you convince her she's wrong? Be nicer to her. Not raise your voice. Not scare her. I don't think she's wrong, Thantos. How can she possibly look at me and not be reminded of the most horrible animals of her life? She's right. I was stupid to think it could ever be different. Are you reminded of the most horrible animals of your life when you look at her? He cocks his head in that annoying manner he has when he's making a perfectly intelligent point. Don't you have work to do on the bridge? Like plot a course to Earth? I just want to have a moment alone. I'll find Tani and have her give me the correct coordinates. What are you going to do? Go to the gymnasium and run on that machine until I drop. Great idea. Tani. I sit still for about five minutes, then start organizing like objects with each other. Statues with statues, jewelry with jewelry, until I'm certain I've waited long enough to avoid seeing Davalos in the hallways. I walk directly to the bridge, then wait a moment, my knuckles at the door. What exactly is the protocol anyway? While I'm waiting, Marcus, the pilot, almost barrels into me on his way inside. Need something, Miss Tawny? We've never actually said more than two words to each other. Can I just enter? Do I knock? Need permission? He indicates the palm reader by the side of the door. You can't enter without permission. Promise me you're not here to commandeer this vessel. I make the brownie three-finger salute, which makes him look vaguely unsettled. Yes, I add quickly. Yes, you're going to hijack this vessel? Or yes, you promise not to do so? He asks with a straight face, then laughs and claps me on the back a bit too hard. He slaps his hand on the palm plate and then makes quite a show of allowing me to precede him into the room. Earthers don't joke? He asks with surprise. Um, this Earther didn't expect to hear one from you. He gives a warm smile. If things were different, I'd stay on this pirate ship. Tawny, Thantos greets me. I was just going to calm you and ask you to meet me here. Tell me your Earth's coordinates and I'll chart a course. What? Your Earth's coordinates? Is that not translating well? You know, how we can pilot our ship back to your home planet. I grimace and narrow my eyes in confusion, then tilt my head toward him in question. How would I know my planet's coordinates? Were you in special school as a child? He cocks his head. I don't think he's mocking me. He's asking in all seriousness. Every school child learns their planet's coordinates. How else could you find your way home if you're kidnapped? He looks gobsmacked. Thentos, I... I clear my throat and start again. My people don't have interstellar flight. We haven't mapped the galaxy in such a way that we'd even have coordinates. He nods his head slowly, then answers deliberately, as if I'm going to have trouble following this conversation. I can't take you somewhere if I don't have coordinates. He stops and corrects himself, as if that word was too big. Directions. Earth. Earth. Certainly you've heard of it. He enters something into his pad. The intergalactic database says there are 19 planets in charted space, called Earth by their natives. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Third planet from the sun. After checking his computer, he nods, looks up hopefully, and says, Seven of those. My very excellent mother just served us noodles. 
I say as I count on my fingers to make certain there are eight planets using the mnemonic device I learned in grade school. There are eight planets in our solar system. This time his fingers play on his pad much longer. Finally, I can't find any planets that meet those criteria. Try nine. There used to be nine, and then they reclassified one. Maybe you use different classifications. His fingers fly again, but he turns to me and shakes his head. You sure you don't have the coordinates? No. Maybe one of the other females? He raises his eyebrows. No, we are not taught that in school. I think for half a nanosecond that maybe if he showed me some star charts, then I shake my head and look down at my feet. A picture full of stars would just look like a sky full of stars. I couldn't even identify the Big Dipper from Earth when I was back home. So how did we all get abducted from Earth if no one knows where it is? Yeah, explain that, Mr. Smarty Pants. Some slavers go past the known star charts to find slaves. Easy pickings. And no one is coming to rescue you if the planet doesn't have interstellar flight. Until an hour ago, I'd had zero desire to return to Earth. I don't know why this news is making me feel like crying, but it is. Captain, you're being held by your ama. Do you wish to take it in your quarters? Marcus asks. Absolutely not, Thantos replies, touching his heart in mock grief. She's always on better behavior when there's an audience. A picture of what I assume is his mother flashes across one of the five-by-ten-foot window panels at the front of the bridge. This is my first opportunity to see a female of his species. She's colored in black and shades of red, with wildly different black and white markings on her face and body. I'm not certain what gives away her age, but there are some lines visible across her forehead. She has dangly earrings hanging from her lobes and is dressed in a colorful, kimono-like dress. T.T., I need to tell you that your Aunt Aurelia is quite ill. The doctors all agree her time is close. I know you're busy flying your crew all over the known universe looking for bargain trinkets, but... She looks at him directly for the first time. I wonder if you could come home. I know. She holds up her hands in a stop motion. It's the last thing you want to do, but I'm asking. First of all, she's my sister and I could use your support. Second, she kind of adopted you when you were born. You were the closest thing she had to a son after Devalos was stolen. Please. Absolutely, Alma. She looks shocked. She must have expected this would be a much harder sell. It's been a long time since I've seen you. I'd like to say goodbye to Aunt Aurelia. She was my favorite aunt. Well, my only aunt but we had a special bond. The males would probably love a stop on our home planet to see their families. He glances at the ceiling as if he's only now remembering. Oh, I have a present for you. You always bring me presents. It's a benefit of having a pirate for a son. I wonder if she had any idea what type of business her son was in. I guess she does. No, Alma, I mean really, really special. Like so special you'd never imagine it in a million animals. Like so special you will love me forever when I present it to you. His face looks really handsome as he beams at her. It's remarkable to watch their special bond. I do love you forever, T.T. I've missed you. When will you get here? She claps her hands excitedly like a toddler, waiting to open a present. She's adorable. I'll have to chart a two days, two and a half auras, Marcus interrupts. I've been busy while you've been gabbing. He looks mighty pleased with himself. It must have been a while since this crew touched down on their home planet. Oh, she says as if she only just thought of it. And who is this female by your side? Is this the present, T.T.? Are you bringing home a bride? Are you going to make me a grandmother? Does every mother in the galaxy want to be a grandmother? How funny. No, Amma. Sorry to break your heart. But you will be pleased to know we rescued this lovely female, as well as three others from certain death. Can they stay at our house for the duration of the visit? I wave at her with a smile. She waves back. My son, a hero. Of course. 
I'll make sure the guest rooms are prepared. She's beaming at him, the proud mother. It's like when I was little and watched programs where there was a loving family. I always thought it was a fantasy, made for TV. Only these two really seem to love each other. How interesting. It's like watching a science experiment. Love you, TT. Love you, Ama. See you in two days and two auras. Her picture flickers off. His face turns instantly sad. His shoulders droop. Dev's Alma is dying. After being imprisoned all those anims, he gets to come home for her funeral. It's tragic. He might get there in time to say goodbye. That has to be worth something, I say. I'll go inform him. He rises from his chair, then turns to me. Unless you'd like to. Do you think he'd take it better from you? Sly devil. Is he throwing us together on purpose? Won't work, Thentos. Thanks for trying, but pushing us together isn't going to help. Besides, I'm sure the last thing he wants is to see me right now. As he strides toward the door, he mutters, Don't be so sure. Loud enough for me to hear. Davalos. I walk from the washroom to the bedroom, drying myself. I'm still panting a little for my run. Thantos barges in, and I fight the urge to secure the towel around my hips. He knows my secret. I have nothing to hide. Something's wrong. I've only known the male for a few days, but when his face isn't smiling or hiding a smirk, there's definitely a problem. Have a seat, cuz. He sags onto the bed and indicates a small chair in the corner. My thoughts are flying. What could it be now? For Drax's sake, what terrible thing could be hurtling toward me now? After Emerus, paradise, almost being drowned, losing Tawny. I have no idea what tragedy might be coming next. Sorry, Dev. Your Alma. He stops and gives me a compassionate stare. She died? No, but her time is close. I'm charting a course for Primus. I haven't seen her for almost 90 anims. I felt like a grown male when I was taken, 20 anims old. But looking back, I was so young. I pined for my parents for a decade after I was stolen. I thought I'd put those feelings behind me, but I miss them still. We'll be there in two days, Dev. I don't think I told you your mother stays with us. We've provided round-the-clock care. You'll stay there and can have access to your Alma, day and night. I'm too numb to respond, but I'm still processing this information. You're going to be a big surprise for my Alma. You know how much she loves you. When she sees you, she'll be ecstatic. I hope we get you there in time to say your goodbyes. I heard somewhere that sometimes right before the end, people come to their senses. I'll pray for that. I look down at my hands in my lap, but all I see is a blur. I've kept my emotions at bay for such a long time. I have to give myself permission to feel. Then I rescind the offer. I don't want to feel. I don't want to have all this sorrow crash down on me. I don't want to deal with my mother's death. I don't want to deal with Tawny's rejection. I don't want to feel any of it. I want to climb on that machine and run again until my muscles scream. The females will have to wait to return to their earth? Don't worry about them, Dev. Just take care of yourself. It's okay to have emotions, you know. His warm brown stare is so compassionate. If I allow it to penetrate my defenses, this might be the thing that breaks me. Could I have the room alone for a moment? Certainly. He rises, walks to the door, then turns to me. I'll bring food at dinner time, and you will eat it, cuz. The door closes quietly behind him. Chapter 13 Davalos It's been a hard two days since Thentos delivered the news about my Alma. I tried joining him on the bridge a few times, attempting to learn how to navigate. My concentration was so poor, it was frustrating. I've mostly run, eaten, and slept. I found an old series of books I used to love, 
and when I can pay attention, I read on the handheld Thantos provided. I only leave the room to get to the running machine. I don't want to bump into Tawny. My cousin tells me she's been very helpful in the cargo area, organizing before she begins cataloging. I imagine all the women resent having to make this stopover on Primus. They must be anxious to go back to Earth. Oh well, it sounds like we won't be here long. Hey, Dev, Thantos calls as he barges into our room. We'll be docking in about an aura. I just wanted you to know. I nod. Anything I can do? Yeah, I think this is going to be hard on me. Seeing your Alma having her cry when she sees me, that's going to tear me up. Is there any way I can see my Alma first? Just her and me. I'll need some time alone. Then I'll have a reunion with everyone else. Great idea, Dev. I've kept your presence a secret. I'll introduce Alma to all the females. She'll be so busy with introductions and showing them to their rooms. I'll be able to sneak you in after that. I'll swear the females to secrecy until later. Call me when you're ready. I'll retrieve you and reveal the big surprise. Thanks. The females are going to stay at your house? Why not remain on the ship? All the males will be off the ship, seeing family and friends. Getting dragged after six months in space, he grins and winks. None of them want to babysit the females on board the ship. I really don't know what else to do with them. Ama doesn't mind. Yeah, but I do. His family home is big, if it's the same one they lived in when I left, but not big enough for me to avoid the females for a week. I'll just spend time with my Alma and keep out of sight like I've been doing. I'm sitting in my Alma's room, holding her frail hand. Thantos was true to his word. He snuck me in and left us alone. Alma has aged so much. It's hard to reconcile the vibrant, happy woman who was my mother with the one lying comatose on this bed. Her skin is wrinkled and paper thin. The flesh is sunken under her cheekbones. But gods, she's still my Alma. My love comes pouring back. So many memories of her. Teaching me how to read picture books before I ever went to school. Coming to my games. Soothing my broken heart when my first love fell for another male. She was so patient and kind. At least I had that. At least I had a loving Alma and sire as a child. That was a gift. Thantos informed me that she hasn't awakened since we charted a course for Primus. I have no expectations that she will, but I have to try. Ama. Ama. It's Dev. It's your Devalos. I've come home. I'm healthy. I'm alive. I realize that if she does wake up, my presence will be an enormous shock. How would it feel to see your son after almost nine decades? To have mourned him for so long and find him at your bedside? I can't imagine. Maybe it's best she stays in her blissful sleep, then slips peacefully to her death. Ama, I wanted to tell you what a good mother you were. How many times over the last difficult annums I refreshed myself with thoughts of you taking me to Minland Beach as a youngling. I know you hated to sit in the sun, but you did it for me. And I doubt you enjoyed attending my games, horse rack especially. Those meets were interminable, but I appreciate that you went. Her lids slowly open. Her eyes are roomy, but she's gazing directly at me. My stomach drops. I've dreamed of this for so many decades. Davalos? She has a faint smile on her face. Dev, is that you? Yes, Alma. I lean over and make sure she can still see me, then gently place my forehead to hers. Passing was so peaceful, she informs me. I thought it would be harder. I finally get to see my Dev. I've waited so long to be reunited. Where's your sire? She thinks she died and is seeing me on the other side. Of course she would. That makes more sense than her son coming back from the dead. 
I decide not to correct her. She looks so calm and peaceful. I think it might break her heart to realize she's still on Primus, and she's talking to her son, whose life has been torture for so many decades. You'll see Papa shortly. Right now you get to spend quality time with me. I smile. It's genuine. What a gift to be given an hour or a few days with her before she passes. It was hard after you were stolen, Dev. Very hard for your sire and me. We loved you so much. You were our light. Your sire and I went through hard times. We funneled our energy into something meaningful. We petitioned the High Tribunal to put more safeguards in place. To better protect the young of this planet. It's called the Davalos Law. I always thought you'd be proud. I'm stunned. Surprised Thantos hadn't told me. My parents were remarkable to channel their energy into being productive. They always did make me proud. I'm honored, Ama. Her eyes flicker closed and she falls asleep. Our conversation drained her. What a blessing to be able to speak with her one last time. Even if she doesn't wake again, this was a gift. It makes me happy to know they gave up on me at some point. Quit waiting for their son to come home. I'm not their son. Not the same boy who left. It's good they'll never know what I've become. I sit, holding her hand for a long time. Finally, noises drift up to me from downstairs. I hear my aunt distinctly asking, Where is my surprise, T.T.? How long are you going to make me wait? She's such a happy female, always laughing and joking. It makes sense she raised such an easygoing son. I take pity on him and use my calm to tell him I'm ready. He's here in a modicum, glad. I'm sure to get her off his back. He slips in the door, looking concerned. How'd it go, Dev? Must be hard to see her like this. She woke for a minima or two. She told me about the Davalos Law. She and Papa were amazing people. Yes, I'm glad you got to talk with her. She and your sire were my favorite relatives. Now you are. He puts his arm around me and smiles. And now you get to be the big surprise. You up for it? I guess. I encourage the Earth females to go to their rooms for some rest. I thought you'd want to do this without an audience. I lean my forehead against his in a sign of affection. Then, you're always thinking ahead. He calls to her from the top of the stairs. Okay, I've got your present. It's huge. Are you sitting down? Yes. Guess what it is. Blue Marasian silk. No, guess again. Our Larikian pup, registered. No, guess again. A handwritten copy of the Maris. That's an odd guess, but no. I'll give you a hint. It's something you fervently prayed for. We're standing outside the kitchen door now. She's very quiet. No guess, Alma? He chides. There's only one thing I've ever prayed for like that. Thantos a bear Maris. You shouldn't joke about it. What's that, Alma? You're going to make me cry, T.T. I still miss him. I miss Davalos every day. Now you've gone and spoiled my surprise. He pulls me through the doorway. My aunt still looks as young as she did 88 annums ago. I don't think she sees me. Her eyes are filled with tears. I stride over and sink to my knees at her feet, placing my head on her lap. You don't have to do that, she scolds. I'm not so angry at you that... She must look up, see Thantos, and realize that it's not his head in her lap. Her fingers begin to tremble. I hear a sharp intake of breath. With shaky hands, she lifts my head. Devi? Is that really you? Her voice is an odd whisper. She peers down to get a better look. Yes. I beam up at her, and we gaze at each other for long moments. She was my favorite relative, much younger than my mother. She had been the perfect aunt. She had no children of her own before I was stolen. She used to take me everywhere, 
play games with me, and take me for walks. I adored her, and she adored me. She touches my face like she's committing it to memory. And she's crying. Not little ladylike tears, but full-on messy weeping. Gods, Devi, we gave up on you. I'm so sorry. You're alive. Still think I ruined the surprise, Alma? I know what Thantos is doing. He's trying to lighten things, pull us back to the present. Make this a celebration instead of a dirge. You're a terrible son. She swats at him playfully and pulls him toward her. She stands up and maneuvers us all into a three-way hug. I love you both. Has he been good to you, Devi? I love him, but he can be such a callous ass sometimes. Don't worry, Valeria. He's been kinder than I deserve. You raised a good male. She peppers me with kisses, her eyes beaming. Eighty-eight anims of prayers paid off, she laughs. Eighty-eight anims of prayers, Thantos answers, and your son fulfills the request. He puts his hands up, arms bent at the elbows, and a wide smile on his face. Always impudent. Then her face straightens into all seriousness. Have you been upstairs? Did you see your ama? I tell her about our brief conversation. This elicits a smile and a nod. I planned a feast for tonight, wanting to impress the earth females and to welcome my TT home. Now we have something even better to celebrate. Let me show you to your room. Chapter 14 Tani. They have me sharing a room with beautiful Bren, as I call her in my mind. Makes sense. Put the two Stockholm Syndrome girls together. Suits me. I'd give my right arm not to have to bunk with bitchy Lexa. Bryn doesn't talk much, which gives me plenty of time to think. Just what I need. Not. I glance around the room, taking in the opulent appointments. If I were a princess... I think I decorate like this. The walls are pale yellow. The accents are mostly rich gold and cobalt blue. Seriously, the English royals probably live like this. The room is what, 20 by 20? Maybe bigger. I have no idea. There are two huge beds, probably king size. There's an attached bath that's probably larger than my apartment back on Earth. Let's just say no expense has been spared. I do the math and realize Lexa and Carrie are in a room, as is Dev, his mother Valeria and Thantos. This house definitely qualifies as a mansion. I hadn't seen Dev since two days ago when I told him we couldn't be together. I saw him today on the ramp exiting the ship and on the hover ride here. He sat in the front seat and kept his eyes straight ahead, which was great because it allowed me to stare at him the whole ride without him being aware. Of course, all the women noticed. Lexa managed to sneak in a few what-the-fuck-are-you-thinking stares along the way. I tried to pay attention to the scenery. The sky was blue, but the quality of light seemed discernibly different than on Earth. Maybe it's because of the two suns, one of which looked ruddy instead of yellow. The sunshine was just as bright as on Earth, but paler somehow. Viewing the landscape, it now makes perfect sense why Primians have the color they do. There must have been cataclysmic volcanic activity for eons on this planet. In places, there's a carpet of lush green grass that's peppered in almost craggy, black outcroppings of igneous rock. That, combined with the blood-red leaves on many trees and shrubs, bears truth to Darwin's theory of evolution. I can picture ancient Primians being perfectly camouflaged, as they stalk their prey amongst the dappled red and orange foliage against a backdrop of harsh black rock. You would think the stark blacks and vivid reds of the terrain would feel severe and foreboding, but by the time we arrived at Thantos's house, I found the colors more fascinating than alarming. The way the males on the ship talked about this planet, it sounded like the culture is much older than that on Earth. I expected towering buildings made of metal and glass. However, the city we hovercraft through reminded me of pictures I'd seen of quaint European towns. 
The architecture seemed old-fashioned in a modern way. The houses looked like small mansions made predominantly of stone. The majority of buildings looked stately and timeless. Mostly, though, the scenery was in the periphery of my mind because I was paying attention to what I could see of Dev, his handsome profile. His jaw was clenched so tightly I could see a muscle jumping the entire ride. My staring was so obvious he had to have felt it. I'm certainly not acting like a woman who wants nothing to do with him. In fact, right now, my core clenches just thinking about him. If I could, and if it wouldn't confuse the shit out of him, I sneak into his room and have sex with him tonight. Seeing him today just validates how much I want him, how attracted I am to him, and how empty I feel without him, which confirms just how fucked up I am. Valeria recommended we nap, Tani. She says she's going to provide us with pretty clothes for the party tonight. It's been a while since I've worn nice clothes, Bryn says wistfully. You still miss that guy? Amrus? Yes. He was so good to me. You know raping you and then casting you aside doesn't meet the standard definition of treating you well. Yes, it does, Tani. You've had first-hand experience of the definition of poor treatment. What Amrus did was far better than that. Better than horrific treatment does not qualify as good. You do understand that, right? She turns toward the wall, fluffs her pillow, and says no more. My body feels weird now that it's not on a spaceship, and I'm experiencing planetary gravity. I feel heavy. Every movement is a chore, and I'm tired. Somehow I feel Dev's presence more keenly than on the tranquility. Knowing he's under the same roof as me, only a few doors away, I can't sleep. I wish I could find his room and crawl under the covers with him. I let out a soft groan, knowing I'm just as fucked up as Bryn. I must have dozed off because before I know it, there's a rap at the door. Bryn says, Come in! And Valeria enters like a force of nature. I don't know if T.T. told you, but the business we own is dress design and manufacturing, as well as a few retail stores. I took a guess at your sizes and had some things delivered. With that, two young females enter, their arms laden with clothing. Valeria smooths the bedding and has the employees neatly lay the clothes on the beds, half on Bryn's, half on mine. She points to various piles. Casual, undergarments, and I thought this would look nice on you tonight. She holds a flowing kimono-like gown up under Bryn's chin. The blue and green silky swirls in the pattern bring out the green of her eyes and the red of her hair. She's going to look gorgeous in it. Thank you, Bryn says, caressing the satiny fabric. I've never had anything so fine. Valeria picks up a gown whirling with hot pinks and reds. I figure it will look hideous on me. On Earth, I always tended toward browns and beiges. When she holds it up to me, Brent's eyes widen as she says, Tani, that's going to look amazing! Valeria grins and nods emphatically. The young females return with an array of shoes. All are colorful, and best of all, they look comfortable. Evidently, this civilization gave up on torturous heels eons ago. Put anything you don't like or doesn't properly fit on that chair in the corner. She indicates a comfortable chair upholstered in rich gold tones. The party starts in an hour. I hope I gave you enough time to get ready. She turns to leave, then swivels to look at us again. I look forward to getting to know you. I'm sure you realize how thrilled I am to get my Debbie back. I might be a little preoccupied with him tonight. We nod our heads and she sweeps out of the room. My thoughts turn to Dev. Good Lord, that man has been through so much. To be reunited with his mom, only to have to say his goodbyes to her. I'm certain this ordeal isn't going to be easy for him. He's lucky to have his aunt and cousin as supports. They couldn't be nicer or more gracious. I hope he can put his worries behind him and enjoy the party. My throat tightens in a pang of guilt. Seeing me might make tonight more difficult. Maybe I shouldn't attend. Then I realize if I don't come downstairs, Valeria might march straight up to my room and drag me down there. She's a woman who's used to getting her way. 
An hour later, Bryn and I approached the grand staircase at the same time as Carrie and Lexa. These pretty dresses seem to have transformed us all. Looking at our demeanor, you'd think we were all princesses arriving at a ball. Our heads held high, our spines straight. No one mentioned it, but the males from the Tranquility are all here. They're all joking with Valeria as if they're old friends. Perhaps she entertains them every time the ship docks. Their heads all swivel toward our grand entrance. I don't think I'm imagining the impressed look on their faces as they watch us regally make our way down the steps. They've all upped their game as well. Most of them wore some variety of black cargo pants and t-shirts on the ship. Tonight they seem to be wearing variations on a theme of black leather. They all have on fairly tight leather pants, form-fitting, with knee-high black boots. Most have on leather suit-type jackets that sweep almost to their knees. Two of them are sleeveless, showing off their amazing muscles. The words hot as fuck float through my mind. Dear Lord, they all look supremely masculine and sexy as could be. The first thing I noticed before the men's fashion show was that Deb is nowhere to be found. Valeria ushers us into the formal living room as she announces, Deb's with his alma. I thought we could take a moment to get acquainted. Between the sumptuous furnishings of the large room, completed in jewel tones of amethyst, gold, and emerald, and the males who all look ten times hotter than they did on the Tranquility, I'm on sensory overload. Other than Sextus, the military male, who only has eyes for bitchy Lexa, and the doc, who's sneaking surreptitious peeks at Carrie, the other males are following Bryn's every move. Who can blame them? The woman is the perfect double threat, not only gorgeous, but sweet and down to earth. I'll have to come up with different words to describe things in space. Nothing is down to earth anymore. Natural. How about natural? Thantos isn't here either. Maybe he's with Davalos and his mother. It was obvious how close Thantos was to his aunt. So, when you leave here, you'll be taking the females back to their home planet. Earth, you said it was called. Is that in the Aris sector? I understand that hasn't been well charted, Valeria asks. Marcus, the pilot, scrubs his face with his palm. We have no idea where their planet is located. Valeria's look of surprise is nothing compared to my three Earth companions. I thought we were to be returned to Earth when you were done with your R&R &R on Primus. Lexa keeps her tone calm, but gives the term resting bitch face a new meaning. Do you know your planet's coordinates? Marcus asks eagerly. Tawny didn't. Earth's coordinates? How would we know that? Carrie asks. Isn't every school child taught that right after they learn their home address? Valeria's eyebrows raise in astonishment. They aren't capable of intergalactic flight, Marcus explains as if he's telling someone dogs can't converse in complete sentences. Oh, Valeria nods her head, a look of pity on her face. Carrie and Lexa ask all the same questions I did. Trying with our meager knowledge to explain where we're located, but in a few minutes, everyone in the room realizes the task is futile. For the first time since I've met her, the look on Lexa's face isn't angry. It's sad. I try not to stare, but her expression has morphed from anger to disbelief to sadness to something akin to agony. You're saying, she glares at Marcus, there's no way home? Her eyes are bright, but her jaw is firm and she's trying like hell not to let any tears spill out. Since Tani and I had this talk a few days ago, I've dedicated a bot to search every database we can find, looking for a scrap of information, a hint, an old children's tale. Nothing. Then how the fuck? She's shouting, but takes a long swallow, glances at Valeria in silent apology, and slowly starts again. How in the world? She pauses and takes a deep breath. Did all of us get abducted? Someone is finding us. Someone knows where Earth is. We were all kidnapped at different times from different places by different ships. It doesn't sound like our location is exactly a well-kept secret. She's screaming again, and her face is remarkably red. We're low-level pirates, 
we aren't privy to the information kept in the bowels of the cartel's computers, Marcus explains. They evidently found Earth to be a good source of free-breeding females. It appears they abduct you judiciously from various places at various times. Not enough to alert the Federation authorities and bring too much heat down upon themselves. They don't exactly publish that type of information on the intergalactic database. Sextus walks over, sits next to Lexa, and tries to put his arm around her for comfort. She gives him a look so quelling that he scoots his chair away. I have no idea why he'd be interested in a female who's as mean as a snake, but wooing that one isn't going to be easy. Then where are you going to go? Valeria asks. I glance around the room. Lexa looks like she was just given a death sentence. Carrie appears deep in thought, clearly parsing through this latest batch of information, trying to figure a way to land on her feet. Bryn appears so calm. I wonder if she's even tracking the conversation. What choices do we have? Carrie asks, immediately shifting into fact-finding mode. Thantos and Davalos choose this moment to make their entrance. Oh my god, Dev. I mean, Davalos has never looked this handsome. He's wearing form-fitting black leather pants, boots, and jacket. Of course he has to be wearing the sleeveless version. His muscular arms with their white and black tribal markings on full display. His jacket has tiny little leather pleats running from pec to shoulder, with little slashes of red the color of his skin peeking out of each line of stitching. It accentuates his red and black coloring. He's breathtakingly handsome. I've been giving that a great deal of thought. Thentos pulls up a straight-back chair and straddles it. Alma, would you allow the females to stay here for a while, until they get settled? Might we find them jobs in one of our clothing factories or retail shops? My family has many contacts. Perhaps one of our friends can offer a job that's more to your liking. Valeria nods. Interestingly, none of the women look excited about this prospect. That's so kind of you, Valeria. Carrie looks at the other woman. And Pentos. It's just that I couldn't help but notice on the drive through your town that there are no humanoids who look like us. Everyone has your colorful markings. To be frank, I'm not certain I'd fit in here. Be comfortable here. Promiums have known of interstellar flight for thousands of years, Carrie, Valeria explains. We openly accept all alien species onto our planet. All of you have been so kind, Carrie says. By her pinched face, she's still not comfortable with the idea of staying here. The Tranquility is a small phaeton class vessel. As we all know, there isn't a lot of extra room. I... He looks around the room, mouth open as he stops in mid-sentence. Alma, now seems a good time to serve us the dinner you've been slaving over. There's the Thentos I know. Full of life, a smirk on his face and obviously not wanting to broach whatever thought he has until after we've been fed well. Valeria stands up and motions us into the perfectly appointed dining room. Well, I haven't exactly been slaving, but I did come up with a very clever menu and asked my chef to cook it. I did, however, bake the anathem cake. Now, females, as I understand we hail from different cultures, if something doesn't please your palate, I'd be offended if you ate it in an effort to make me happy. Just enjoy the dishes that you like and push what you don't like to the back. I don't know if I ever met a woman as kind or gracious. Motioning each of us to a specific seat, she stands at the head of the long rectangular table. Davalos is to her right, Thantos to her left. Pointing at me, she gestures for me to sit next to Dev, Bryn next to Thantos, and then boy, girl, boy, girl, after that until she runs out of females. Oh, shit. Really? I'm going to be rubbing elbows with Dev all night. I wonder if she knows. Did Thantos give his mom a little heads up about our situation? If he did, she's doing a great job of acting oblivious. I'll show her. I'll show everyone. After three years of eating nutrition bars in a dungeon and a week eating little more than noodles, I'm going to focus on the meal. There are heavenly smells wafting in from the kitchen and a pretty young Promian female is serving the first course. I pace myself, 
but the food just keeps coming, with each plate more delicious than the last. Although my mouth would like to keep eating, my stomach is protesting the influx of anything other than the cake Valeria promised us. Anything and cake, Miss Valeria, young Destin says, having a foodgasm as he repeats the name of the upcoming treat. You make the best anything cake on all of Primus. Thanks, Destin. You flatter me. I realize I can't avoid Dav any longer. I've been uncannily aware of his body next to mine. Every time those bare, muscled arms reach across me to pass a dish, I have to clutch my silverware to keep from petting his skin. The feel of his thigh gently pressing mine, accidentally, I'm sure, makes me have to resist wiggling in my seat to calm my rising libido. I tried to surreptitiously catch a glance at his face during the soup course, only to see him openly observing me. Since then, I've tried to only converse with people on my right, so I don't have to look Deb's way at all. I think Thantos is well aware of the dynamic playing out on this side of the table, because he keeps asking me innocuous questions, like how I'm enjoying the e-boy plante, or is the Samwak Khan to my liking? It would be rude not to look at him while I'm responding, which puts Dev's face clearly in my peripheral vision. If I'm not mistaken, Thantos is enjoying this game immensely. You boys know I love you and enjoy these parties. I host whenever you're in town, but I'm sure it's no surprise that having my beloved nephew back is beyond thrilling. I've prepared Dev's favorite cake, and I so want us all to celebrate his homecoming. I look at Dev full on now. Everyone's doing it, so it would be rude not to. My stomach jumps in a lusty somersault. Sensuous pictures of our time together in our room on the ship bombard me. I clench my legs together to counteract my clit's blatant yearning. Its rhythmic pulse insistently demands my attention. I focus on his face and not the arms that seem to have morphed from underweight to fully muscled since our escape. With all the scrutiny directed his way, he's looking bashful. His chin sags toward his chest. Dev, can you give a speech? I'm so glad you're home. Valeria's hands are clasped in front of her chest. She's so happy, she's beaming. Dev's jaw turns to stone. His head dips lower at his aunt's innocent request. I'm certain she had no idea how hard the simple task would be for her nephew. He swallows several times, then stands. A quick glance at Valeria tells me she already regrets asking. Thank you all for being here. He swallows again, then looks directly at his aunt. Valeria, I sincerely thank you for your hospitality, for me and my ama. It's abundantly clear what good care you've given her. It seems as if starting with gratitude was a good choice. His hesitance is gone. And Thentos, the kindness you've shown since we met has been unceasing. Thank you. Now he slows. What can he say to the females who, because of me, all seem to avoid him like the plague? And all the males and females at this table, thank you for any and all kindnesses shown, he says in a quiet rush. Okay, that was tactful. And Tawny. Oh, shit. I didn't expect him to speak directly to me. I... His Adam's apple is bobbing quickly now. Thento saved us once. You saved me. You saved me a thousand times. I wouldn't have made it through those last few years without you. You saved my life. He practically collapses into his seat and stuffs a huge bite of cake into his mouth. I assume to keep anyone from asking more questions. There's applause, some of it polite, some of it heartfelt. He may not be crying, but I am. My heart is clenching. The words I love him are drumming through my head. Although I'd like to, I can't escape to my bedroom because I'm slightly dizzy from all the emotions swirling around me. Thanks, Dev. I rest my hand on his knee, keeping my eyes straight ahead. He stays busy chewing and without looking at me, Grasp my hand as if it's a lifeline. All around me, I can hear everyone saying how great the cake tastes. But I guess I'll go to my grave not knowing what anything cake tastes like, because it feels like sawdust in my mouth. Davalos
I know my aunt would never put me on the spot like that if she'd known how hard it would be on me. I feel like I've been forced through a meat grinder. I just want to be magically transported to my room. I've been through enough. I've been alone much of my life. Having all these people around, all these expectations on me, it's just too much. Pentos. Carrie tries to get everyone's attention. You kind of interrupted yourself when you were saying what our options are. Did you have other ideas for us besides staying on Primus? She looks a bit sheepish. She must know it sounds rude for them to turn down such a generous offer of help, getting resettled on such a nice planet. Everyone's quiet now, waiting for him to speak. The females must be hoping there's a better choice than staying here, going to work in a dress factory. I'm keenly interested in what he's going to suggest. If Tawny stays on promise, I'll probably take him up on his offer of a position on his ship. If she goes with him, I think I may stay here to create a completely new life for myself. The Tranquility is a small Phaeton-class ship. I thought of offering all you females the opportunity to stay on, just as you are now. I have ideas of how each of you can be helpful, to have a job. But the males had their own rooms before you arrived, and I've heard grumblings. I don't think the males bunking with each other is a long-term solution. I've also seen some of the males shown interest in certain females, as well as interest, perhaps, on the part of the females. I don't know. I've never been good at understanding women. He laughs. No one else does. So here's my thought. If you want to stay on Primus, my ama has made a generous offer to find you employment, reasonably priced lodging, and assist in settling here. If not, I'm willing to have you all stay on the Tranquility for a quarter annum. You can remain in your current quarters and do two things. One, you can explore any planets we touch down on. You might find one to your liking. If so, I will give you 10,000 credits out of my own purse to find lodging and tide you over until you find employment and settle in. The second choice is, he pauses, eyes firmly on his plate. If any of you choose to mate, either short or long term, with one of the males on this ship, you are welcome to remain in one cabin together. I've thought this through, and I want to warn you that any disturbance in our relationships, any fighting that might ensue because of masculine posturing, will not be tolerated. This offer will last for 90 days and 90 days only. Ama, you'll be happy to hear we'll return 90 days after we depart. At that time, any remaining unmated females will be expected to settle here on Primus. The room is silent. Even Lexa hasn't made a sound. Oh, he looks directly at Tawny. I have a different offer for you, Tawny. I want to offer you a job. I can contract for a small cabin to be built in the cargo area, complete with a bathing room. That will be your domain. I'll pay you a percentage of the booty you sell. And Dev, you can move back into the room you shared with. I would like to cross-train you on navigating, comms, piloting, and defense. As you know, you have an extensive support system on Primus. You have many options if you choose to stay here. We fly in six days. Let me know of your decisions before we take off. Tawny, tomorrow I'll be calling an old friend to start work on that cabin. If you decide to stay on Primus, I'm certain I'll find a use for it. If you come with it, it's yours. Good night, everyone. Thanks for coming. The males know an order when they hear one. They all stand, thank Thantos and his mother for the delicious meal, and are out the door within five minimus. The females are all dumbstruck. They aren't even whispering among themselves. I imagine there will be a lot of discussion once they're in their rooms upstairs. Did I just hear you correctly, Thantos? With that malicious tone, it could only be Lexa. Did you just make us barter safe living quarters for sex? No. His tone is colder than I've heard it since he had the leaf on the wind in his trap and was trying to frighten the crew into paying him 100,000 credits. 
No, Lexa, that was not what I was doing. I saved your lives on paradise. I've kept you fed and housed since then at my own expense. I've offered you free room and board until my ama finds you acceptable employment, and I've offered an alternative option should you so choose. I am not the enemy. Don't make me into one. You have choices. Figure out what you want. He turns on his heel and leaves the room. A few minimas later, everyone is drifted upstairs except for Tani and me. I motion for her to follow me into an adjoining room. My uncle's library is floor to ceiling warm, brown paneling. His imposing desk sits in the middle of the room, a wooden globe of our planet resting on the corner. My fingers set it spinning as I remember speaking with him in here only two nights before my abduction. He offered me a leadership position in his factory if I finished my advanced schooling. I sigh out loud, wistfully wondering what that life might have been like if things had been different. I bring myself back to the present and look at Tawny, who's glancing at me expectantly. I straighten my shoulders and vow to keep my emotions in check. This is no longer my planet, Tawny. Primus isn't my home. I think you could be happy here if you allowed it. Aunt Valeria is a lovely, generous woman, as you can see. She would ensure your safety, help you in any way she could. I just want you to know you have choices, just like the other females. If you wish to stay on Primus, I'll go with Thantos on the Tranquility. If you choose the Tranquility, my thoughts fly to the life I'd imagined for her and Thantos when I planned to take my own life. I picture them sharing his captain's quarters together. It would be neat and organized, all his booty hauled into the hold. They'd be happy together in his bed, whether it's giggling together or in the throes of passion. Why does this thought bring me no happiness? My heart clenches in regret. But what do you want, Davalos? You deserve happiness. Tell me what you want and I'll do the opposite. She's wrong. Absolutely wrong. I deserve nothing. I can't imagine happiness on a planet that has moved on without me for 90 annums. Nor can I envision contentment on board that ship where I shared bliss with her for those few nights together. You have a choice, Tani, and six days to make it. I hurry out of the room and take the stairs two at a time. Chapter 15 Tawny I hear Thantos loudly knocking on doors up and down the corridor before his heavy hand lands on ours. Arise, fair maidens. We're going on a trip through town. Please dress in some of the casual clothes my ama provided for you. Wear comfortable walking shoes. We leave in two auras. I guess that's good, Bryn says as she walks to the restroom. If we're going to consider staying here, we should have an idea of what it's like. Valeria provided everything. Soft pajamas, fabulous smelling soaps and bath salts, the intergalactic version of toothbrushes. No shampoo, though. Promians don't have hair. I'm downstairs in 20 minutes. Bryn started her shower after mine, so I'm alone. One minute later, I have a steaming bowl of sumra sitting in front of me, served by a shy young maid. This bow has bits of what I assume are various types of dried fruit and nuts. It smells and tastes delicious. Valeria sweeps in, bustles around for a minute, then sits next to me with her own bowl of sumra. She asks me a few questions about my life on Earth, seeming genuinely interested. I answer between bites, again noticing what a nice female she is. Do you have animals that you ride on your planet? She asks, seemingly out of the blue. Well, there are several animals that people around the world ride, but the most common are horses. That word didn't translate well, dear. Describe them. They're one of the most beautiful animals on the planet, graceful, swift, and compliant. They used to be more useful for farming and transportation, but there aren't a lot of working horses these days. Many people keep them around for recreation, though. I see. Did you ever ride? No, but I always wanted to. It was a childhood fantasy. 
I didn't have the kind of life where that was possible. I can fix that, Valeria beams happily. We have an animal very similar. Mrox, she's nodding happily. We used to own many, but Thantos grew up and is seldom home. I haven't found riding pleasurable since I hit 110, she shrugs. We still keep one around for when T.T. comes home. I go out to pet him occasionally. The Mronk, not T.T., she laughs. I bet you didn't know Debbie was a champion rider when he was in secondary school. Won lots of awards. Finish your Sumra, dear. I'm going to ask Dev to take you for a ride before we all tour our lovely town. She stands up and sweeps out of the room before I can protest. After Dev's speech last night, she has to know Debbie and I were a thing. I believe she's throwing us together on purpose. Is she playing matchmaker? A few minutes later, the room is full. The three other women are here, as is Thantos. I hear Valeria's commanding voice drifting in through the doorway. Come on, Debbie. You used to love to ride. It will do you good to get some sunshine. It will be healthy. She enters the kitchen with Dev close behind, looking hesitant. T.T., let your cousin borrow one of your riding outfits. You're about the same size. She pins him with an authoritative look until he rises to comply. Ladies, she says. Their little ride shouldn't delay our departure. Tavalos is going to take Tani to ride the Mrock. I can teach you all a fabulous card game before we leave. This female is used to getting her way. I'll give her that. A minute later, Thantos returns with what looks like a pair of buff-colored suede pants. He reluctantly hands them to Dev, who just as unwillingly takes them and leaves, I guess, to put them on. Ama, Thantos says through clenched teeth, though he keeps his voice even. Could I see you out here, please? I wonder if he's going to scold her for her heavy-handed matchmaking, because that's certainly what it seems like to me. A moment later, Dev returns, wearing nothing but the pants and a matching pair of knee-high boots Thantos must have scrounged for him. He's scowling, but doesn't protest. It seems what Valeria wants, Valeria gets. T.T., take them to the barn, get them settled, and then come back and play Arnita with us. As soon as the door closes behind us on our way to the barn, Thantos apologizes. My Amma considers herself quite the matchmaker. Neither Dev nor I say anything, and soon we're at a large stone barn. Not nearly as fancy as the house, it feels calm and welcoming. Its eight stalls are all empty except for one. The Ronk is huge, built thick like a workhorse back home. I keep scanning its legs, all six of them, trying to figure out how it can run without tripping on itself. I'm also wondering how this beast looks beautiful and not clumsy. It's an amazing animal. Even though I never got to ride one, as a girl I was fascinated with horses. I used to endlessly check out pictures on the internet. One of my favorite breeds was the Frisian, big, black, and beautiful. And that's what this one reminds me of. Black as night, long, flowing mane and tail except for the six legs. I wound up with all your trophies, Dev. Believe it or not, they're still in my room, Thantos chuckles. Dev, meet Empire. Empire, meet Dev. Dev's face isn't angry anymore. If I didn't know better, I'd think he was in love. He reaches out to pet the animal's huge, arched neck, and Empire leans into his gentle touch. It looks like the feeling is mutual. Dev enters the stall alone and seems to be having a conversation with the thing. By the looks of it, you'd think they were communicating telepathically. Their heads are bent toward each other, and I can occasionally hear Dev's lilting words drift toward me. He hasn't been ridden in a while, Dev asks as he runs his hand slowly along the ronk's neck, back, and flanks. He lifts each hoof in turn, inspecting them. I doubt it. I haven't ridden him in almost an annum. Stallion or gelding? Dev asks. Gelding. He'll be safe for Tawny. What's a gelding? I ask. He's been cut, Thanto says as his gaze slides to the ground. Testicles cut, Dev interjects matter-of-factly. 
Can't make babies. Toss me his bridle. Dev places the bit in Empire's mouth, easily slips the bridle over his head and walks the animal out of its stall. I pay close attention to its feet, amazed at the graceful movement. Thanks, T.T. Go play Arnita with the ladies. He laughs and swings up on the rock. I'm going to ride him by myself for a few minimas. These animals, no matter how gentle, can get a little rambunctious when they haven't been ridden for a while. Tawny, I'll come back to give you a ride after I've tired him out a bit. He enters the arena, which is maybe 60 feet around, and takes off at a walk. Close the pen, would you? As soon as the gate is closed, he quickens the animal's pace. I know horses go from walk to trot to canter to gallop. I have no idea what gait this is. The six hooves flashing in the sunlight are confusing. I just stand back and admire. For the first moment, I'm fascinated by the rock's movement. All those legs, all that action, the rhythmic hoof beats. Then I look at the entire picture and it takes my breath away. Dev is shirtless wearing just those buff-colored leather pants hugging him like a second skin. He's one with the animal, effortlessly moving in tune with the beat of the hooves. His red and black skin is already glistening with a thin sheen of sweat. He looks primitive and tribal and freaking gorgeous. My stomach clenches in desire and I simply stare. I can barely think. I'm overwhelmed at the beauty of what I'm watching. It's perfection. They're both attractive and together in sync with each other. It's like magic. Time seems to stand still. I'm mesmerized. I must be dripping wet with desire. I want this male. The thought of lying naked with him in one of those clean, hay-filled stalls flashes into my mind. I picture his mouth at my breast, my head thrown back in ecstasy. Then I imagine his hand pumping hard into me, in rhythm with the beat of Empire's hooves. I drag my attention to the movement in the arena, trying to pull my awareness from the insistent throbbing in my clit. No such luck. I'm captivated by Dev's effortless command of the huge black horse. Okay. He stops near the gate and vaults off in one swift, graceful movement. A moment later, I'll help you up, then jump up behind you. His face is happy and more peaceful than I could have ever imagined. He inspects mine. You afraid? Empire is a gentleman. I've never ridden. He's kind of big. The mronk is three feet in front of me, and the heat of his exertion is radiating off him in waves. I barely stand to his withers. If I raised my arm, I couldn't reach the tip of his ears even if I stood on my toes. My heart hammers in my chest. I'm not sure I want to do this. Listen to him. He's panting, Sprout. I tired him out. Even if he was a bad boy, he's too tired to do anything naughty. But he's a good boy. He leans over and affectionately pets the Mrock's forehead. If you want to ride, today is the day. His eyes don't run from mine. He hits me with a lazy smile. How wonderful to finally see this male in his element. He's happy. Lord knows he deserves it. Come on. He positions himself so one leg is stretched back. The forward leg is bent at the knee, forming a step. He pats his thigh. Step here and then swing up. I'll be right behind you. When I don't move from where I'm glued, we won't go faster than a walk if you don't want. He's got such a smooth gait. You might just take a nap. I walk up and pet the mronk's nose. Feels like black velvet, just as I suspected. Good boy. I meant for that to come out as a statement, but my vocal cords made it a question. Yes, he's a good boy, Dev says as he pats his thigh. I want to do this and know that if I delay one more second, my fear will take over. I step on Dev's thigh, then swing my other leg up and over. If my hands weren't tightly fisted into the beast's long black mane, I would raise my arms above my head and shout, Ta-da! Great job! Dev effortlessly hoists himself up on Empire's back and grabs the reins. Okay, feel your body. Feel your seat bones. Those should be firmly planted on Empire's broad back. Just keep those bones where they are right now 
and not much can go wrong. Humans are different than primians, Dev. We don't have seat bones. He slides forward, so my ass is pressed directly against his pelvis, my back plastered to his broad chest. Putting his mouth directly next to my ear, he whispers, I'm intimately acquainted with that fine ass of yours, my dear, and I guarantee you have seat bones. If you don't figure out which ones they are, I'll reach under you and point them out. He glances toward the house, some sixty yards away, and waves, smiling. I guarantee my Aunt Valeria is hiding behind one of those windows, watching us even as we speak. I doubt you want her to see that. I face forward with a loud huff and wiggle my bottom enough to figure out what he means by seat bones. Okay, I think I found them. He moves back an inch, and I immediately miss his warmth. Grab some mane. Empire won't mind. We're just going to walk. I have no idea how Dev communicated to the animal, but we take off at a slow walk. We silently proceed around the ring several times. Once the initial panic recedes, I'm more confident. One more time around, and I shutter my eyes and allow myself to feel. The warm suns are pouring down and the animal's gait is relaxing. Knowing Dev's in charge makes me feel safe. I love being in Dev's arms. That thought has been drumming in the back of my mind for a few minutes, but I allow the thought to drift to the front of my brain. Yes, there. I said it. I love being in his arms. What would bitchy Lexa say about that? Fucker. Ready for more? His tone is gravelly. His mouth is so close to my ear. His warm breath fans my skin. More? Did he read my mind? Does he know I'm fantasizing about making use of the clean hay? Faster, he clarifies. I nod. We step up the pace. I assume on earth this would be trotting. I can't even imagine what all those legs are doing down below. What I do know is that up above, it's like swaying in a rocking chair. You like? Yes. I want to talk. I want to ask a thousand questions about his life on this delightful planet. And if I can see his trophies. And what it felt like to grow up with people who loved you. Not just loved, but delighted in you. But I'm silent. I don't want to stop the magic. I don't want his muscles to tighten and his happy calm to evaporate. I just sit here, paying attention to my seat bones, which are perilously close to all sorts of sexy places that are telegraphing interesting variations of lust and need and desire. Faster? I nod. Make sure you've got a good hold of his mane. Tell me if you're scared and I'll stop. He somehow commands the animal to kick into the next gear, and the transition is a bit rough. A noise escapes my lips that sounds something like, Eek! Then the mronk hits his stride, and if anything, this gait is smoother than the last. My heart is pounding, though. It's a little scary. My hair is rustling in the breeze, and I don't believe I've ever felt more free than in this moment. Dev scoots up and presses against me. I tear my thoughts away from my fears, away from the breeze and the motion and the hoof beats. I focus on the warm, naked torso behind me. I replay the image of him riding wild on the rock's back. My stomach clenches in yearning. I want this male so much. I know he wants me. Why am I denying it? Right now my thoughts are so full of excitement and movement, I can't think straight to remember why I can't have this forever. I'll have to remind myself when I'm back in my room. Having fun? I nod. Too scared to talk? I'll slow us down. No, I'm having fun. You're in control. I know nothing bad can happen. Did I really say that? Is that how I really feel? He leans down. Tawny. Then sits up straight. Whatever he was going to say is lost. We ride in comfortable silence for a few more minutes, and then we slow to a walk. Empire hasn't been ridden in an anum. We should give the poor guy a rest. We'll walk for a bit, to cool him off. The dismount is much easier than getting on, and soon we're in the cool shade of the stables. I'm watching Dev carry the mrock, who if anything is more beautiful now that he's worked up a full sweat. 
A few of his muscles are tremoring under his shiny black skin. I sit back on a bell of hay and watch them both. Dev's facing away from me. I watch his muscles play under his skin. His quiet, lilting, horse talk drifts over to me from time to time. I wonder what he's telling that fabulous animal. I'm smiling. So is Dev. I wish this could last. Davalos. I wish this could last. This calm. Being on a mronk again after all these animals. My body feels right. Like I'm finally back in my own skin. Communicating this way with Empire. The rhythmic movement. I feel 80 animals younger. The suns feel fantastic on my flesh. For just this moment, everything is right with the world. For the first time since I left Emerus, I feel like I can create a new life. It wouldn't be bad to stay on Primus, live with Valeria until I find my own place, find a job in the family business, ride Empire on weekends. I could cobble together a life. I know how to forget things. All those anims in the dungeon taught me that. I won't be able to forget Tawny, but maybe that will fade over time. I nod my head, optimistic for the first time in so long. I want to live with or without Tawny. Chapter 16 Tawny Half an hour later, we're all gathered in the ornate foyer with this mosaic flooring depicting a tree burgeoning with red leaves and laden with yellow blossoms. The chandelier overhead is dripping with crystals that refract the light into rainbows of color. Let's all get into the hovercraft, Valeria directs everyone through the double doors to the waiting vehicle. Tani, Davalos, can I speak with you for a moment? I watch everyone file out as Dev and I stay behind. How was Empire? Did you enjoy your ride? It was amazing, I gush. I was afraid at first, but he was a perfect gentleman. Will she think I'm talking about the Mronk or Devi? Empire, I amend. She laughs. Davalos was not a perfect gentleman? She arches an eyebrow, but I can tell she's joking. He needs to be ridden more, Deb tells her. I know, maybe you'll stay here, keep your old aunt company, and ride him more often. We all grow silent. Sorry, perhaps you've noticed I can be a bit pushy. She pauses for effect. Oh, by the way, I thought the hovercraft would be overcrowded with all of us in it. I'll go with all the females and TT. Why don't you take the zip car and show Tawny around? You haven't driven in Anums. It will be fun. Meet us at the factory in two auras. You remember how to get there, right? She's already halfway out the door when she pivots toward us. I'll have T.T. give you a refresher on how to pilot. They've invented paradrive since you've been away. It links to your nervous system. She's a woman on a mission today, Dev chuckles. She's determined to push us together. You can stay here alone while I explore if you don't want to come with me. I'll pick you up and get you to the factory in time for the tour. I'm considering staying on Primus. I'd like to look around. I don't want to admit, even to myself, that being alone with him in a zip car, whatever that might be, sounds great right about now. I follow him and Thantos to what on earth would be a six-car garage. They approach a small version of the hovercraft the others are in. Kind of like a very sleek, very tiny Mini Cooper that flies. Is this safe? Only as safe as the driver. He tosses me a killer smile as he and his cousin climb in. I watch them engage in a serious discussion as it appears Thantos is acclimating him to the dashboard. Two minutes later, they fly away. Dev at the controls. I watch as they zoom above the trees, circling the property a few times. After they land smoothly, Dev bursts out of his door, grinning wildly. Ah, so much fun! I'd forgotten! He rubs his hands together like a Batman villain, having a gleeful moment. You ready? It all came back to me. I'll be very safe. He's a great driver, Thantos vouches, then hurries off to the larger hovercraft. 
Dev helps me into the passenger side of the zip car, and we take off, flying low over trees and houses. I notice that many of the trees are the same as the one depicted in the foyer. The yellow buds are gorgeous and smell divine. I wonder if I could be happy here on Primus. This property used to be far out of town. Now it's surrounded by other houses. There's been a lot of growth in 90 Annums. I can't give you a great tour. So much of this wasn't here before. He points out landmarks, schools, and temples. I notice the variety of vegetation. Some trees are ablaze with red leaves, some orange, and some yellow. I'm struck by how clean and orderly everything appears. Every yard is neatly groomed. Most have a riot of multicolored flowers in the yards. I ask to see where the poor people live. He flashes me a questioning look, one eyebrow lifted. Poverty? Shacks? Homeless? People who sleep on the streets? Where are they? Homeless? Seriously, Tawny, I don't understand. Why wouldn't someone have a home? After I pepper him with questions, I realize he's not joking. They really don't have homelessness on Primus. I'll have to ask more later to understand how they do that. This planet really is as nice as the males on the ship promised. I'm only half aware of what he's pointing out down below, because I can't take my eyes off him. He looks fabulous. We both took quick showers after our ride. I have on a casual yellow dress and pretty strappy shoes. He has on slacks and a shirt that fit him perfectly. But it's the smile he's wearing, more frequently lately, that makes him look good enough to eat. Oh, did I really think that? My thoughts are going in the wrong direction. Just being in this tiny craft with him, our elbows rubbing between us, is lighting my nerve endings on fire. I should be looking out the windows at the sights below, but half the time I'm staring at him. He's so handsome. I think if I was presented with the whole Chippendales dance troupe, I'd find their faces boring. Dev's coloring and markings are so much more interesting than plain beige or brown. I could stare at his face for hours. My core clenches in arousal. Tucking my hands between my thighs and the seat, I use the pressure to control myself from touching his skin. This is ridiculous. We have five more days on this planet, and then we've got to go in two different directions. If he stays here, I go on the tranquility. I could be happy there. If he goes with Thantos, I'll stay here and make a life for myself. I can't be in close quarters with him for more than the next five days. I'll spontaneously combust. And Valeria? She's merciless. She keeps shoving us together and she's not even sly about it. That's not helping. I'm going to have to say no if she pulls one more of her stunts. There's my university, he announces. Mind if we look around? No. He touches down and we stroll around campus. Some things are similar to what I'd see on Earth. Well-trodden paths between buildings. Architecture that seemed to change from one generation to the next. Crowded parking areas. And some things are so alien. Hoverboards instead of bikes. Red and black students everywhere. Signs in Primian. Squiggles that look nothing like any language on Earth. We wind up on the far side of a small pond with gorgeous orange and black duck-like creatures, either paddling serenely on the water or on the shore squawking like crazy when someone walks too close to their nests. We sit silently on a bench that looks like stone, but is cushy like a sofa. Well done, Planet Primus. That's a technological advancement we could have used on Earth. It would be the most natural thing in the world for me to reach over and grab Deb's warm hand, which is the opposite of what I should be thinking. I fold my hands on my lap and try not to think about how much I want to touch him. When I glance up at him, it's obvious he's not really here with me right now. His eyes are looking off into the distance. A muscle in his jaw is leaping, and his thoughts are far away. Do you ever wonder what your life would be like if... things had been different? He asks. I'm not sure he wants to hear my answer, so I just sit and watch the duck things. I'd only been in school a year when I was taken. I can't help but sit here and play out the last 90 years. Picturing what could have been if things had gone according to plan. He looks so sad. Maybe what I have to say might be helpful. Yeah, Devi. 
I've wondered what my life would be like. I did that for the first month or so of my captivity. But that was sad and maudlin and did me absolutely no good. In fact, it made things worse. So I don't go there. I didn't allow it all those years in the dungeon, and you know what? I don't need it now. I have the here and now, Dev, and that's all there is. Right here, right now. And the sun is shining, and the animals are squawking, and my best friend is sitting at my side, and I don't want to spend one more second thinking about what I've lost. I want to focus on what I have. That's how I want to live my life. I shut up and watch the birds. It's not my place to lecture. I just shared my philosophy, my coping skills. I know if I allowed it, I could go down a very dark rabbit hole of my thoughts and never find the light of day. I won't allow it. Dev's red and black hand holds mine gently. I can't help but think how beautiful our hands are together, how they belong together. You're so smart, Tawny. No good can come of dreaming of things that might have been. We're out of that dungeon, and we have the future. He releases my hand and stands. We should head out. Davalos. We arrive at the factory and join the group just as they set off on the tour. The machinery is completely different than when I left. It stands to reason technology marches forward. Tani seems bored and disinterested. I don't blame her. I wouldn't want to do this type of work either. Supervising machinery all day. If she chooses to stay here, I'm sure Valeria can find different employment that will interest her more. I notice my aunt getting a message through her ear calm. Her face changes expression as she tilts her head and thoughtfully looks at the floor, then me. Sorry, the tour's over. We have to return to the house, she announces. She slips next to me and says, It's your Alma, Devi. The doctor stopped by, then called me. He thinks she's in her final auras. Are you okay to drive? I nod, grab Tawny's hand, and hurry to the zip car. Your Alma? I nod. Did she? No, but it's close. We're silent the rest of the drive. My chest feels full and heavy. I focus on piloting the craft and not on my Alma, or what awaits me at the house. As I'm about to pull into the garage, I blurt, I know I shouldn't ask, but will you come into her room with me? It will give me strength. I don't even give her a moment to respond before I add, Never mind, that's presumptuous. Of course I will, Dev. Whatever you ask. Want me to sit next to you, sit in the corner? Whatever you think will be helpful. If in the middle of things you decide you'd like me to leave, just ask. I want to support you. I just nod and return to my piloting. I feel old and tired and sad. I'd weep if I were alone, but I'm not. So I clamp my teeth together and try to keep my mind busy on anything other than what awaits me at the house. The room is dark. The curtains are pulled. There's a soft light glowing on her bedside table. If she does open her eyes and experience a moment of lucidity, I don't want her distracted by the presence of a strange off-worlder she's never met. So I ask Tawny to sit in the back corner. I feel guilty about putting her out of sight until she whispers, Just remember, I'm right here. I'm here for you. Good. I can focus on my ama. I hold her hand noticing how cool and motionless it is. Her breathing is shallow and labored. The doctor told me this is one of the signs things are near the end. I scoot close to her ear and whisper all the things I wanted to tell her, those long anims in the dungeon and since my return home. I love you, Ama. You were a great mother. I hope you never felt guilty about my abduction. It was no one's fault. The world isn't a safe place, although you always tried to make it so for me. You gave me a great childhood. I consider my recent desire to take my own life. I vow to myself not to do that. I'll join my parents across that great divide when my time comes. 
I will not hasten it just because my life has been hard and the female I love can't return that feeling. My head is bowed, my shoulders sagged, and my eyes are so full of tears I can't see Alma. Just a blob of black, red, and white. I sense a change in her and wipe my tears off with a knuckle until my vision returns. Alma's eyes flicker open. It takes a moment, but she focuses on the wall and then me. Is it really you, Debbie? It's me, Alma. Here with you on Primus. I'll prove it's me. My first Bronx's name was Altus. She was a docile mare, but willing to jump anything I was foolish enough to point her at. I remember her. The color of Hishra. Sweet girl. You and Papa spent money you might not have had for her. You were always wonderful parents. My heart is cracking. I'm going to miss her. How long have you been gone, my son? Eighty-eight annums, Alma. Oh. She squeezes my hand, her face pinched in sorrow. Were any of those annums kind to you? No, Alma. I shake my head slowly. I've lived a long time without you. I missed you every day. She pauses and sucks in a long, shallow breath. I prayed to the gods for your safety. Her eyes glaze over, and she looks at the corner of the ceiling. I didn't get to finish my job. Another deep breath, more like a gasp. I didn't get to teach you all the things a mother wants to. She falls silent. I wonder if she's nodded off. The muscles in my face slacken, sagging downward in sadness. No more time. Only one secret worth sharing, my Devi. She fades off again. Now I'm silently willing her to hang on. There's something she seems desperate to tell me. I'm equally desperate to hear it. One thing you should know... Another long, slow, agonized breath as she struggles to maintain her hold on consciousness. Love, Devi. The only thing worth anything in this world. Love. Her words have slowed and aren't as loud as a whisper. Promise me, Devi. Promise me you'll find love. You deserve it. How can I promise to pursue the one thing I seem destined to be denied? I gather her small, still hand in both of mine and bend my head close to her ear. I promise, Alma. Promise. No noise escapes her vocal cords, just breath. I promise, Alma. I'll go to the ends of the universe to find love. Love. She sighs on her final, agonal breath. There is complete silence in the room. I don't hear her breathing anymore, but her breaths have been so shallow she could still be alive. I lift my head and put my ear to her lips as I watch her chest, which is no longer rising and falling. I know she has passed. I slump forward with my head on her frail shoulder. My head is spinning with memories and emotions. I don't know whether to be angry at the gods for bringing me home in time to see her take her last breath, or if they were kind, to give me this short moment of reconnection. I admit, getting to touch her, to hold her, to hear her voice, to be privy to her final advice, that was a blessing. I sit in the hushed room for a long time, maybe hours. I told Tani she could leave shortly after Alma passed over, but she silently remained where she was. She'll go if she wants. I swallow hard. I just want to stay a few minutes more. Daylight quit peeking in through the curtains auras ago. I know it's time to leave this room, call Valeria, and remove the body. The body shouldn't mean anything to me. It's just an empty husk. It means nothing. Alma's on the other side, hopefully young and whole and reunited with my papa. I'd like to believe that. I'm not certain I do. I turn and find Tani sitting quietly in the dark corner. Her eyes turn to mine with concern. 
You okay, Dev? She whispers. Is there anything I can do? Anything I can say? I shake my head. I'm going to tell Valeria that Alma has passed and help her take care of any necessary business. You've missed a couple meals. Why don't you grab something to eat? Your muscles must be screaming from sitting in one position for so long. I'll stick with you if it's okay. I'll get us both something to eat when the time is right. She slips her hand into mine and we leave the room. It's the last place I saw my Alma alive. Chapter 17 Tawny I pull my hand out of Dev's when we approach his aunt. I don't need to complicate his life by prompting more questions. He's all business as he and Valeria make arrangements. Both of them are staying strong. It was her sister, after all. Dev and I wordlessly scarf down sandwiches alone in the kitchen, then retire to our rooms. Bryn's already asleep by the time I slip in. My nighttime bathroom ritual is completed in minutes, and I fall into bed. I don't think I'll be getting to sleep anytime soon. Poor Dev, my God, he's been through so much. His pain today was palpable. I could feel it across the room. Just because I can't be with him long term, just because the Stockholm Syndrome makes me confused about my feelings, doesn't negate the reality that we have a history together. It doesn't mean I can't offer comfort when he needs me most. I pad up the room and down the hall, then knock faintly on his door. I don't even use my knuckles. I scratch with my nails. Everyone's in bed. It's quiet in the house. I know he'll hear me. I keep scratching until he opens the door. He's wearing comfy-looking PJ bottoms and a sad expression. What do you need, Tawny? His muscles are tight. He's not exactly welcoming. I try to slip through the doorway, but he's blocking it with his large body. I thought you might want company. He closes his eyes, a pained expression on his face. Of course I want company. But this won't be good for either of us. We're too connected. We need to disentangle. Just for tonight, Dev. Let me lie with you. Just for tonight. Last time we lay together, we... We shouldn't do that tonight. Right. Too confusing. Just lie there. I'll be there if you can't sleep. He thinks for another moment, then steps away, allowing me inside. He lies down and I join him in bed. He faces the wall. I lie behind him. Want me to spoon you, Dev? No. He answers quickly, then sighs deeply. Can you pet my head? I smile, liking the idea I can be of some comfort. Part of me wants to sling my leg over his thigh and nestle against his back, but he's put up a clear boundary. Pet his head? This I can do. I get a brainstorm of a value-added service I can perform. I sing, You Are My Sunshine. I don't know all the words, but for some reason, I know this makes him smile. After about ten verses, all improvised, and each lamer than the last, I notice his breathing has slowed and deepened. I've put the big male to sleep. It takes me a while longer to nod off. I wonder why we can't do this every night. The next few days are a blur. Dev stayed holed up in his room, and the few times I scratched at his door, he didn't answer. Dev, his aunt, and Thantos attended a funeral ceremony two days after her death. I didn't feel bad about not going with him. I would have been a distraction. That was the only time Dev left his room in days. Valeria took us women back to the factory to finish the tour, then showed us one of their retail outlets. Kind of funny to think I might have traveled light years across the galaxy, only to get a job as something akin to Macy's. Other than our field trips, I've almost completely avoided Lexa and Carrie. Nothing wrong with Carrie, but I can't stand Lexa's accusatory stares. I want to tell her to fuck herself, so I find it best to give her a wide berth. The cook gives me treats to give Empire, and I've been out to visit him every day. There's something so peaceful about the barn. 
I learned how to use a giant fork thing to clean his stall. I put the poop in a huffer barrow and then dump it in a designated place behind the barn. Who would have known how satisfying it is to clean a stall? I like the fact that when I arrive, there's usually a nice amount of lumpy brown presents cluttering the stall. And when I'm done, the straw on the floor is clean and smooth. It makes me feel accomplished. Ridiculous, I know. I'm rounding the corner, returning the empty barrow to its place near Empire's stall, when I see Death. He's in the mock stall, talking sweetly to the beast and offering him the same treats I usually provide. Empire, you've been two-timing me. Dev's puzzled expression indicates that didn't translate well. I thought I was the only one giving him treats, I whine. Treat you, huh? Dev's words are light, but the pain on his face is still raw. I watch as he puts the bridle on the mock, walks him out of the stall, mounts him in one graceful movement, and takes off at a run. He doesn't enter the round pen, but races off into the thick forest of red leaf trees, then disappears. What a gorgeous male. I could look at his muscular back, his tribal markings, his sheer masculine essence forever. But I can't have him. I hope he decides to stay here on Primus so I can leave on the tranquility tomorrow. I can bury myself in musty antiquities and fine modern art and maybe, just maybe, forget the male with the whiskey brown eyes and sweet, sad smile. It's our last night on Primus. Of course, Valeria is throwing another party. All the males are here, and there's an air of nervous expectancy. We'll all be declaring our intentions of whether we stay on this planet or fly away on the tranquility. Thantos has been gone a lot this past week. He's been overseeing construction of my cabin and the hold of the ship. Every night when he comes home for dinner, he bitches about the speed and work ethic of the carpenters. He's been irritable. I wonder if his aunt's death has depressed him as well. Dinner was delicious, but quiet. We're all nervous about our choices. I think a few of the males have a dog in the fight as well, wanting the women to stay on board. Almost every one of them has their eye on beautiful Bryn. I still haven't made up my mind. I haven't been able to catch Dev at the right time to ask him his choice. Whatever he chooses, I'll pick the opposite. After dessert, Thantos puts his hands up and shushes everyone. I hope you've all had an opportunity to have your questions answered in order to make your decision. I support you all in whatever you choose. Carrie, I'll start with you. Primus or Tranquility? Thank you, Valeria. You've been so kind and generous. But staying here just doesn't seem right. I think my fate lies elsewhere. My eyes have been riveted on the medic, and I think I see the corners of his mouth tip slightly upward. Honestly, I'm not sure if Carrie even knows he's interested. Whatever transpires, it should be interesting. Thank you, Carrie, Valeria says. I wish you the best in your travels. You deserve it. Lexa, have you decided? The same for me. Shortest speech she's ever made. I thought she'd take this opportunity to complain about something. Bren. Every male in the room seems to sit up a bit straighter and peck her with a stare. Captain Thantos, you said we could stay on the ship for three months and see if there were someone we were interested in. What if I already know? Oh my, you could hear a pin drop. Perhaps my body changed during my near-death experience on Paradise because I think I can actually smell testosterone wafting through the air. I look at the table and make sure the steak knives are all accounted for. I'm imagining some misguided gladiatorial fight for her hand. Does the male want to share quarters with you? Thantos inquires. Who wouldn't? Griff asks. This garners hearty laughter from most of the males. Bryn spears Thantos with a blazing gaze and asks, Do you? Simultaneous exhale from everyone in the room. Mike, drop. Do I what, Bryn? Is he being coy or did this blindside him as well? Bryn's perfectly shaped cheeks are red as apples, and she's now inspecting an invisible smudge on the white tablecloth. I'm having trouble watching. If he rejects her in this room, in front of everyone, 
I can't imagine how devastating this will be to a female who spent half of her life as a sex slave. Do I what, Bryn? His tone is softer. He pulls his chair out and drags it next to her so he can sit down. He looks less imposing. Fat tears are snaking down her cheeks. He grabs her hand and tries to peer at her. Ask. It's a whisper. Thantos, I'd like to stay with you. She swallows hard. Not just on the tranquility, but with you. She's looking at her hand in his. I glance up at Valeria, who, if she is surprised, isn't showing it. You've taken me by surprise, Bryn. I did not see this coming. Thantos is a brash male, usually laughing unless the situation calls for sobriety. He's not brash or happy right this moment. He looks scared. Let's talk privately this evening, Bryn. This is a big decision. Huge. I can't imagine deciding right this moment without a serious talk. I'll say yes right now, Bryn, Griff says, his tone joking but his face serious. Bryn's eyes are still cast down at their intertwined hands. She nods. Is that a yes? Griff asks. No, asshole, Lexa snarks with an eye roll. Are you an idiot? A, don't you get she's not interested in you in the least? And B, what part of post-traumatic response do you not understand? Phantos, surely you can't be considering this. You could find willing female flesh on any planet you touch down on. Don't you understand that she's incapable of making a good decision right now? She's been traumatized. She bonded with her abuser for fuck's sake. She looks at Valeria, says, I'm sorry, ma'am, then addresses the rest of the room again. She bonded with her last abuser, and now that no one's around to tell her what to do, she's latched on to the alpha male in this group, the captain. This is insanity. You can't allow it. You'll be taking advantage of her. Look at Tawny. That male abused her for three years, daily. She indicates Dev. I glance at Valeria. By the looks of things, I don't think this came as a complete surprise. Yet, do you see how she looks at her abuser? Like he hung the moon. Like he's the most handsome male on the planet. That's why they can't be together. Because she's not thinking straight. He's a gelding, for God's sakes. Sharp intake of breath from every living being in the room. I keep my eyes straight ahead. I refuse to turn to Devi. I hope not one head swivels in his direction. I imagine he wishes he could sink into the floor. I try to catch Valeria's expression out of the corner of my eye, but I can't get a good look to figure out if she knew this little piece of information or if it's news to her. I'm experiencing some new emotion. It's a feeling I've never encountered before. Heat blooms on my face and races through my body, all the way to my toes. Like the flame on a stick of dynamite. Rage. This is rage. Only times a thousand. I stand up so fast I almost push the table over. My chair falls backward onto the floor with a clatter. Words spew out of my mouth, but they bypass my brain. I'm finding out my own thoughts as they flood out in a torrent of fully formed sentences. Shut the fuck up, Lexa. How dare you shame this male? He's a good man. How dare you talk about me like I'm not in the room? Or like I don't have a thought or brain in my head? I get it. I get that you have a college education and you've studied psychology and you know about inappropriate attachment to an abuser. But I'm not stupid and I'm not gullible and I'm not a test subject. At this moment, I understand every metaphor for anger ever coined. I am seeing red. I do feel heat searing through my body. And I understand wanting to choke the living shit out of someone. I ball my hands into fists and let the words flow from my mouth like a molten fountain. Devi is the best male I've ever met. The kindest, most thoughtful. He has never taken advantage of me. He always puts my needs ahead of his. He's never pressured me, which is more than I can say of you. I think, I think you can find love in the strangest places. And that's what I've done. I found love in the crappiest place in the galaxy, a dungeon. And you know what? I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I take a moment to breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth. 
I use the time to gather my thoughts and make certain I'm ready to say this next thought out loud. I turn to Dev, look him in the eye, and my voice comes out low and clear and slow and meaningful when I tell him, I love you, Davalos, Maris, Thenius the Third. I love you, and I don't care what happened to us in that dungeon. I walk over to him and pull him up by his hands. These two hands, they don't scare me. This beautiful face. I cup his cheeks in my palms as if I'm touching the most expensive piece of artwork in the galaxy. This beautiful face doesn't scare me. No, it's precious and important, and I will love it until it's old and wrinkled. Come to think of it. I think I'll be old and wrinkled long before you, and I know you'll love me that way too. I lift up on tiptoes and barely touch my lips to his. You do love me, don't you, Devi? Will you have me? He kisses me hard, just once, then sits down and pulls me onto his lap. I'll have you, Sprout. He whispers in my ear. I'll have you tonight, if you let me. He displays a devilish grin. I doubt there's a person in the room who doesn't know he just says something really dirty in my ear, gelding my ass. I think that settles that, Valeria announces, casting a caustic look at Lexa. Primus or the Tranquility? Thantos asks with a huge grin. I say, whatever he wants. At the same moment, Dev says, whatever she wants. He smiles and touches his forehead to mine. We'll have to talk. I know I don't look it, but I'm a plan ahead kind of guy, Thantos says. That cabin I've been overseeing the last week was built to hold two, cuz. I hope you'll decide to stay with us. We're hovercrafting to the Tranquility at 0600 tomorrow. His tone is all business now. Make certain you have everything packed and ready to go. I suggest everyone get a good night's sleep. Bryn and I have a long discussion ahead of us. And Dev and Tawny have a long night ahead of them as well. Chapter 18 Tawny It took every ounce of self-control I had not to leap up and haul Dev upstairs to his room as fast as my legs could carry me. But we used a modicum of restraint and waited a full minute. Now that I've dragged him in here like the brazen hussy I am, I'm feeling shy. He slowly leans to kiss me, and in the moment of anticipation, the sweet hum of desire skids along my veins. Finally, his lips brush mine, so softly it's like a whisper. I have no idea why this makes me want to cry. Maybe it's because it's so achingly tender. Maybe it's because I've been desperate for this for so long. Although he's barely touching me, I'm already feeling frenzied for him. I want to make you feel good, Tawny. All I've ever wanted was to take care of you and make you feel good. Are you ready for that? Am I ready for him to rock my world? Yes. He surprises me by sitting on the cushy go chair in the corner. Stand there. He indicates the floor a few feet in front of him. Take your clothes off for me. Embarrassment flashes through me for a second as I visualize the scars that will never be erased from my skin. Then I realize they're a part of me a part of us, and they don't have to be a symbol of anything except our deep connection. Now. Something about his command, his tone, breaks my paralysis. I start to yank off my kimono, then realize I want to do this leisurely, sensually. I bend down slowly, one vertebra at a time, all the while smiling at him. I grab the hem of the silky material between thumbs and forefingers and lift it up even more deliberately. I watch desire burn on his face as he appreciates every inch of skin I reveal. His eyes widen in approval, then slit in desire. I pull the kimono over my head, then drop it on the floor. I'm exposed to him except for a pair of lacy red panties. He leans to the side, one elbow on the chair arm, that hand covering his mouth. It would be a casual pose, except I can tell every muscle is taut with expectation. Hand me the dress. His eyes dip to the kimono on the floor. I bend my knees gracefully and grab the fabric, then hand it to him. He settles it over his lap. I stand here, waiting for the next instruction. 
Continue. Right, he told me to strip. I slip out of the panties, step forward, and lay them on top of the folded silk kimono. Grabbing the tiny scrap of cloth, he brings it to his nose and inhales lustily, his eyes never leaving mine. Wow, I think that was the sexiest thing I've ever seen. My clit pulses in excitement. What do you want right this minima, Tawny? You. Be more specific. Sex. Much more specific. I pause a moment. I know exactly what I want. Can I put this into words? I want your skin under my fingertips. Your mouth on mine. Your fingers plucking the tips of my breasts. Your ass in my hands. Your tongue licking my folds and plunging deep into me. I grab a deep breath, but don't pull my eyes from his. I want to find places to touch you to make you come, Dev. I want us to both feel wonderful and intimate and bonded. Is that all? I want to come. I want to orgasm until my muscles are too limp to move. Until I'm too weak to even smile in pleasure. My clit is fluttering. My core is clenching in need. I'm drenched with desire. I can do that, love. Computer, lights out. He just said love. He's not the guy to use that word casually. Oh my God. I've waited a long time to hear him say that. It's felt like a lifetime. Cowardly devil. He turned the lights out so I can't observe his face. It's pitch black in here. I wish I could see him. I love the colors of his skin. I could endlessly watch the way the patterns collapse and elongate as he moves. Oh well, we'll have many years ahead to do that. I hear him rise out of the chair, then I'm in his arms. His hands play up and down, stroking my back from thighs to shoulders. It's sexy to be naked next to him, fully clothed. Although I hope he rectifies that soon. I can't get enough of you, Tawny. I'll never get enough. Can you handle this? Can you handle my touch every day? I guess I could get used to it, I tease. Could you get used to this? He invades my mouth, his tongue sparring with mine, plunging, plundering, mastering. I love the taste of him, his force, his masculinity. My fingers press into his shoulders. I moan low in the back of my throat. I'm dripping wet for him. I want to drag him to the bed and force him to make me come. But I also love the anticipation. Could you get used to this? He dips his head to my breast and flicks the tip with his tongue. His arousal must be building because his breath is coming faster, his movements more purposeful. He nips the tender crest with his teeth. I moan, feeling weak. He keeps me upright and relentlessly moves his head to my other breast. Mimicking the action there. I need you, I whisper. What do you need, Tawny? I need you here. I grab his hand and press it between my legs. His other hand pulls my thigh up and arranges me so my heel is braced against the back of his thigh and I'm fully open to him. With one hand propped behind my back, helping hold me up, he works me with his thumb and fingers. His thumb circles my clit then thumb and forefinger tug it with just enough force. Two fingers lodge inside me and launch into an insistent rhythm. I've been waiting for this for so long. I'm already on the edge. He scrapes his teeth against the straining cords of my neck and whispers, Come for me, love. And I do. Rapture races along my veins as my core clenches around his fingers. Dev! explodes out of me in one long, low moan. I return to the present with both hands circling his muscular neck, my heel digging into his ass and his fingers working me leisurely, slowly helping me spiral back down. So good, Dev. He lifts me up and lays me on the bed like I'm the finest fragile porcelain. What do you want now? To make you feel good. You will, Tawny. I guarantee you will. But not yet. He prowls up from the foot of the bed and lies between my legs. Since you won't tell me what you want, I'll decide. He nips my sensitive inner thigh, then plunges his tongue into my dripping core. 
he pulls out and slides his tongue through my folds to my sensitive nub. I almost flinch when he touches it. I'm already so sensitized from the orgasm I had two minutes ago, but he avoids direct pressure and presses the tiny nub from the side. I moan in pleasure and press my knees against the bed, opening myself to him even more. His relentless attention brings me release almost immediately. His fingers easily slip into me, and my orgasm intensifies as I clench down on him. Oh, my God, Dev! I'm panting. He's still lying between my legs, kissing that tender crease between hip and thigh. Give me a minute to recover, then I'll make you feel good, too. You're crazy if you think this doesn't make me feel fantastic, Tawny. It makes me feel good to give my female pleasure. My female, I repeat in a tone akin to awe. Those words make my chest expand with happiness. Come up here, I pat the bed near me. One more, he says, and presses his tongue to my clit again. The man is a machine. He knows exactly how to touch me to wrap me up in moments. A minute later, I'm screaming in pleasure with another powerful release. He climbs up to my side his hand smoothing the hair off my sweaty forehead. Nipping my cheek with his teeth, he says, We'll have to help you work up to having more of those. We'll practice. He's trying to be lighthearted, but his voice is deep and breathy with passion. I think there's a threshold between pleasure and pain, Dev. Perhaps I just crossed it. My stomach muscles feel tender from so many contractions. Petting his head, I allow my breathing to slow back to normal. I'm surprised he's still fully dressed. I thought his shame over his amputation had decreased, at least with me. I pull his shirt out of his waistband, wanting to touch his skin, caress his muscles. Take this off, Dev. Let me love you. He pulls the shirt over his head, and my palms splay across his back, rubbing from waist to heavily muscled shoulders. It's pitch black, so I close my eyes and envision exactly what this territory looks like. I've memorized the jagged seam along his side, where red skin meets black. I imagine every white and black tribal marking, where in places it looks like the two sides are lashed together. I lean closer, kissing and nipping his skin. I want to get to his ears. Those and his nipples are his most powerful erogenous zones. I want to make him come. I want to hear the noise he makes when he grunts in ecstasy. I want to feel his muscles relax in pleasure. He deserves it. My tongue traces along the outside shell of his ear. Then I dip the tip inside. I suck my breath in swiftly. Mmm, Tawny. His voice is almost a growl. The sexiest sound ever. I do it again, then nip down to his sensitive throat, then lower. I lick his flat male nipple and grab it between my front teeth. He grinds his hips. Take off your pants, Dev. Let me love all of you. He grabs my face in his hands, and I don't know how, but I can feel him try to look into my soul in the pitch black. Can you, Tawny? Can you love all of me? I do, my love. I meant what I said during the tribunal. To me, you lack nothing. I care who you are, and you are the best male in the galaxy. At least the best one for me. I hope he can feel the genuine smile on my face, even though he can't see it. He pulls away and shucks his pants, then lies on his back and pulls me up to straddle his thighs. Ride me. I slide up, planning to grind against his pelvis. Death! His pelvis isn't smooth like mine anymore. There's a cock there. And by the feel of things, a very well-endowed cock indeed. I guess the calm blue waters of planet paradise exceeded expectations. I grab him at the root and slide my fingers up his hard shaft to the blunt tip. How the hell did you hide this from me? My God, it's almost as long and big around as my forearm. I don't wait for an answer. I lean down and lick the tip slowly. The drop of pre-cum I catch on my tongue tastes like heaven. It's a bad time for this, I know, but I'm crying. If the waters of paradise healed what was missing from Dev, I can only believe they healed what was damaged inside me. The joy that billows up inside me is too spontaneous to control and too immense to tamp down. 
Tears, love? This makes you sad? Davalos. I wonder if this reminds her of the emperor. Happy tears, Dev. Do you have those on Primus? No. But are you truly happy? That's all I want. Her hand is stroking me gently, up and down. She's getting acquainted with this new addition to the bedroom. You know, she firmly grabs the base of my cock. I think the wrong person in this room is nicknamed Sprout. Is that right, love? Yep, I think. She's pressing harder now, sliding the flesh along the harder structure underneath. You should be called Sprout. I surround her feminine hand with my large one and squeeze harder, teaching her the right rhythm, the right pressure, until my breath escapes in a deep exhale. Call me Sprout or call him Sprout, I ask. Whatever you want. She shrugs, leans down and surrounds the head with her mouth, then moans in pleasure. She sucks as much of me into her mouth as she can manage. She's moaning. Her happy appreciation is like music to me. I feel 18 again, Tawny. I'll never last if you keep doing that. Ride me. I want her to be in charge. She once said she never wanted anything shoved inside her again. I want her to feel completely in control. From here on, no bad memories. Only good ones. She positions herself on top of me, uses her hand to guide me into place, and then presses down in increments. I wish the lights were on. I love to see her beautiful face, but I don't want to distract her. I love you, Tawny. Go as slow or as fast as you want. Stop if you need. We have a lifetime to figure this out. My heart is bursting with love for her. I'm doubly blessed, knowing that only a few weeks ago, we could have never dreamed this possible. She presses down, then up again, then down with more force until she's fully seated. God, Dev, this is the way it should be. She rides me, slow at first, then faster. She sits straight up, then leans over my chest to kiss me, and get a better angle, I imagine. She pumps faster, and I hear her breath quicken. Holy shit, that, wow! She keeps at it until I feel her squeeze me in release as she moans my name in a low tone, torn from the back of her throat. I've been motionless until now, letting her find her rhythm and the right angle and pressure. Now, I grab her hips and slam into her. I wish I could see her beautiful face, her lovely skin, her breasts bouncing. But I can hear her moans, feel her clenching, smell her sex. I'm on overload. I'm past the point of self-control. She pushed me into bliss. I release into her in hot, pulsing jets. My orgasm hits like the buck of an angry rock, hard and fast and overwhelming. The act of spurting my seed into her is supremely satisfying. Tani climbs off and slides next to me, her head on my pack, sheltered under my chin. You smiling, love? How are you doing? I want to make certain she's happy that everything's as good with her as it is with me. Smiling, Dev, this is what I've always wanted. You and me, with our future in front of us. Computer, lights on dim. I inspect her face, making sure she's really smiling and content. She's not just happy, she's radiant. She leans on her elbow, bends toward me, and places her forehead to mine. This is the expression of love between kinsmen on Primus. Can I call you my mate, Tawny? Or is that not the way you do things on Earth? Is it too soon? Three years is a long time to wait, Sprout. She's smiling so happily. I'd love to be your mate. She cocks her head toward me. Eyebrows slash downward. On Primus or the Tranquility? What do you want, love? Here's my favorite quote from one of our holiest books. Whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. I don't care where we are as long as we're together. What do you want, Sprout? She giggles and feathers her fingers across my cock. It twitches in response. I think she likes my new nickname and my new cock. When I don't answer, she asks, You don't want to make all the decisions on your own? Okay, let's vote. One finger for the tranquility, two fingers for Primus. 
I'll count to three, and you put up one finger or two. One, two, three. We both put up one finger. The tranquility, she crows. Then Tos built a cabin for us to share. You have a job waiting for you there, love. I think I might learn to pilot. We have wonderful choices ahead of us. Do you think we can convince Thantos to come back here more often? I love his ama and empire. Think we could have the best of both worlds, Dev? If he doesn't agree, I'll complain to Valeria. She'll make him visit more often. Now there's a female who knows how to get what she wants, she says. I wonder if things with Tani and I would have worked out as well without my aunt's heavy-handed interference. Tani We made love all night, trying to make up for a lot of lost time. He took me to paradise many, many times. We've got to get out of bed in a minute or two. Don't want to miss our ride to the tranquility. I just want to kiss Deb one or two hundred more times. Take one extra moment to memorize his face, and then we'll pack and go off to our next adventure. One month ago, neither of us had one iota of hope for a better life. Now we have love, and we have each other. I pressed my hand to my belly, wondering if perhaps I was healed by the magical healing waters of paradise. I guess we'll see. It's been a long time since I thought things could ever work out well for me. Now that we're together, I can't imagine a force in the galaxy that could stop us. This has been Davalos, book four in the Galaxy Gladiators Alien Abduction Romance series. Written by Alana Khan. Narrated by Sloane Richards. Copyright 2019 by Alana Khan. Production copyright by Alana Khan. End. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.